A Yellow Journalist by Miriam Michelson Chapter One The Pollocksfin Story In Which Miss Massey Aimed to Beat Mr. Thompson As I stepped from the train, I came face to face with Ted Thompson of the Times Record. He took off his hat with a rather sardonic smile. Everyone knows that Thompson doesn't consider a newspaper woman a foeman worthy of his steel. He said so often enough. So I bowed stiffly and resentingly, and in my heart, fearfully. But this last, of course, he couldn't see, and I'd have died before letting him know it. Oh, to beat Thompson on a story. The Pollocksfin story, of course, Miss Massey? He asked turning with me to walk up the main street leading to the hotel. "'Why, we must have come on the same train,' I exclaimed irrelevantly, not daring to answer him. "'Yes, I was in the smoker. Both the news and the T.R. seem to have caught the contagion at the same time. The press and the Tribune will get it by tomorrow, and all the boys will be up here. But it's no use.' I looked up at him inquiringly. "'Not a bit,' he continued. "'This is my third trip after a Pollocksfin story. It'll be my third failure.' "'But there is a story?' "'Oh, of course there's a story. You won't be in town half an hour before you hear that Pollocksfin poisoned his brother-in-law, that he has Mrs. Chipchase hypnotized so that she signs anything he puts before her, that the girls, Mrs. Chipchase's stepdaughters, fear and hate him, that the Chipchase fortune is melting away in his hands, that he has a private hoard, and that Miss Stemple, the housekeeper... He paused and looked at me a moment. I wish I hadn't such a silly baby face. That Miss Stemple and he are dividing the property between them, with the exception of Mary Chipchase's own fortune, which State Senator Newberry, her guardian, you know, has invested for her. But when it comes to getting anybody to talk and to stand behind a single rumor, you're up against it. You've got to take your choice between being responsible for a libel suit or going back to the office empty-handed. Which will you choose, Miss Massey? It's your first out-of-town assignment, isn't it? I nodded. He waited. I don't know, I said at last slowly. I won't do either, if I can help it. He smiled again and lifted his hat. If I can be of any use, he said. But I thanked him stiffly and went into the hotel alone, hating him, hating him for being so shrewd, for having such a reputation that it terrified one to be pitted against him, hating him for laughing at me, for patronizing me, for being so easy and carefree about his story, while, heart and soul, I was bound up in mine. It was ten o'clock when I walked up the hedge-lined path toward the chip-chase place. I strolled up casually, as a visitor might. That was because I was scared to death and wanted to appear at ease. The day may come when Rhoda Massey will condescend genteely to her work, like Mrs. Hilgard and some other newspaper women I know but you must remember this was my first big detail away from the office. The big old Chip Chase house faces the road rather haughtily. To me, a lone, small reporter, trembling in my boots, it looked insolent, forbidding, in spite of its being so badly in need of repair. So because I was terrified and wanted to cut and run, I jangled the old-fashioned bell as loud as I could, and then stood listening to my heartbeat while mechanically I repeated to myself what McCabe, the news editor, had said when he handed my transportation. "'Whatever you hear, Miss Massey, and whatever you see, bear this one thing in mind. I know this story's true. I know it, but I don't dare to print it without knowing more. They'll deny it, of course. The chip chases are the swells of their county, even if they have been going downhill ever since old Chip Chase died and Pollocksfin got the upper hand.' It's Pollocksfin you'll have to fight. He's Mrs. Chipchase's brother. She was the only decent one of the shiftless lot, and so long as her husband lived he kept her gang of disreputable relatives at arm's length. But at his death, Wells Pollocksfin stepped in. 
Senator Newberry, the girl's guardian, has tried more than once to dislodge him, but nothing will. Except Rhoda Massey, if she gets this story. Mind, it's no sense you're up against. During the past three years, there isn't an ambitious reporter in town who hasn't heard of a Pollocksman story and tried to land it. Every deviltry on earth that man's been accused of by the country people up there, but the charges melt away before your eyes, and every time they're downed, Pollocksman brings his sister and her stepdaughters to town, exhibits them at a theater or the opera to clinch the proof of his innocence and their good will, and then back they all go to live in seclusion at the old place, the House of Mystery. Thompson first called it that. Mary Chipchase's elopement the other day is absolutely the one Pollocksman story that stuck, and that Pollocksman gave it out himself is a sufficient reason for anybody who knows the man to dispe- What is it, miss, if you please? I jumped. So sudden was the interruption, so softly had the door opened behind me. Mr. Pollocksman? I asked. I knew it was. That square, tanned, yet colorless face, with its coarse, thick, white hair beneath a skull-cap, its thick-lipped, large, clean-shaven mouth and domineering eyes, was the same that I had seen Aiken in our art room, drawing from a portrait yesterday. "'My name is Pollocksman,' he said. "'What a fine view one gets of the valley from here,' I commented lightly turning as though to admire it while feebly I fenced for time. Very, he dryly responded. It's well worth climbing up from town for, I continued gaily. But I wasn't feeling very gay, I can tell you. I only wanted to gain time, even a moment, that something, anything in the world, might happen. And sure enough it did. A tall, white-faced woman with large, timid eyes and long, clasped hands came out into the hall behind him. I smiled at her over his shoulder, and a faint, wistful greeting came into her face. "'I'm Miss Massey of the News, Mr. Pollocksman, and Mrs. Chipchase,' I added, trying to include her. "'And I've come up here on the most absurd story. I hope you'll both pardon me.' but what is one to do when one's news editor insists upon sending one on a wild goose chase? For a moment I thought he was going to shut the door in my face, but the agitation of the lady behind him and a half-movement she made toward me, it must have been that, made him change his mind. "'Come in,' he said, leading the way to an old-fashioned high-ceilinged room on the right. "'Kindly,' "'Will you excuse Mrs. Chipchase?' he added with a significant look at her. "'She is not very well. This affair of Miss Chipchase's, Mary is her mother's favorite, and—' "'A denial from Mrs. Chipchase would be particularly effective,' I hazarded. "'Oh, I long to get at that woman. I could see my story just trembling on her lips.' But a hysterical cry came just then from Mrs. Chipchase. She put her hands to her throat, tried vainly for composure, then hurried from the room. "'You see?' Mr. Pollocksman was looking at me closely. Evidently he wanted to know how much I could really see. "'Poor lady! Perhaps when she feels better,' I suggested. "'Yes, a little later. Perhaps you can stay to lunch, Miss Massey, and afterward—' "'Why, thank you!' What a gracious villain it was. And now for the story, he said, settling himself snugly in a big armchair. What is the latest report for which I am indebted to a charming girl's presence? Ooh, I wasn't a charming girl. I wasn't a girl at all just then. I was only a reporter, a creature with eyes and ears and possessed by curiosity and to be set back into my skirts that way made me tingle with distaste. "'It isn't so easy,' I said slowly, trying to take his cue, "'to tell a gentleman to his face that—that—that that, that he is a scoundrel, or that rumor says he is. No, it is not a nice task for a pretty little woman like you, but I'm used to it in a way.' 
whenever the beggars of the local press are out at elbows or down at the heel or in need of a dollar to keep drunk on. His face wasn't pleasant to look at just then. They turn their filthy imaginations loose on me in what they choose to call the House of Mystery. It is for this reason that I never see a reporter from the village. But when a beautiful lady journalist comes all the way... Mr. Pollocksfin, I interrupted, how in the world do you suppose beautiful lady journalists get any work done if their heads are to be turned by compliments? The wonder is, he responded, that newspaper men can get any work done for looking at them. But you, Miss Massey, you can't have much serious work to do. A girl with a dimple and... I have serious work on hand just now, Mr. Pollocksfin, I said quickly. I have to ask you and Mrs. Chipchase some disagreeable questions. Was there a violent scene between you and Miss Chipchase Saturday last, the day of the elopement? Did you strike her, Miss Chipchase, with your cane? I looked at it now, a thick knob stick with a strong handle upon which his hands were clasped, and did she fall, crying, Never, never, not even for her sake, you could kill me first? And as soon as Mr. Newberry comes back, I'll expose you? Yes, I will this time if I die for it? I was watching him now. His hands, upon which his broad chin rested, may have gripped the handle of his cane tighter, but his heavy, sallow face did not move a muscle. There wasn't the smallest change of expression about the strong black eyes or large-lipped mouth. And when he spoke finally, his voice was unruffled either by indignation or apprehension. No. The monosyllable was curt but complete. No, he said again, to all of your questions. This Howard Davis, with whom Miss Chipchase ran away, I began again. I haven't been able to find the smallest clue to his identity down in the town. Who was he? How long was he here? Where did Miss Chipchase meet him? No one knows. Is it an alias, do you think? They drove down to the station below instead of taking the nearest one, I understand, in your own team, yet neither the conductor nor the station agent remembers seeing them and the train boy insists that he heard. My dear young woman, Pollocksfin had risen, his short, squat, yet straight, strong figure, as it confronted me, had something bull-like in its pugnacious solidity. I must decline to be interviewed as to the reason why a senile station agent and a drunken conductor are unable to give reliable information. Is there anything more? There was. There was much more, but I didn't say it, for a woman came in just then. She was tall, with a full, slim-waisted figure, short brown hair, and prominent eyes. "'Excuse me, Mr. Pollocksfin,' she said, looking curiously from him to me. "'It is lunchtime.' "'Miss Stemple, Miss Massey,' Pollocksfin said, and we both nodded. She didn't take to me, I could see that, but oh, how I didn't like her. Miss Massey will have a cup of tea with us, Martha. Tell Mrs. Chipchase, will you, and Dorothea? We followed almost immediately on her heels, Pollocksfin and I, as she went across the hall to the dining room. Such a miserable luncheon that seemed to choke us all, so constrained, so hopelessly rigid, with Mrs. Chipchase sitting as in a dream on one side, with me next to her, and at the foot of the table Miss Stemple, very straight and executive, giving orders and making table talk in her place. Dorothea Chipchase, a girl of fifteen, red-eyed and sullen-lipped, opposite me, and at the head Pollocksfin, hardly speaking, yet dominating every thought and word of all four of us. It was in sheer desperation that I began to talk of myself, after Dorothea said shyly, It must be fine, being on a newspaper, almost as good as being on the stage, to go everywhere and see everything. It's the one thing in the world for me, I answered quickly, glad of something honest and genuine I could say. It's a standing joke in the office, how gone I am on the profession, but I do love it. I love the local room just before each of us goes out to bag his story, 
I love it when we all get back at night and pencils fly over the paper and typewriters click and the telephone bells go whirring. I love it when the newspaper's gone to press and those gossips, the newspaper boys. Never women in the world were such gossips as these fellows. Get down to chinning over their pipes, to telling the truth, more truth than they've been permitted to put into their stories, to bragging how they got their tips and how they followed them up, to turning things and people inside out and letting you see the springs that move them. I even love that local room, for the chance there's in it to redeem a failure, when one comes back empty-handed after a long, hard day's work and there's Bowman to face. Bowman? He's the city editor. There's no explanation goes with Bowman of why you fell down on your assignment. You've got your story or you haven't. You've made a killing or you haven't. Don't waste time telling Bowman how the deer jumped just at the critical moment, how the gun misbehaved, that the weather was bad or any other old thing. Just lay down your weapons and throw up your hands. I did it just once. It was my first interview. A little thing I know now. But when Bowman sent me out on it, my hands were numb, cold chills ran down my back, and I kept gulping nervously to swallow the brassy taste of terror in my mouth. Talk about stage fright. And it was an actress I had to interview. Fancy. A vaudeville performer who'd made a hit with the frantic vigor of her dance. She was delighted to be interviewed, of course, but I was too green to know that. She received me in the most domestic little stage scene, made to order to impress me, but how could I know that? I was too frightened and self-conscious to use my eyes, my ears, or my tongue. I didn't have any brain. But she talked. My, how she talked. Told how she was starving when she first happened to hit upon the boom-boom style of dancing. How her manager discouraged her. How she persevered. How much money she had made. The price of her dresses. What her jewels were worth. What suffering her last divorce had cost her what happiness she had found in her latest marriage, how she happened to have one last photograph of herself that really belonged to her dear husband, but I might have it because somehow she felt we were such good friends, and so she would write her name and mine at the bottom of it, how glad she was to meet me, and how invariably she read everything I wrote, I had never signed a thing then, and when would the interview come out, and would I be sure to send her six copies, and I found myself out of the hotel, hurrying in a feverish dream toward the office, and at last entering Bowman's room with not a line written, not a word in my memory, and only the photo of an actress, of an actress whose pictures her press agent had been peddling hopelessly for weeks, for my day's work. I can hear his laugh yet, Bowman's. I can hear it and I can feel. Quickly I felt a foot touch mine under the table. It was a warning, friendly, surreptitious, timid. I put down the glass that I had lifted to my lips, and as I did so I saw Mrs. Chipchase do precisely the same thing. But her face was miserable and humiliated, and her eyes refused to meet mine. And yet it must have been she, for Pollocksvin sat at the extreme end. She or Miss Stemple or Dorothea, who had given me warning, about what? Or was the warning not meant for me? It wasn't the housekeeper, I was sure of that. But was it Dorothea? I turned to her. And, and what happened then? She asked quickly. She did not lift her eyes to mine. She was looking at her stepmother. Oh, I had to stop and think a moment to get back to my story. Bowman just had Thompson, Ted Thompson, he was on our paper then, write a fake interview. He did it in twenty minutes, and it was delicious, funny, clever, a million times better than I could possibly have done. I cried myself to sleep that night, and oh, how I loved the sight of that dear old local room the next morning that gave me another chance. Miss Massey, the girl's voice was eager. She spoke hurriedly, taking advantage of Pollocksfin's talking to Mrs. Chipchase. Your work brings you into contact with all sorts of celebrated people? Well, yes. Perhaps. Oh, do you know Mr. David Lowenthal? The artist who's gone astray as a member of the theatrical syndicate? Why, of course. He did such a beautiful thing for a girl I know. 
she went on breathlessly. This girl was stage-struck, I suppose you'd call it, and she wrote him a, a foolish letter. His answer was so fine, so fatherly, so, so almost noble, she... She must have fallen in love with him from your tone, I laughed. But you're right, and that's like Lowenthal, a letter like that. Would you like to meet him? Would I? Would, she began. But just then the others rose from the table, and we all filed out into the hall, all but Pollock's Finn and Mrs. Chipchase. They stayed behind. Dorothea ran up the long, broad flight of steps that led to the upper story, as I followed Miss Stemple across the hall and into the front room, and Pollock's been called after me. "'Wait a few minutes, Miss Massey. Mrs. Chipchase will want to make the statement you asked for.' There was a note of simple, confident good nature in his voice that amazed me. If Pollockson said a thing like that in such a tone, it spelled defeat for Rhoda Massey. Where, where was the weak spot? In despair, I cried to myself that McCabe was sure of the story. That nerved me again to believe in it myself, and in the meantime to sit in the shaded parlor with Miss Stemple silently watching me while I waited for Mrs. Chipchase. I heard her step in the hall at last and rose. Clearly my stay in that house was over now. But just before she got to the parlor door there was a swift patter of feet down the stairs, and I heard Dorothea's voice. Mary says she won't. She won't eat a thing unless I cook. And then Miss Stemple flew to the door and slammed it as she went out behind her. For a minute I stood there alone, all a-tingle with excitement. Then the door opened and Mrs. Chipchase stood on the threshold. "'Miss Massey,' she said, speaking with a mechanical tonelessness that was like a child's repetition of a lesson, "'I am grieved to hear that certain rumors derogatory to my brother, Mr. Wells Pollockson, are being circulated. I authorize you to deny them for me in your paper, in my name. They are false, all of them.' She bent her head and started up the stairs. And as Miss Stemple closed the hall door a moment later, shutting me out of the house of mystery, the last thing I saw was Mrs. Chipchase, then almost at the top of the staircase. She was clutching the banister as though every step was a mighty effort. And the first thing I became aware of, when I had stormed down the steps and out beyond the hedge, was Ted Thompson's smiling, clever, satisfied face. "'I should judge from your joyous manner, Miss Massey,' he said ironically, coming up and joining me, "'that you have lunched with the chip chases, that you have met wicked Miss Stemple and clever stage-struck little Dorothea, not to mention that perfect gentleman, Wells Pollocksman, and that you are provided with a complete and circumstantial denial of the whole libelous tale, and not one line besides.' I had thought I should want to cry as soon as I was out of the house, I was so mortally blue. But Thompson was so cocksure that I couldn't resist jarring his satisfaction a bit. "'You're nearly right,' I admitted modestly. He turned quickly. "'Nearly? Doesn't that content you?' He looked sharply at me. "'I don't believe you,' he said after a moment. If you had one solid fact to base a story on, you'd have flown down those steps instead of... That wouldn't have been professional. But it would have been human. I'd be capable of it myself for a Pollocksman story, and I've had a few more years of newspaper work than you, young lady. Going to take the afternoon train back, Miss Massey? Thank you, no, Mr. Thompson. I believe I'll wait till evening. So will I, then. But look here. He got off his high horse. State your grounds or your belief or your hope of a Pollocksman story to me, and I'll give you my word of honor to go straight back to town and not make the least use of your tip. But just let me decide for you whether it's worth putting in your time and your whole heart and soul, you insatiate little digger, on this forlorn hope. I hate to see a girl work like that. I shook my head but I put my hand in his outstretched big one, and for the first time it occurred to me that one might really like Ted Thompson, if one were only in his class, 
and not a wretched little local room prodigy full of envy and ambition. I can't, I laughed. There isn't a lunatic outside asylum walls that would call it a tip, the tiny, tiny hopelet I've got. And yet I simply can't leave it. Go, leave me to my fate. Good luck, then. I didn't know women had it in them, that terrier instinct to get to earth. I don't like it. Frankly, Miss Massey, tisn't womanly, and girls with sunny hair were made. Oh, I'll be womanly to beat the band. I interrupted, after the paper's gone to press. I watched him as he swung off down the lane toward the village. It had exhilarated me just to talk with him. To be on the same story with Thompson made you feel almost like a special writer yourself, like one of the lofty, who sit in separate rooms and use individual typewriters, who reject this assignment and accept that one, and talk to Bowman in a baffling little superior way, when they're so sorry they haven't time to do a certain story for him which, they intimate, is being just butchered by some incompetent, and then sit down with McCabe as man to man and find fault with the make-up of the paper, and suggest a feature or a headline, or an improvement in the artist's way of handling his part of it. Oh, I'll do it all and be it all myself some day. I looked from the poppy-decked road where I sat over to the chip-chase house, Oh, to force it to yield up the secret it held, the big, stubborn, dumb place. I couldn't, I just couldn't go back, so I stayed and stayed. And all I had, so little I had been ashamed to own it, was Dorothea's words in the hall. Mary says she won't. Then Mary Chipchase must still be in that mysterious house yonder, and the story of the elopement must be only half true, or not true at all, and I and I felt my pulses bounding, for just then a tall, well-developed figure in a stylish coat and a picture hat came down the side steps on the south side, walked across the lawn out into the lane and down toward the village. It was Miss Stemple, Miss Stemple out of the way and the door lightly shut behind her and most probably unlocked, and the way Miss Stemple came out must be the way for Rhoda Massey to get in again. I didn't give myself time to think it over. I didn't dare, it was so impudent a thing to do, but before I got to the door I had a wee lie ready for an emergency. I didn't knock, no, I pushed the door open and softly I hurried up the narrow flight of stairs, the servant's staircase. I'd got to the top and stood like a guilty thing, looking down the hall and longing for something to tell me which of the two corridors branching from it was the one I wanted, when I heard a step. My heart went down to my boots. At the thought of meeting Pollocksfin, something seemed to clog within me. I might have been the sneak thief I looked and not the hardest digger on the staff of the biggest and yellowest paper in San Francisco, so unreasoningly terrified I was. But it wasn't Pollocksfin. It was a housemaid, who looked surprised at the sight of me, but not amazed. I went up to her all abeam. I can be what Ted Thompson calls womanly. And just now I cared more to make friends with this big-toothed Irish girl than for Taffy from any man I'd ever met. Miss Stemple told me to come right up, I began quickly. I met her just as she was going out. She said you'd show me Miss Chipchase's room. Which is it? I said it casually. I really think I did, but there was a sound of rushing in my ears. I so held my breath to listen. And she said it. She said it. Which one? she asked. Why, Mary's, of course. You know, we were roommates at college. I gurgled in my relief. Dorothea's growing, though, isn't she? She nodded, leading the way without a word. It may have seemed as though I walked after her, but really I danced all the way down the broad, dark hall. And then suddenly something sent the blood to my ears again. It was the tapping of the cane, Pollocksfin's cane, I knew it, planted so firmly and slowly and regularly it might measure the beating of one's heart. I couldn't face him, not now, within an inch of my story, anything but that. With a finger to my lips I slipped a dollar into the girl's hand and stepped into a big alcove at the end where the halls branched, in which, in the days of the chip chase's splendor, 
there must have stood a great marble statue. "'What is it?' Pollocksfin cried. He had heard the noise I made scrambling into place. "'What are you doing in this part of the house?' he demanded of the girl. She went forward and made some reply. I couldn't hear it. Pressed close. Oh, at times I'm mighty glad I'm little. With my head bent forward, I was posing as a yellow reporter frozen into a living statue of suspense. Well, get your work done in a hurry and get downstairs. Pollocksfin growled and stumped slowly past me down the stairs. You're a treasure, I whispered to the maid as the door slammed behind him. Here's another, and I opened my purse. No, keep it, and this one too, she said, trying to push the coin back into my hand. Her own was trembling. I won't bring ye to Miss Chip Chase, I'm afraid. But Miss Stemple, I objected. Let her tell me so herself. Oh, if you don't believe me, I exclaimed haughtily. Well, why then did ye hide from him? No, keep your money, I'm afraid. She turned from me and hurried down the hall. Oh, to have success so near. Listen, I said, running after her. You've got to show me which is Miss Chipchase's room. If you don't, I'll walk straight down those stairs and tell Mr. Pollocksman you let me in. Ah, oh, ye deceitful little devil with your baby face she wailed aghast. I wanted to laugh, or to cry, anything except to stand still and feel the chances of discovery thicken about me. Nah, you're afraid of him yourself, she said at last, taking courage at the memory of my scare. Not a bit of it, not a single bit of it, I whispered positively. I'll go down to him after I've seen Miss Chipchase, if you like, and tell him you're not— The saints forbid! Oh, come on, do please, I coaxed. And suddenly she yielded. Catching me by the wrist, she almost ran with me up the corridor, and pointing to a door at the end of a narrow hall, she turned and fled. For a second I was afraid to try that door. Such jubilation was in me that, if it should happen to be locked, I knew nothing more to do but to dissolve in tears. A swish of skirts in the corridor below decided the thing for me. I just had to go in. I turned the knob and, and stepped right into the bedroom where Mary Chipchase lay. I knew her immediately. She was so like a glorified edition de luxe of little Dorothea. She started up suddenly at sight of me, then she fell back with a cry of pain. But before I had reached the bed, she put out a feverish hand that beckoned me to her. I know, I know she said swiftly under her breath. You're the bright-eyed little reporter girl Dorothea told me about. For mercy's sake, how did you get here? No, no, don't speak. There isn't time. Listen, it's a lie. I didn't run away with any man. It's a lie. What mother, my stepmother, told you this morning. Wells Pollocksfin's denials are lies, lies. It's all a lie. Our whole life for years passed and since my guardian went abroad, but we lied for her, for mother. She has been a mother to us, that poor tortured woman, but if I tell you promise, swear that you'll shield her, that no one will know that part of it. You're a girl like myself. Surely you wouldn't hurt us. Oh, surely. Trust me, I gasped. She looked at me a moment. You won't tell. I know you won't. She... She drinks, poor mother, and when Wells Pollocksman wants her to do anything, he has wine served for her, as he did at lunch today, Dorothea told me, though he'd be kinder to give her poison. And that's why he kept you here to lunch, knowing that in a stranger's presence poor little Dolly wouldn't dare to protest, and could only implore mother with her eyes and try vainly to— Oh, but it's all ended now. I've been trying to wait till Mr. Newberry should come back from abroad and help us— but I can't wait any longer. I did fly from the house when Pollocksfin. He wanted to marry me. There. Did you ever hear anything madder than that? She broke down, laughing hysterically and crying with passion. But he didn't. He couldn't strike you. I knew now that part of it was wrong. 
No one could strike Mary Chipchase. Strike, strike me? Oh, no, no. He raised his cane at Mother. He often threatens her when, when she's not herself. It was in the little wood just before you get to the station. He had overtaken me in his cart and brought her along to persuade me to come back. But the brandy he had given her maddened her this time, and she cried to me to go, to go with her blessing. Then I thought he was going to strike her, and I sprang forward. But my foot slipped on the wet grass, and I sprained my ankle. She winced and closed her big dark eyes as though still suffering. It was all I could do to bear the jolting of the cart that brought me back home. I had to come then, but I drove Mother back, and he, Pollocksfin, followed on foot. I made up my mind then and told him it was the end. Then he gave out this lie about my running away with some man. He thought it would ruin my reputation, and then I might see the wisdom of becoming Mrs. Pollocksfin. Oh, fancy, fancy! He'll say I'm mad when you publish this, but the publication of it will end. What are you writing? Just a line for you to sign, if you will. I passed her a bit of copy paper and my pencil. She took it, and all at once, without a sound, the door I was facing opened. In some previous incarnation, I'm afraid a certain girl I know must have been something yellower than a newspaper woman, for it was instinct, not reason, that sent me slipping noiselessly to the floor, with the bed in front to conceal me. Mary, my pretty, pretty Mary, you are better, darling? It was Mrs. Chipchase. I couldn't see her face, but I knew what the stammer in her voice meant and the uncertain motion with which she dropped on her knees on the other side of the bed. In misery the poor soul abased herself, flagellated her weakness and the vice that had brought her dead husband's daughter to this, begged piteously for forgiveness, yet would not be forgiven, but lay sobbing, till in sheer exhaustion she dropped asleep on her knees there, her gray head pillowed on the girl's knees. With her body held motionless by the tender weight she would not disturb, Miss Chipchase turned her head and nodded toward me. I got up. "'You must hurry,' she whispered, holding out the slip of paper to me. "'He'll miss her soon. I couldn't sign it, you see. She broke the pencil.' "'I—I'd I, give a lot for your signature,' I stammered. "'If Dorothea were here—wait, leave it with me. If I can sign it, she may get it to you. But go now, quick.' Do you suppose when he sees it he'll be desperate enough to— She smiled bitterly. You don't know him. He's a coward underneath it all. Once exposed, he'll run away and hide, and my guardian comes back before long. Then he'll take care of Mother. Remember your promise about her. Quick, I hear his stick. She pointed to a door at the other end of the room, and out I flew. Flew? Oh, yes. I had wings. Wings of triumph that bore me so swiftly through the corridors and down the stairs that I bumped into Miss Stemple coming up. She cried out, Dorothea, you... And by the time she'd caught her breath, I was out. Out. And with my story, my dear story, the story, the Pollocksvin story, it was written, hours it took me, I was so excited, and filed with the telegraph operator, and I'd got a message from the news. Bully for you. Congratulations from the office. Signed, McCabe. When train time came. I've got it yet, that telegram. It's like wedding cake or a baby's shoe. It's so precious. And then to complete it all, as I was stepping into the car, an envelope was put into my hand. It was Mary Chipchase's authorization of the interview. I wired that down, too, at the first stop, but kept the original. We might need that, the office and I. And I was lying back in Ted Thompson's seat, too exhausted even to be happy, while the porter made up my berth, when Thompson himself came in from the smoker. Tired out, eh? he asked kindly, standing for a moment beside me. Poor little girl. Next time you'll take a more experienced fool's advice. Better go to bed. See you in the morning. Good night. I nodded. I couldn't speak without slopping over and telling him the whole thing. I was cold and hungry and too excited to eat or sleep. 
but oh to have beaten Ted Thompson. End of Chapter 1 Chapter 2 Honors Are Easy Between Miss Massey and Mr. Thompson and where were you at the time the arrest was made? I demanded. He sat opposite me in the little hotel parlor, blew it, local correspondent, his clothes too tight for him, his skull too thick, his vanity too dense for disgust to penetrate. Oh, I was at a dance, you know, he said in an aggrieved tone. It was after eleven. Upon my soul, I believe it was almost twelve. What the deuce the sheriff wanted to do the thing in the middle of the night for, I can't see, unless the Times record bought him. Blamed unfriendly, I call it. I'll roast him good and brown for it some. The office, I interrupted, is not altogether charmed. Well, they can't blame me. I looked at him, the picture of fat, self-satisfied dullness. Why, I understand that fellow Thompson of the Times record, he went on, came up from the city and worked the thing up on the sly. Nice thing for a gentleman to do. They tell me when he was ready and had his story all written, including a faked interview with the prisoner, he waited purposely till eleven o'clock before turning his proofs over to the sheriff and witnessing the arrest. Then he filed his copy at the telegraph office and went off to bed. When I got wind of it at midnight, Oh, I groaned. Yes, wasn't it beastly of him? I did try to send a message, but the operator was busy with his stuff. The telephone wires were down, and... And why in the name of peace didn't you ride to Grafton, route out the operator there, and send us just a word, just a line, to save our face? We could have padded it out. We'd have done anything. Oh, if you could have seen McCabe's face when he got down at noon and saw that T.R. scoop. Blewett stared at me, blinking solemnly. Why, do you know, he said slowly, I never once thought of that. It was so late and such a disagreeable night, too, to go to the Grafton. Besides, I had taken a young lady to the party and had to see her home, you know. It was a bitter cold night. Don't you find it very cold up here, Miss Massey? I... I find, I stammered furiously. But San Isidro's a nice little place, he went on in his best society manner. We have lovely parties here. I choked. Parties and a young lady and the weather and the time of night, when the news was scooped on its very own story, the Dimling murder case we had ourselves uncovered. Look here, Mr. Blewett, I said explosively. Everybody connected with the news is in mourning. We're, we're just writhing in defeat, and they've rushed me up here to do anything in the world that'll do good. Now, as long as I'm here, we'll do business, you and I, on this basis. No parties, no young ladies, no night, no day, no nothing till we get even with the time's record. I can't sleep, you mustn't sleep, till we do them up. Understand? Of course he said stiffly. I am at your service. Evidently, he didn't think I came up to the San Isidro standard of young ladyhood. Thank you, I said dryly. If we succeed in hauling the news out of this hole, you may keep your job. He flushed at that, and his ears were still red when he took his leave. I suppose it was nasty of me, but I couldn't bear his jellyfish complacency. At the station I had seen Ted Thompson shining in the morning after glow of victory, and to fancy his cool, audacious quickness matched against my lumbering, blundering aide-de-camp made me lose my temper. I could hear Ted's voice still. "'Oh, how are you this fine morning, Miss Massey?' he had called out the minute he saw me get off the train. "'Miserable! Furious!' I cried. "'If I were a man I could find words to express.' You want to swear? Quite natural. Can I do anything in that line for you? If you please, I said gravely. He halted. We were walking together up the one village street, and all San Isidro was gaping at us and pointing us out. 
and calmly extending a hand as though to command silence and invoke the wrath of the inky gods, he said in affected falsetto of dainty disgust, Darn! The townspeople stared. I giggled in spite of my rage. I feel better, thank you, I told him, and we resumed our walk to the relief of the populace. And I congratulate you, there. Oh, what a scoop, what a bully scoop! Wasn't it? His gleeful admiration of his work was almost as impersonal as my own. Wasn't it just too full and sweet and rich for anything? The only drawback was that fat head blew it. He's just too easy. I knew you'd be coming up. I've learned to look for you, you know, which makes work double the fun. Tell me, are the news people very sore? Sore? I exclaimed. Sore? Words failed me. He laughed delightedly. Is there anything more I can do for you in the way of elegant and perfectly ladylike profanity? He asked. Thank you, no. I couldn't find it in my conscience to ask you to put forth so tremendous an effort twice. He chuckled. Just the same, I'm awfully glad they sent you up. The place is a whole, deadly. But if you'll lunch with me and... No, sir. Phew! The news must be sore and McCabe savage. It is, Mr. Thompson. They are. I'm not lunching. I'm not living. Wait till I get even. Don't let it take too long, please, he laughed. We were at the hotel door. There's but one at San Isidro. The office has just sent me an extra hundred as a token of esteem, and I want you to help me to blow it in. Blood money. I couldn't touch it. I declared, and ran upstairs. I hate a murder case. One's sympathies are all with the poor devil against whom all the resources of civilization are trained, till he falls down before the fearful odds and crumbles into nothingness, and a back-page paragraph. But Dimling stood staunchly as only innocence or extraordinary guilt can. His mother, his father, his sister, and his little brother were dead, and the house in which the murders had been committed was a heap of charred posts and ashes. We knew that much. Was Dimling the wretch who had done it all? Half the people in San Isidro believed he was. In Grafton, his own town, where the murders had been committed, not a soul believed in his innocence. And in addition, he was accused of being the masked robber who had held up the stage a month before. As for me, how could I tell? when Hornick, his attorney, was holding the fellow incommunicado, and I couldn't bribe or bully or coax him to give me an interview. We condoled with each other, Thompson and I, and that day we even united forces to try to break down Hornick's resolution, but it was all for nothing. But the rest of my day's work wasn't. Blewett came rushing up to me that afternoon at the station. We were all waiting for the train, already an hour late, to take us to Grafton, the sheriff was to take his prisoner back there. "'Beg pardon, Miss Massey,' Blewett said mysteriously. "'May I see you a moment?' I nodded to Thompson and McGowan of the press and joined him. "'I've got a corking tip. The Grafton people are going to take Dimling from the sheriff and lynch him. There, what do you say to that?' "'Do you think they really will, Mr. Blewett?' "'Do I think?' Why, Pinoyer, the sheriff's deputy who came down on the local to go up with them, says Grafton's all aflame with indignant and outraged public spirit. The populace is aroused. A mighty sentiment. What I mean, I interrupted. I can't bear people to talk their stuff to me. What I mean is, from your experience of the miners at Grafton, do you really think they'll carry out their threat, or are they only bluffing? Why, Dimling is shivering in his cell, and... So I have said in my story, Mr. Blewett, part of which is already on the wires. Oh, you knew about it? At ten this morning. A long-distance talk with Grafton. That's how. He was crestfallen. Do you want to do me a favor, Mr. Blewett? I asked. Do I? Well, when the train arrives at Grafton, get us a good story of the way the crowd up there receives it, 
They fancy the sheriff and Dimling will be on board. And? And they won't. Look there. I nodded down the street. Coming toward us was a two-seated rig, with the deputy sheriff, Penoyer, in front, driving. On the seat behind him was the sheriff and a thin-lipped, rat-eyed young man whose wrists were handcuffed. Blewett jumped. An idea had occurred to him. "'There is room for one more on the front seat,' he whispered. "'By Jingo!' "'Hadn't you better ask for that seat, Mr. Blewett?' I suggested softly. He hesitated. "'There's no danger of the mobs mistaking you for Dimling. He's lived in Grafton all his life, and everybody knows him,' I urged. "'Think what a story you'll get if they do try to take him from the sheriff. It would make up to the office for that awful beat of Thompson's. If you really want—' "'No, no, it would be of no use to ask for it,' Blewett said hurriedly. "'Thompson's got it fixed, I'll bet. Look there, he's talking to them now.' The sheriff's team had pulled up, and while Ted Thompson pleaded and the sheriff sat shaking his handsome white head, Benoyer was looking over the crowd. "'Yes, Thompson's got that place, the beggar,' Blewett repeated. "'No, Mr. Blewett, Thompson hasn't,' I said. A common instinct had driven the crowd close to the carriage to gaze upon the prisoner. We were so near now that I could hear the exclamation of disappointment Ted gave when I spoke again to the local man. "'Look here, Mr. Blewett. If you want to go up with the sheriff, I can get you that seat,' I said quickly. "'It's mine. Yes or no, now? Quick!' "'Oh, there you are, Miss Massey,' called the sheriff, leaning out. "'Jump in now, if you're game.' I looked at Blewett. He colored and drew back. I jumped into the wagon. I wouldn't touch the hand he held out to help me. A murmur of amazement that broke into a laugh and swelled into a cheer came from the crowd. Ooh, I never felt so yellow in my life. The red flamed to my cheeks. I set my teeth and looked straight ahead. But I saw Ted Thompson rushing madly up the street toward the village stable before Penoyer's whip flicked out. The crowd cleared and we were off. Are, are there many good horses in San Isidro? I asked Penoyer anxiously. The deputy laughed aloud, a roar of appreciation. He was a young giant, beardless and bronzed, the muscles of whose great shoulders played beautifully beneath his shirt. He wore neither coat nor waistcoat. There can't be many decent horses in a town like that, I pleaded. Take comfort, Miss Massey, the sheriff leaned forward. You've got the whole works to yourself, just as he had the other night. Thompson can't get a thing on four legs that'll get him to Grafton sooner than the train. It's behind time, but he'll have to wait and take it. We go by a shortcut, and so... Oh, thank you. I turned and held out a hand. My, how I loved him for a minute. That big, bearded, keen-eyed old California sheriff, so susceptible to woman's wiles, so appreciative of a situation, so full of relish for a joke and so courteous in his dear old pioneer forty-nine way. "'Miss Massey,' he said then with distinguished formality, "'this is Thad Dimling.' We bowed gravely, the murderer and I. He shot a swift, suspicious glance at me from out his lowering, sharp eyes, and shut his lips tight. But I was innocence and simplicity personified. I attempt to interview him now that his lawyer wasn't there to protect him and chance had thrown him to me? Oh, no, not Rhoda Massey. The drive to Grafton takes nearly two hours. I could wait. Oh, these girl reporters have got grit all right, said the sheriff to the world at large, while Penoyer the Silent chuckled enjoyingly. I promised her she should ride up with us when she found out we wasn't going up on the train. By gum, she deserved it. They wasn't a reporter in town that knew it. I was in hopes you'd tell Blewett, miss. And I was in hopes you wouldn't, I returned. He laughed delightedly. Cute, eh? He appealed to Penoyer's back, and the giant deputy's shoulders shook. Well, if you had trusted that fellow, he went on, the whole town'd have known it. And then Thompson had time to checkmate ye. He come after me, though at noon, 
Cute, I tell you, Ted Thompson. And he swore and he coaxed. He offered to pay the price of the rig for a seat. I told him he could have it for nothing. You did? I interrupted. If the other fellow that was going with us didn't show up, he showed up all right, the other fellow. But I don't know. If there's trouble up there. Miss Massey. A new voice it was. Dimling's voice husky from long silence, timid but affecting bravado. Do you believe there's any truth in these stories about, about a lynching? Will you tell me just what you know about it? Would I? Oh, to have your fish ask you to please be so good as to bait a hook for him. The silly fish, he didn't know that the man who asks an interviewer a question is lost. Poor, poor Ted Thompson. By the time the dome of Grafton City Hall was in sight, I knew all Dimling had to tell me, though he remembered his attorney's injunction faithfully, and I was never so impolite as to mention such an ugly thing as murder. I knew his hobby, his vanities, his tastes, his prejudices. I knew his weak, hard face by heart, his mannerisms, his peculiarities of speech. I had his opinion of the world that had accused him. I had an order for his signed photograph. You'll scoop the news, Ted Thompson, will you? But we all got very still as we neared the town. The grinning young giant next to me straightened his buffalo-like shoulders and slid a Winchester along his knees. I heard the sheriff trying his pistol behind me, and I saw the gray pallor that overspread the prisoner's face. My own heart began to beat with the horse's hoofs as we turned up the road and into a side street and I didn't spend so much time pitying Ted Thompson. When the men came up, and where they came from, I don't know to this day. There was a score of them on horseback, and they rode fiercely at us, only to check their horses suddenly and dash frantically down a cross street. I turned questioningly to the sheriff. I couldn't speak. My tongue was stiff and dry. Dimling had slipped into the bottom of the wagon. Only his eyes seemed alive. They must have seen you, miss, said the sheriff, and thought they'd made a mistake. They'll be back, of course, but that's so much time lost, and we'll see, that's all. Another turn, and we were galloping up the main street. We galloped, and Panoyer lashed the horses on, and yet every moment the crowd ahead was denser. We got slower and slower. Then a bunch of men were hanging at the horses' heads. Then the wagon stopped, and it seemed to me my heart stopped beating, too. Get down, Wilson, or shove him out to us. We're going to have him. It was one voice, but it sounded like a chorus in the sudden stillness. That you, High Huffacre? The old sheriff put his white head out the side. Dimling was under the seat by this time. Better be about your business and let me mind mine, or hell will pop some, I warn you. His answer seemed to let loose a torrent of ejaculations, of curses, shrieks, and threats. They were clamoring up on the wheels now in the back. Those that started to get up where I sat looked at me as though they did not believe their senses and fell back again. And all the time the steady young giant at my side sat without a word, the reins in one hand, his gun in the other. I couldn't see what was going on behind, but I heard a scream from Dimling, and the click of the sheriff's gun before it rang out. And then, just in the nick of time, came the answering crack of the guards' pistols and the clap of their horses' hoofs as they galloped down toward us from the jail. I know now that they fired in the air, but none of us knew it then. At any rate, the mob, caught between two fires, wavered for a second, and in that second Panoyer had dropped his gun, shoved the reins into my hand, and leaning far out, was lashing the horses right and left. I must have heard the pop-pop of the sheriff's gun and felt something swift fly across my cheek that made Pinoyer swear, but I really knew nothing except the tug at my arms and the swishing cry of Pinoyer's whip that made me wince every time he brought it down, till the sheriff leaned over me and almost pulled the reins from my stiff hands that even then refused to let go. I hadn't spoken a word when we got to the courthouse door. I couldn't. I was dumb with terror, and shivering so that the matron almost carried me into the jail. Pinoyer was still swearing over the wound in his shoulder. Dimling was lifted, swooning from where he had fallen. 
I saw the mark of the sheriff's boot heel on his face, and the sight so nauseated me that I broke into shivering cries. We might. I scribbled in court the next morning on a page of copy paper that I had passed on to Ted Thompson. Have that luncheon together today. Hornick, the prisoner's attorney, and the district attorney were fighting over the introduction as evidence of Dimling's half-burned, blood-stained coat. The two lawyers were intimate village enemies, and their testy wrangling gave me my only leisure second since the examination began. Thompson had just come in and taken his seat at the other end of the reporter's table. I'll bet he had been leading a strenuous life since he got to Grafton, trying to cover all the story I'd had at first hand. He wasn't his usual debonair self by any means. The bit of manila paper went through the hands of Frankie McGowan of the press, Bliss of the mail, and Cohen, the Times record artist, before reaching him. He got it finally, read it, grinned over at me, and soon there was a white sheet of the T.R. copy paper traveling back to me. It was a bold, bad beat, Thompson had written. No lady would have done it, even if blew it as a coward. It was purely masculine business. You deserve to get shot. How good it is that young women seldom get what they deserve. Lunch at one, if these two old cocks ever get through fighting. I nodded across at him in answer, and he turned and gave a message to Penoyer. The big young deputy received the note as though it was a sacred thing, and solemnly tiptoed away with it, though he had to worm his way out through half of Grafton crowded into the little courtroom. On the part of that king, the press, his manner proclaimed, and the people, awed and curious, made way. They did love us so, these Graftonites, sobered now, with the mobbing miners sent back to the mountains. To them we reporters were mountebacks practicing our stunts and getting ready for the circus before their very eyes. As for me, a live newspaper woman, they felt for me all that delightful compound of curiosity and patronizing interest that they annually bestowed on the bearded lady or the two-headed calf. When I did a human thing, such as to eat my breakfast, with one accord the people in the hotel dining room took an hour off just to watch me. And when I showed myself not only human, but feminine, too, as when it got warm and I put on a fresh shirtwaist and stuck a rose in my belt, they chuckled and commented upon me with a freedom that charmed the newspaper men who sat with me at the reporter's table. My eyes, which had followed the progress of Penoyer through the open window and over to the hotel, traveled back slowly. The day was warm, and the absurd peacocking of the two lawyers was delaying things abominably. I found myself reckoning up the time I should have left to write my story if the afternoon session should move no faster than this, and I looked irritably over toward Ted Thompson, sure that the same thing would occur to him but Ted was reading a telegram that had just been brought him, and as I watched, he rose quickly and hurried out of the courtroom. "'Something's up, Rhoda,' I said to myself, and instantly the whole preliminary examination palled upon me. I sat there, looking at the two battling attorneys. I even took a note or two when they gave utterance to something particularly funny and wrathful that I might use to guide them with later. But my heart was in the highlands, following after that slippery Ted Thompson. What in the world was the tip he'd got? "'What's this dull town to me?' hummed little McGowan of the press, under his breath. "'There's mighty little Frank McGowan isn't on to.' "'Exactly.' I turned to him frankly. "'What's he got, Frankie? Do you know?' "'Not I. It's something new. He's been crazy, though, since he saw your story this morning.' Of course he's bound to get even. Of course, I agreed faintly, but... Miss, Miss Massey, said a voice at my elbow. It was Penoyer's voice, and he spoke in a hoarse whisper that turned every head toward me. I took the envelope he held out. Ted's writing, commented McGowan cheekily. It was. So sorry, no lunch for me today. Called away. Ask McGowan to help you eat the spread I ordered at the hotel. Tomorrow noon I'm sure to be happy to fill that engagement. T.T. I passed it over to McGowan. 
It's a nice teddy it is, he chuckled. The lad loves his little stomach. It's a threat, that's what it is, I said gloomily, tearing the note across. If he'll be so plaguy happy to fill that engagement tomorrow, it means that I'll have no appetite for it and there'll be no lunch. Oh, dear, I wish I knew what he is up to. If only these lawyers would get down to business. He might at least miss the prosecution star witness, I added vindictively. No such luck. McGowan went on laboriously decorating his copy paper with funny sketches of rural Grafton. He has the crudest talent for caricature, but a genius for discovering physical weaknesses. They've got the center of the stage now, for the only time of their lives, those two old billy goats, with all the big dailies from the city eager to report every word, and they'll butt and bully and bulldoze till we'll be tempted to ask Dimling to lend us Exhibit A, that bloody gun over yonder, and turn it on them for the good of the cause, if they'd only quit sidestepping and mix things up a bit. But they didn't. For all that day and late into the evening, the pompous little attorney for the defense and that lean old bore, the district attorney, blocked and barricaded and objected and denied, and were called to order and threatened with contempt of court. When I sent off my stuff that night, I could have stamped on it I hated it so. It wasn't worth the telegraph tolls the news would pay on it. But I hated it worse the next morning. There was the Times record. I'd left orders to have it sent me the minute their special train got in, with a full first-page interview and sketches and a signed statement from Ella Harris, Dimling's sweetheart, who had disappeared and been in hiding ever since the crime, though both prosecution and defense had been seeking her. No wonder Ted Thompson had skinned out of that dull courtroom. Who wouldn't for a beautiful thing like that? I got it that day. The lawyers and the sheriff and the judge and all the rest of them were on to the battle between the Times record and the news, and their heavy witticisms over Thompson's story drove me nearly frantic. The T.R. had sent Bunnell up to do the Grafton end of it. Thompson didn't appear in court that day or the next. But another story of his appeared in the Times record all right, letters with facsimiles from Dimling to his sweetheart, photos of the pair at a picnic and at the cliff house, and a column statement signed by the girl and bearing Ted Thompson's unmistakable hallmark in every line. Oh, misery! I sent Blewett out to locate the girl. I told him not to dare come back without seeing her. He sent me a tearful wire from San Ysidro, whither he had traced her, saying that Thompson evidently intended to continue on the move with the girl in tow, to keep driving up and down the coast from now till doomsday with her, to spend every cent of his expense money on her, to keep her entertained and happy, and incommunicado. And the following day, too, Miss Ella Harris held forth to the Times Records readers, psychologically dissecting her lover's character in Thompson's best style. The court had taken a recess for a few days. The case in Grafton was dead temporarily anyway. The other newspaper people took trips up to the mines and down the valley. I went to bed sick, sick of seeing the Times record come out daily with its infernal Ella Harris stories. But I read them just the same, every word of them. It had a fascination for me, that stuff. Thompson had taken to faking largely now, for every idea in the girl's stupid little head must have given out days ago. The first thing in the morning I read it, though, and again just before I went to sleep, and even at night when I waked and couldn't get to sleep for fuming over the thing, some phrase Ted had put in the girl's mouth stuck in my memory. But I could see what Thompson was and what was real. I hadn't studied that clear, good style of his for nothing. So I pored over it all till I got a complete understanding of Dimling's character anyway, till I knew the fellow, not as he had tried to make me see him when I talked with him, but as he was, with the one tenderness that made him kin to humanity till, till the whole scheme came to me, and when court convened the next Monday, I was ready to try it. The courthouse at Grafton is a noble structure, to the Graftonites. To us it was chiefly remarkable for the conveniences it afforded for newspaper work, for under its one roof it housed everybody and everything connected with the case. The coroner had held his inquest here. The preliminary examination was held here, 
and Dimling's temporary cell was just across the corridor from the sheriff's office, so that through the sheriff's open door one could see the prisoner sitting behind the bars, affecting not to hear what we said of him and his case, while we chatted with the fine old sheriff about this and other experiences of his full long life, and waited for the judge to stroll over from his cottage across the way. "'He's guilty, all right, Demling,' the sheriff would quietly say each time a new clue was uncovered. "'He did em both, the robbery and the murders.' "'But, Sheriff,' I interrupted that Monday afternoon, speaking very clearly and raising my voice, "'there is always a possibility.' "'Not the least in the world, my dear young lady. He's good as hanged now.' "'Don't you believe him, Miss Massey?' shouted Dimling's attorney. The boy is innocent, and— Then why do you keep him shut up for? demanded Frank McGowan. If he was innocent, he'd want to explain how that pistol with which the little boy was clubbed to death after the others had been shot came to be hidden in the shed. He'd want to tell why he pitched his old coat into the flames, and how it came to be covered with blood stains, how he could be in the lane behind the house as you admit he was and know nothing of the murder. And incidentally— how the express company's money happened to be hidden with that pistol. It's a trifle, but— He does, he does want to speak, interrupted Hornick hurriedly. Sometimes I'm afraid he will in spite of all my advice to the contrary. The boy has got to be protected against himself. Hmph, sneered McGowan. Well, for my part, I had stepped to the door and was looking up the corridor now but out of the corner of my eye I could see that Dimling had dropped his book at mention of his little brother, and that he was listening eagerly. For my part, I've got a theory myself that he's innocent. "'Since when?' demanded McGowan, amazed. "'Your stuff in the news. "'But I've changed my mind.' I laughed out hastily. We were on our way to the courtroom now, and we had to pass the boy's cell. "'I believe he didn't do it. Yes, I do.' He's innocent, and I'm sure the scheme I've hit upon is the one he'll choose for his defense. But he's innocent. I'm sure of that. You're talking through your hat, growled McGowan, looking at me as though he thought I'd taken leave of my senses. But I didn't care. At the end of the corridor I turned sharply. There against the long bars sat the prisoner. His book had fallen to the floor, but his eyes were following me. He had heard then. I could do no more. Ted Thompson was sitting in his old place when we came into the courtroom. He was sharpening his pencils and whistling to himself, the image of contented industry. All through playing the village bow, I taunted as I passed him, not daring to let him have first blood. But he was too happy. He could afford to be generous. He only grinned and, leaning across the table, asked, Does that celebrated luncheon come off today? I shook my head. Tomorrow, perhaps. He looked up quickly, but the prisoner was brought in just then and the examination commenced. I suppose I did pay some attention to the afternoon's work, but I knew I could get the shorthand reporter's transcript, and in my head a ceaseless questioning seesaw went on. Will he? Won't he? And the he was an even more elusive man to count on than Ted. It was Dimling. I caught his eye several times that afternoon, and once I knew he was about to speak to me when his attorney interfered, but when court adjourned, he walked out between his attorney and the sheriff, and I gave up hope. Still, I couldn't go up to the hotel with the others without one more try. I told the boys I'd left some letters in the sheriff's office, and before they could offer to get them, I hurried away. I was going down the corridor when I met the jailer. Dimling wants to see you, miss he whispered knowingly. Hornick's gone to supper or he'd never get the chance, but... Hurry, I breathed, hurry. I got to the cell before him and had to wait while he unlocked the door. The bars in front reached from floor to ceiling. Dimling waited till the guard had crossed over to the office and was out of hearing, though not out of sight. Then he spoke. You said you had a theory, Miss Massey. Tell it to me. It was a week since our drive up from San Isidro, an afternoon of terror for the poor wretch that had been followed by days of slow torture. 
the crumbling of every hope he might have had and the steady upbuilding of the case against him. No wonder he rushed toward anything that looked like an outlet. I, I'm doing this without Hornick's knowing, he continued. He's a, I ain't got any confidence in him. He wants me to plead insanity, but I ain't guilty. Why should I? Tell me what was that scheme? What did you mean? For a moment I hesitated, shivering. Sheer pity for the wretch held me dumb. I looked at his haggard, unshaven face, his restless, frightened eyes, his powerful young body, its muscles relaxed as he stood slouchingly or shuffled his feet as he walked. It was that, the latent strength in him, that brought the other side of it quickly before me. The old father shot down, the mother in bloody terror of the monster she had given birth to, flying to the telephone and falling there. The sister cut off at the piano, the words of a song on her lips. The little imbecile brother clubbed to death with the butt of the same bloody revolver. Mr. Dimling, I said slowly, I think the time's come for confession. Confession? The weakness fled from his face and wickedness stared brutally at me. Is that all you meant? Well, you might as well. He nodded over his shoulder toward the grated door, which stood ajar, and sat down immediately, his back to me, at the table where the tray with his dinner had been placed. I looked at that back a moment, the great hulking mass of muscles bending over the table as an animal crouches over the food it tears. I wanted to beat him. Not for murder, but for discourtesy, the brute. But I walked quietly to the door, a false exit that made him look up, and asked simply as I was leaving, What harm can it do to him now? Him? Who? Why, the man who was really guilty, the dead man you're trying to shield. He put down his knife. His hand was trembling so that he couldn't hold it. Come, come back a minute, he stammered. Now tell me, you mean father? I was trembling myself then, but I came back and standing next to the table I began under my breath. Listen, at dusk on the evening of July 10th, a man of fifty-five came home, ill-tempered, out of sorts. At his best he was a reserved, surly, cranky fellow, known to be peculiar, domineering, never sociable or friendly with his neighbors, but close, grasping, suspicious. His wife was cooking the dinner, his daughter was at the piano. His, his youngest boy, my voice must have trembled in spite of me, was playing on the floor beside, no, he was out in front, Tim was. I caught the back of his chair to steady myself, but I dared not stop now, nor let him see I had heard. Old Demling, I went on slowly, only half nodded in answer to their greeting. He was not a man who believed in forms, but he passed on out through the kitchen and across the yard into the shed. There he began to throw aside the rubbish and presently pulled out a sack. It was heavy with money, and that money he was just about to pour from the sack into a can he had placed ready, when the door behind him opened and his son Thad appeared. I didn't dare look at the fellow as he sat, his face upturned to me and studying mine his ashen lips moving inaudibly, as though mechanically following the motion of mine. The, the sight of the golden tens and twenties came upon the sun like a revelation, I began again. A month before there had been a stage robbery near the town, and the robber had never been caught nor the money found. Young Dimling knew now where it was and who was the robber. He started forward trying to speak, begging, denouncing, but before he could really speak, the older man sprang at him. "'Yes, yes, he began it,' cried Dimling. His cheeks were blazing now, and his sallow face was lit up with hope and excitement. They, they grappled, but the older man was more powerful, and the boy fled. "'It wasn't that he could do me up, but—' "'But you were afraid to alarm the family,' I interrupted hastily. He mustn't talk yet. You broke from him and ran into the house, and then, fearing he was coming after you, 
you flew outdoors hoping that in your absence he would calm down and then later you might reason with him he nodded i waited for a minute that seemed like an hour yes but why would he kill the folks he asked he the mistake you made was in going inside he thought you had told your mother his secret and as soon as he had hidden the gold again he rushed in upon her in his hand the pistol he had kept concealed with the money he did not intend to shoot her in his grudging way he respected her this good simple hard-working woman yep but they'd had it hot and heavy often enough about me he wanted merely to frighten her to compel her silence my throat was dry, and I was so husky he had to lean back to hear me. But somehow the gun went off. She ran shrieking to the telephone, and there another shot finished her. The latent madness in him leaped to frenzy at sight of the blood he had shed, and of his daughter gazing horrified at him. An uncle of his had died in an asylum. Of course the poor fellow was mad. Well, of course, that would help me, too, about Grand Unc Peter. He, he completed the massacre, I went on faintly, and turned the pistol on himself at last, and falling against the lamp, set fire to the place. Bully! He was gazing admiringly at me. You say that fine, just like you saw it. I do, I do see it, and then I see you coming back. You hadn't gone far as you were first to hear the shots, and... But... I waved his objection down. You rushed into the house, from which as yet no flames came. The fearful sight in the kitchen staggered you. You almost lost your senses. But in the midst of that awful scene one thought possessed you. No one must ever know that your father had done it. You seized the bloody pistol and ran, ran blindly away to hide it through. Through Tannery Lane, that old cat Mrs. Jennings saw me through Tannery Lane. You saw Mrs. Jennings, too, or at least knew someone had seen you, and suddenly the fearful thought struck you. You might yourself be suspected. Then you crossed back to the shed and thrust the pistol up in the rafters. You hurried downtown. Your coat was bloodstained, of course, from the pistol. You bought another, and rolling the old coat under your arm, you raced back to the house. All aflame now and surrounded by the crowd, and dashing the bundle through a window to clear away for yourself, you leaped in. Great! And now, now you throw up your hands. I have stood it all, you say. The whole town's been against me. I've lost every friend I had. Nobody believes me innocent. I could bear all this for father's sake, hoping the truth need never be known, but that in time I'd get my freedom and then the whole thing would remain a mystery. But every day I keep silent seems to draw the net closer about me. My poor father would forgive me, but this is the truth. I am innocent. He did it. You bet. You print it, will you? Just like I'd said it. Promise me you will. It'll be a great scoop for your paper, but you deserve it. You're so smart and found it out while all those other reporters say I'm guilty. Then... Something in the back of my head threatened, but I couldn't stop now. Then this is your story. This is the truth? That's what it is. He was pacing up and down the cell now, almost gaily, his evil young face alight with the braggart's confidence. It, it makes a hero out of me, don't you think? Why, when I get out of here, people will be tumbling over each other to be nice to me. Why, I guess even theatrical managers and museums... "'Tell me, Mr. Dimling,' I asked suddenly in the matter-of-fact tone of the interview, "'why do you suppose the little boy was killed before his sister?' He stopped still, as though a shot had struck him. "'He wasn't,' he murmured. I held my breath, but he was quite off his guard now. "'Why, of course he was,' I ventured, moving carefully toward the door. "'I tell you, he—' wasn't he repeated brokenly i was right i was right 
the little half-witted brother had been the one tender spot in this brute's life. No, no one wanted to hurt the kid. He was a first-rate little kid, and his being weak in his head didn't keep him from making up to you gentle as a pup. A shiver shot through him at the memory, and I trembled too with nervous nausea. He'd heard the shots. His voice went on complainingly, while he dropped heavily into his chair. But he didn't know what it all meant, even though the place was blazing round him when he come in. Poor kid. He, he laughed at the fire. He was such a kid for fire. It was all you could do to haul him away from it. He kept dancing around, clapping his hands. I tried to drag him out, telling him he'd get burned. But that scared him, and he broke away and ran for the kitchen, crying for his mother. It was in the pantry between that I caught him. It made me mad, his running in there where they all were. I, I'd got to get away. I landed on him then, not hard, but I'd forgot about the gun. It was still in my hand, and it come crashing. His head fell upon the table, his arms outspread. I staggered out into the corridor. My feet were leaden as in a nightmare. And as in a nightmare, something caught my throat and held it tight so that I could not call the guard. It was Dimling's sudden, realizing cry of fury that brought him running to the cell doors where the two grappled. It's a lie! It's a lie! Dimling was yelling while he beat upon the door which the jailer had succeeded in closing. Tell that she-devil it's a lie! But I was out in the sunshine by that time and the tonic of victory was dancing in my veins. It was nine o'clock when I got through my story, and seizing my hat and jacket, started for the telegraph office. Blewett, who had been haunting the hotel, joined me. "'Thompson's been flying about like mad,' he whispered. He loved to whisper, as we turned up the street. "'Let him fly,' I said superbly. "'They're up to something, he and McGowan.' McGowan in with him? That might be serious, but do they know? No one knows. Even I don't, exactly, he said imploringly. I laughed happily. But the whole town knows you've got something Hornick don't want you to give out, he went on. Oh, it does. But Hornick can't. He can't help. Hurry, let's hurry. Suddenly a cold fear came over me. I couldn't lose this story. I couldn't, but... But just then we reached the office, and I flew in and threw my copy on the operator's desk. Rush it, won't you? I asked. I'll get the rest from Miss Eli, the shorthand reporter, and send it later. Why, why... He had made no move to take it. What's the matter? I demanded. I'm sorry, Miss Massey, he said, ticking away at his instrument but I can't possibly send it till long after midnight. The wires are loaded now, and the Times record having got in first, its order must be... Ted Thompson, I gasped. He set you to telegraphing the encyclopedia. There's the telephone, long distance, suggested Blewett. We hurried round the corner. Give me the news, San Francisco, quick, I cried to the telephone girl. Line's busy, she murmured. Oh, never mind that. Press, yes, press, she called sweetly over the line, ignoring me. This is Grafton. I've got three thousand words from McGowan for you. More to come, he says. Yes, ready. Well? Damn it, I sobbed. Well, it shocked the telephone girl's dry voice into silence for a minute anyway and it shivered blew it into dumbfounded horror. It shamed me, too, the sound of it aloud. I had thought it hard enough. But one doesn't always say what one thinks, and it didn't help the littlest bit to get my story down to the news. I stood there in haggard hesitation, knowing that precious minutes were flying by. The girl's dry, low voice, she had recovered, was going calmly on. Through the thick of my misery I was conscious of the long-winded, padded stuff McGowan had written to keep me off the line. He could keep that going indefinitely. "'There's only one thing to do, Rhoda,' I said to myself. 
Let these two highwaymen on part of the story anyway. Make a deal, a compromise. I turned to Blewett. Go tell Thompson, I said wearily, that I want... No, no, don't. Wait, let me think. Think. I think I should be standing there yet in just that impotent agony of indecision if that blessed whistle hadn't come, the whistle of a train. For San Isidro? I shrieked at Blewett. He nodded. Fly uptown, I cried, and get Miss Eli, the court stenographer. Bring her down to the depot. I don't care. Bring her with her notes and have that typewriter I used at the hotel there, too. I tell you, you must. He demurred. There wasn't time. Miss Eli wouldn't come and all the rest of it. See here, Mr. Blewett, I said slowly. I had orders to discharge you and install a new correspondent when I came up. You shall hold your place and have double rates hereafter if you bring her to the depot. Oh, please, please, please bring her. He did. I had got the conductor to hold the train for just five minutes and to wire the San Isidro operator to be ready for me. I had to tell him why to make him do it, but he was a treasure, that conductor, with a natural nose for news and a taste for a fight that was just lovely, and when I confided to him what I'd planned and why I had to get to San Isidro, he stood right in like a man. I can't possibly give you the account of today's testimony, Miss Massey, Miss Eli said as she came up, hatless and coatless but notebook in hand. You see, there's all this to transcribe, and I've promised Mr. Thompson he should... Just come inside a moment and give me that one paragraph of Mrs. Jennings' testimony. I coaxed in my most deferential manner, and haughty as being in demand had made this country girl, she yielded. You'll be sure to let me know in time when you start, she said primly to the conductor. Plenty of time, plenty of time, he assured her with a jovial chuckle and a second later we were off. I placated her by promising to wire to the Times record for Thompson all the transcribed stuff she had promised him. I told the conductor sternly, in her presence, what I thought of his carelessness in carrying off so important a personage as Grafton's court stenographer, and he bore it gravely and apologized most beautifully to stiff, tall Miss Eli. Then I flattered and begged. And it wasn't long before she was reading her notes to me, peaceable as a lamb, while I clicked it all off on the typewriter. She was quite content, but I, oh, I was mad with delight. And when at San Isidro I'd filed every blessed word with the telegraph operator, I couldn't resist sending one message in the other direction. It read, Ted Thompson, Times Record Correspondent, Grafton. We'll have that lunch in the city. The Dimling case is done brown and honors are easy. Signed, One of the Cooks. End of Chapter 2 Chapter 3 The Pencil Will And Miss Massey's Unofficial Connection with It Each of us had a different name for the long-drawn-out Dilworth trial, and that name was a key to the way we wrote of it. Pert little Frank McGowan called it the War of the Widows. Both the Mrs. Dilworths were widows, but one of them was the sort of woman who will always be known by a man's name, even after his death takes it from her. Bunnell named it a trial of temper. Poor Mrs. Jim Dilworths, an undisciplined creature that, a fury, ever ready to make a scene, a scourge to everyone whose interests were bound up with hers, and a wrecker of self, but not a shrew, not a nagging woman, and blessed with an open-handed, generous nature, and a laugh as hearty and spontaneous as her tears or her temper. Bliss of the male always had an allusion in his stuff to the sinister black hand. He meant the long, scrupulously scoured, knotted hand of black Mammy Sennett, Mrs. Jim's old nurse, confidant, and some even said her evil genius. As for me, I had a yearning toward the roasting of Mrs. Muriel Dilworth. I knew just how I should go about it, by dwelling on her perfections. Sweet serenity, the widow's bonnet that crowned and softened her fine, regular features, the perfect taste and simplicity of her mourning, 
and last but not least, the lady's admirable tact and self-control, till every reader I had should hate her, as I did, for adding these advantages to her social position and her wealth, and so further outclassing her poor, tempestuous, and middle-class sister-in-law. But Bowman, who knows my weakness, as he does that of everybody under him, got in first. "'No violent and aggressive championing of the underdog this time, Miss Massey,' he said. "'Wait, wait before you jump on me. I'm as hot as you are about it. It's a mighty good lay, that. Partisanship for the lowly and the erring matched against the socially lofty and beshekled. You needn't remind your city editor, young woman, that kind hearts are more than coronets to the yellow journal, because there are so many more of them. But our respected boss has a wife who's got the society itch, and Mrs. Muriel Dilworth is way up in G, as you ought to know if you weren't a rank little bohemian. So hands off the lady, and don't, like a good girl, don't revenge yourself on the paper. If you'll play fair, I'll give you leave to get in an occasional body blow on the pure and perfect Mrs. Muriel, if you can do it without the umpire's calling foul on you. So I adopted baby Jim Dilworth and played him up. In another sense, he had already adopted me, came running to me every morning the moment he was brought into the courtroom. Perhaps you think it wasn't a compliment from a child like that, all gold and pink and blue, a merry bit of human sunshine in his white dresses that Mammy Sennett kept immaculate. He was too little yet to be a real boy, but Cochran, Mrs. Jim's lawyer, Cochran, the vulgar, the sensational, the shrewd and crafty and a bit off-color Cochran, kept the little one bobbing about the stuffy place for the effect of his presence upon the jury. Oh, and he was winning, that kid, with his perfectly irresistible assurance of the world's breaking into smiles at sight of him. There wasn't a human being in the courtroom who could resist him, except Mrs. Muriel Dilworth. Why, even Brockington, her lawyer, old Brockington, whose fees are five-figured, whose private life's a public scandal, who's a connoisseur of fine things as well as coarse ones, and whose exquisite manners and clothes put to shame the merely Western environment he honors, Brockington himself mercilessly cross-questioned Mrs. Jim Dilworth with baby Jim seated on the table before him, playing with his jeweled repeater. But, to get back to the newspaper end of it, not one of us reporters had the right name for the case, and we knew it, and everybody in the courtroom knew, too, in spite of Brockington, Cochran, and the rest, who were ever on tiptoe to anticipate and shut off the smallest allusion to it, that it was the impeccability of dead Albert Dilworth that was on trial, that the widows of the two brothers hated each other with a hatred passing that of mere proponent and contestant of a will, and that the paternity of this same unconscious baby, who went about the courtroom winning hearts, was in question. Why is the Dilworth case a moral spectacle and as such deserving of female patronage? Frankie McGowan scribbled on a pad that he pushed over to me. The courtroom was full of interested women spectators, and Frankie glanced about with a cynical little grin, indicating them. Give it up. Why? I wrote. Because of its deterrent effect. Phew! But the face of the transgressor is hard. Look at Mrs. Jim. I looked. Brockington was grilling her on cross-examination. With a perfection of patience, an intonation that was almost an apology for the trouble it might be to her to speak, and a flattering, courteous assumption of attention to her answers, he was yet able to sting her to a frenzy by the subtle something that underlay his every polite word. She had the look of one who is being baited, who is pushed to the extremest edge of patience. Her full breast, beneath its somewhat too ornate bodice, it looked so, contrasted with Mrs. Muriel's exquisitely simple black, heaved threateningly. Her nicely booted small foot was tapping the floor in a nervous crescendo that prophesied storms. The feathers upon her large hat were quivering as the trees in the forest quiver in anticipatory sympathy with the coming tempest, and her face, usually so pale. She had a weak heart, which she overworked, McGowan insisted, playing for sympathy. 
coquetting pathologically, Frankie called it. Her face was aflame with wrath. At the time, Mrs. Dilworth, that this, this so-called pencil will, Brockington held the disputed will delicately between thumb and finger, as one might something not quite clean, was written, Where were you? At my house, she answered curtly. And Mr. Albert Dilworth, whose last will you say it is? It is, she cut him short. The old lawyer bowed. Mr. Albert Dilworth was at my house, too. Your husband, Mr. James Dilworth, was present? Mr. Brockington, she burst forth explosively, you know very well that my husband was dead six months before that will was written. Ah, pardon me. I see you are correct. I had forgotten the date. The airy negligence of Brockington, and yet by this pencil will one-fourth of a half-million dollar estate was willed away from his client to the golden-haired boy just now dancing in Mammy Sennett's arms. That isn't true, Mrs. Jim cried hysterically. You did, you did know the date. Madam? The judge turned to her. It was not the first time she had been reproved, and now, as with every other time it had happened, one could see by the quick, angry glance she cast at Mrs. Muriel's discreetly lowered head wherein the bitterness of reproof lay. Well, she stammered like a child, trying to justify herself. It isn't the truth. What kind of a lawyer is he if— one assumes, madam, her plight and the impossibility of her behaving like an ordinary woman appealed to the judge. His voice was still gentle, though tried. One assumes that an attorney speaks the truth. In any event, it is not your place to accuse the gentleman. Merely answer his questions. I will, she said sullenly, when there's any sense to them. The judge lifted his hand. His eyes were angry. I trembled for bad Mrs. Jim at that moment. Er, Your Honor, Brockington interposed with distinguished grace. The lady is, of course, quite right. I must apologize. But the so-called pencil will. He tapped it deprecatingly, gingerly with his eyeglasses. Is so obvious, a forgery, to an attorney, of course, that I have given it too little consideration. Mr. Stenographer, be so good as to read the last question. I won't answer it, she cried. I have answered it. She looked as though she could no longer contain herself. She half rose from her chair as though determined to fall upon her tormentor, but she sat down quickly, both hands at her heart. The heart pose, McGowan called it. Thank you, thank you. Brockington was gracefully oblivious. He waved the shorthand man into silence and waved the quite unnecessary question. Mrs. Dilworth, kindly tell the court and the jury in what room you were when Mr. Albert Dilworth wrote this alleged will. I was in my bedroom. Mrs. Dilworth's voice was low, even weak. Was it rage or really heart trouble? And he, Mr. Albert Dilworth? was in the sitting-room beyond. An open archway between? An open archway between. You say you were ill at the time. I was ill. My baby was a few days old. Ah, the little fellow. Hold the child up, if you please, Mrs. Sennett, that the jury may see him. It was Brockington's ostentatious way of calling Cochrane's attention to the fact that he did not fear little Jim's influence. Mrs. Sennett, if you please. But Mrs. Sennett did not please. It was evident in a moment to us reporters who knew her that Mammy didn't even please to be conscious of Mr. Brockington's presence, and that she was determined to be deaf to his voice. Mrs. Jim interposed, a smile in her voice at her nurse's partisanship. It must have been sweet to her. She was so alone, while surrounding and upholding Mrs. Muriel was a group of ultra-respectables, women who were good form personified, good form in morals, in manners, in costume. 
"'That's the child, Mr. Brockington,' Mrs. Jim said with a sneer. "'The jury has seen him all right, Baby Jim.' "'What? Mom?' It was Jim's clear little trill. The child, hearing his name, had piped out the query, and the woman on the stand smiled back at him responsively, but putting a finger to her lip. I swear she was positively sweet in that minute. "'Look, Frankie, look,' I whispered. "'Look at her now and see if your saintly Mrs. Muriel is half as much a woman.' But Brockington had begun again. "'You swear, madam, that you saw Mr. Albert Dilworth write this, uh, will?' There was delicate unbelief in Brockington's tone. "'No, I don't. I swore that he sat writing something in my sitting-room when—' "'Pardon me. With a pencil, Mrs. Dilworth? Mr. Albert Dilworth writing with a pencil a formal document of this sort?' It was a strain to put one's credulity to to fancy that hard-headed, highly respected martinet, Albert Dilworth, doing anything so informal and irregular as making a pencil will. "'I—I I couldn't see what he was writing with,' she answered resentfully. "'He was writing something, and when he had finished he came in to me.' "'Precisely. And where were you?' "'I have told you,' she exclaimed explosively. "'I was in bed in my bedroom.' Mr. Brockington paused to place his eyeglasses carefully on his nose. It was an old trick of his to postpone and to accentuate a situation. He knew every eye was upon him. "'You say, Mrs. Dilworth, that Mr. Albert Dilworth came into your bedroom, where you lay with your infant, and that he told you of the will he had made?' "'He didn't say will. He said, "'Don't worry about the boy, Etta. I have provided for him.' Did he say why? Why? The color left her face. She was ghastly pale. Why he should provide for another's child? She came back at him quick, then. She was not a cruel woman, though she was almost everything else that a woman wouldn't want to be. But she had suffered too much to let this chance pass. He was childless and very lonely, she said slowly. She didn't need to turn her eyes toward the side where Mrs. Muriel sat. A sixth feminine sense must have made her aware that she had pierced the one vulnerable spot in her enemy's armor. Brockington looked at the witness almost admiringly. He had known Mr. Albert Dilworth, the conventional, the conservative, cold-blooded banker. Of such depths of sentiment no one had suspected him. He would have smiled himself at the picture Mrs. Jim's words called up. It was nonsense, of course. Even the judge passed a discreet hand over his incredulously upturned lips. But she perjured herself like a goose, and then went on like a woman to make it thorough. He was very, very fond of children, she continued sentimentally. Etta, he said as he came in from the sitting room, all my married life I have longed for a son. I'll take care of yours now. But retribution came quick, in the very moment of her triumph. Mrs. Dilworth. Brockington pounced upon her in a flash. I call your attention to page 15 of the transcript of your testimony, in that you testify that Mr. Albert Dilworth said to you, Don't worry about the boy, Etta. I have provided for him and that he said not one word more, not one word more. Her eyes flew to her attorney. Cochrane had been doing everything short of shouting to her to attract her attention, but in her ecstasy of revenge she had forgotten him. It was too late now. Madam, persisted Brockington, may I ask you to explain the discrepancy? She thought for a moment. She was not a stupid woman but when her emotions were aroused, she saw things cloudily. "'If it please the court,' began Cochrane, sparring for time. But Brockington wouldn't have it. He fought then earnestly, no play-acting about it, and he won his point. "'I—I I was wrong, then,' Mrs. Jim faltered at last. "'When, pray?' "'The first time. 
He did say that about being childless. Then you deliberately deceived the court and this jury in a most important particular. Madam, do you know the penalty of perjury? I object. Cochran jumped to his feet, dancing with impatience, with apprehension. He made quite a little speech then, did Cochran, in his own atrocious style, and Brockington said never a word in answer, only waited a bit too politely, and noiselessly snapping his fingers, a habit of his, for the judge's decision. Then he resumed. Mrs. Dilworth, why did you conceal these facts, these remarks of Mr. Albert Dilworth, to you? For a moment she looked at him warily, then something occurred to her. I left that out, she said sweetly, to spare Mr. Dilworth's widow. I thought it would hurt her. She was quite right. It would. It did. Mr. Dilworth's widow's bonnet sank as though with a weight, and the lorgnette she was holding to her short-sighted eyes fell with a click. Brockington saw the movement out of the corner of his eye. It was the first time his client had flinched. "'Is this the truth this time?' he asked unpleasantly. "'Or will this, too, be amended later?' Again her lawyer came to Mrs. Jim's rescue. She needed him. Her color was rising, and all the storm signals flew from her flashing eyes. "'And why, Mrs. Dilworth, does your gracious forbearance end now?' Brockington asked, when things were quiet again. Why do not the same reasons still hold good as to sparing the lady? There was a silence, tense and anxious. What would she say? What could she say? Her eyes fell. She bit her lip. She began to speak, then fell silent. And Brockington waited, standing, with insulting patience. She, she hasn't spared me, Mrs. Jim blurted out at last but even on her own ears the words fell jangled. Oh, I, I don't know, she added. It just happened to come to me. Brockington was silent, just a long, significant second, to let the words carry their own weight of venom to the juror's ears. Ah, just a bit of revenge, then, he murmured, as though indulgently musing aloud, and then quickly, have you told any one of these supplementary remarks of Mr. Albert Dilworth? N no, it wasn't revenge, Mr. Brockington. Have you not even told your confidant, Mrs. Sinnott? I say it wasn't revenge, Mr. Brockington, she repeated, blindly stubborn now. Mr. Albert Dilworth, Brockington went on, composedly ignoring her, had nieces whom he loved, his sister's children. Did he say, Mrs. Dilworth, why he intended to provide for your boy and not for them? She set her teeth and merely looked at him, dumb with exasperation. Will the stenographer please read the question? asked Brockington with superb irrelevance. I must ask your honor to instruct the witness to answer the question. I will not, I will not, cried Mrs. Jim in a fury now dissatisfaction with herself for putting a weapon in his hands, augmenting her rage at her tormentor. He shan't insult me. He shan't browbeat me. Mine has been gracious forbearance, and he knows it in spite of his sneers. But he don't appreciate it. It's at an end now. I won't play the game their way any more. I don't care what happens. I'll produce that. This far she had fought her way, in spite of Cochrane's strenuous objections, the judge's grave commands, and Brockington's insistently courteous, if the court please, but the rest of it was inaudible. The judge's, will the stenographer kindly repeat the last question, came out of the turmoil like the theme out of a fugue, but this time Mrs. Jim's face lit up at the sound of it. She hardly waited for the clerk to finish. Why shouldn't he provide for my boy, she cried instead of those snobbish nieces of his. Why shouldn't he provide for him? Baby Jim Dilworth is his own. Mom! Mom! It was the child's voice that stopped her. She looked toward it. Right across from her at the back wall of the courtroom, the tall old black mammy had stationed herself, with the boy high in her arms. 
Beside the gold and pink of his head, her gaunt features looked grim and disapproving. For half a second, Mrs. Jim met those hollow black eyes and battled with them. Nephew, his twin brother's child, she concluded lamely, and burst into hysterical tears. As we sat waiting in Mrs. Jim Dilworth's little parlor that evening, half a dozen of us reporters, she came storming in, tearing off her gloves and coat as she walked, a creature of temperament, strongly emotional, caught in the cold steel meshes of the law and floundering miserably. Well, what is it? she demanded, facing us. We'd interviewed her dozens of times, but never without old Mammy Sennett standing guard over her. You want me to tell what they wouldn't let me tell on the stand? Well, I'm going to. You can have it all, every word of it, the whole lot of you. I don't care if every paper in town is full of it. They've made me desperate now, and they can take the consequences. Here. She drew a much folded paper from her blouse. I reached up to take it. I happened to be nearest, and I saw Albert Dilworth's signature on it. When the folding doors opened and old Mammy Sennett came in, I watched the change that came over the men's faces. Checkmate, it said. My own face must have looked enough like theirs to establish a pen and ink relationship. Is that you, honey? Oh, the sweetness in that old darky's voice. She came forward to take Mrs. Jim's things from her, but she stood a moment caressing her hand. You must be tired, but won't you go into Jim for a minute? He's restless. That old cot room's mighty bad for a baby. Mrs. Jim hesitated, and we held our breath. She knew, and we knew, how much more than solicitude for the child lay behind the old negress's words. You'd be furious yourself, Mammy, if you'd been treated as I have, she cried. But there was uncertainty in her voice. Yes, honey. Guess I'd just naturally spill over myself, but these gemmen will wait for you, Miss Etta, I'm sure. The men murmured, but Mammy affected not to hear, and before they could speak, she turned to me. You'll wait, won't you, miss? she asked. You're always so fond of Jim. He's got your handkerchief that you made into a mouse for him in his hand now. He's mighty stuck on you. Bliss loves to write about Mammy Sennett's hypnotic eye. He had actually run a story that afternoon in the mail, to the effect that the old black woman had forged the pencil will, and hypnotized Mrs. Jim into believing it genuine. It may have been my remembrance of this working suggestively, but I could have sworn there was a special appeal, almost that and a promise besides, in the old woman's cavernous eyes as she turned them upon me. "'Why, certainly,' I said." and I heard Bunnell swear under his breath. Mrs. Dilworth will see us soon? Oh, course, of course, said the old woman soothingly. Soon's he's asleep, eh, Miss Etta? Shall I keep the paper till you come out? Mrs. Jim nodded, put the folded paper into the long black fingers that closed greedily over it, and left the room. She faced us then, stern and grim and defiant, mammy against the lot of us. Yo reporters is just another kind of bloodhound, she snarled. Yo ain't got the reason the police has to hunt a man down. Yo don't do it for love or money, but just cause yo's hounds and nothing else. Yo kill for the sake of killin'. It don't do you no good. What's that woman inside done to you? What right yo got to come snoopin' in her trying to ferret her secrets out? Ain't it enough that the code is against her and the biggest lawyers in the city being paid out her own money? Money it ought to be her boys, anyhow, without yo coming in and hounding her to death? Think shame to yourselves. You, most of any of them. Yes, you, they calls Rody Massey. Phew! That was straight from the shoulder. Why? I gasped, while the men grinned, enjoying it usually. The truth can't hurt her. That's a lie right there. You know it can hurt, and you want her to hurt herself. You know she's hot-tempered and uncareful. She don't mince her words like some that thinks they's so stylish. She just comes right out, and yo, yo lying in wait, the jackal lot of you, to get hold of anything. 
Why don't yo ask me questions? Old Mammy'll give yo as good as you send. Mrs. Sennett, I jumped in in a sweetly casual tone. Won't you kindly tell us the contents of the paper you have in your hand? A gleam of humor came into her sunken black eyes. Oh, yo's mighty ready, yo little sass box. Pity yo ain't had old Mammy to spank yo good when yo was littler, she growled, but almost tenderly. But the roar those men set up. They were having the time of their lives. Even Cohen stopped sketching the gaunt old woman in her plain black gown and big white apron to join in the chorus. It was in the midst of it that she had leaned toward me, and I just caught her whisper. Get him away, child. For God's sakes, get him away for Miss Etta comes back. You won't lose. When I want you, she spoke aloud now, for the men had stopped laughing to listen. When I want you, Rody Massey, I'll send for you. Oh, the imperiousness in that black woman's voice. It did make me feel like a child. That, Miss Massey, sniggered Frank McGowan, is a delicate mode of intimating that, so far as you're concerned, the audience is over. I looked at him a minute, but I wasn't hearing him or seeing him. It was Mammy that was pictured in my mind. Old Mammy Sennett, who had never broken a promise. Every newspaper man in town knew that and who never forgot a kindness. I guess that's about the size of it, Frankie. I sighed, shrugging my shoulders and walking away. You're not giving it up, he asked, amazed, following me to the door where Bliss lazily joined us. But I made no reply, and as they stood for a second talking, I saw Mammy in a swift pantomime make some agreement with Bunnell. It was done quick as a flash, so quick that I'd have distrusted my own eyes if Bunnell hadn't risen just then and walked out past us. I say, what's up? cried McGowan. Nothing's up, Bunnell said indifferently. Mrs. Jim's down, gone to bed, and I'm not wasting time tackling Mammy Sennett for a story. He turned with a grin and ran downstairs. I knew that grin. It made me uneasy, and I hesitated for another minute. When I want yo, Rody Massey, I'll send for yo. The shrewd old negress had read me in a moment. Ain't that plain? It was. It had to be. There was a big chance in it anyway, and I took it. Are you coming my way, Frankie? I asked. Good night, Mrs. Sennett. She nodded curtly at the lot of us standing now out in the hall, closed the door quickly behind us, and bolted it. Something in the action roused McGowan's suspicions. "'I'm not going,' he said. "'Think I'll camp out for the night right here.' Bliss lit a cigarette. Enderby of the Express took out his pipe, and they both sat down on the steps below him. They were still perched there when I turned up the street. But I didn't sleep well that night. Bunnell's grin haunted me. I dreamed all night that I was scooped, unmercifully scooped. I saw the Times Records first page all broken out in 102 type. And though I knew it was a smashing Dilworth story, I couldn't read a line of it to find out what it was about, for Bunnell's face, with the grin still on it, seemed to be printed life-size behind it all over the page. I was sick with apprehension when I waked, so strong was the impression left by that nasty nightmare. I flew to the door and got the Times record, and there, sure enough, spread out even blacker and bigger than my worst dreams, and under a screaming headline. Mammy Sennett confesses to a Times record reporter, the pencil will is a forgery, was a Dilworth story that would shake the town. It did. All San Francisco roared, with laughter, for that precious old rascal of a colored woman had confided in four different reporters, differently, she told Bunnell that the will was a forgery and that Mrs. Jim knew it was. She confessed to Bliss, calling him in for the purpose from the landing, that the will was a forgery, but that Mrs. Jim innocently supposed it was genuine. She gave Enderby solemn assurance that the will was genuine and that she had secret evidence corroborating it. And she wisely chose little Frank McGowan for her confidant in the last variation, that the will was a forgery, 
but that it was a true and faithful copy of a genuine will that had been lost. Perhaps you think Rhoda Massey didn't hug herself and have the laugh on those bewildered men when, on the stand the next morning, Mammy was questioned about her various interviews and responded with only a twinkle in the depths of her inscrutable black eyes. "'Tain't no lie to lie to a newspaper reporter that's getting a living by telling lies.' When old Brockington's sins are forgotten, and the scandals of which he is the hero have passed out of newspaper men's memory, which is tenacious, they'll still tell of the great speech he made in the Dilworth case. I sat not ten feet from him while he was addressing the jury in the last throes of the great struggle. The case had been on for months, and people crowded the courtroom, sitting crushed together in intense stillness to listen to the arguments at the end and though I couldn't help seeing through the actor's arts, though I knew his declamatory tricks and was so familiar with the case that I could almost anticipate the points he made, in spite of this he thrilled me. And not me alone. I saw the young wife of a great theatrical manager, beautiful Evelyn Lowenthal, for whom Brockington had provided seats at his own table, her wonderful violet eyes fixed upon the attorney while he spoke, with a fascinated intentness, like that she herself used to bring to the faces of those who saw her on the stage before her marriage. And I saw Jerome Kirby, who was there with her, of course. Kirby, the debonair, the graceful and brave and reckless. I saw Kirby's handsome, cynical face go gray, and I heard the rending of his gloves when Brockington began to speak of the accursed interloper who makes marriage a mockery. Was Brockington killing two cuckoos with one stone? Was he flaying the enemy of his old friend Lowenthal with the same lash and over the shrinking back of Mrs. Jim? I don't know. I was shivering with excitement when he turned the thing over to the jury at last and took his seat. I couldn't look at Mrs. Jim. To turn a curious eye upon a thing on the rack as she was was too inhuman. She fainted once during the terrible arraignment. McGowan insisted that it was done for effect, but I caught Mammy Sennett's eye as she bent over her applying restoratives, and I saw the agonized truth behind it. When the jury retired and the courtroom cleared, she was still sitting with her hand on her heart, her eyes staring from out a pallid face as though she were in a stupor. She did not notice when little Jim left her side, and ran to me, lifting his arms and crying, "'Take! Take Jim!' I looked over then at Mammy. Let me take him for a while, till she's feeling better, I said. Ain't you going downtown to your work now? She asked hesitatingly. I shook my head and a grayish pallor seemed to settle like a veil over her black skin. Yo reckon it'll be soon then, the verdict? Everybody seems to think so, I said gently. That means it'll be against Miss Etta. I tried to evade and to hide my face behind Jim's golden curls, but you couldn't, with those fierce old eyes upon you, tell anything but the truth. The whole courtroom, now that the judge had withdrawn, was humming with it. McGowan was offering odds that the verdict rejecting the pencil will would be brought in within half an hour. Well, take him, then. Mammy's voice was hard. But don't you be so sure, Miss. And one thing I tell you now, if they do down Miss Etta this time, it'll be cause the biggest piece of evidence wasn't put in. And you can say that old Mammy Sennett'll spend every dollar she's got to see her lamb righted, and no hatched up business between lawyers will stop her. No, you needn't look at me that way. I never cheated you, did I? I tell you it's the truth. Then prove it, Mrs. Sennett, I said quickly, but under my breath so that none of those about could hear. Do you think any editor in town will dare to print anything from you now, after? Oh, won't he? she snarled. Won't he print that if he can get it? She pulled a piece of paper from her satchel, and I almost dropped small Jim Dilworth to the floor. It was the paper Mrs. Jim had flaunted in our eyes the night we all went to interview her, and it made me feel now like a little repertorial donkey before whose nose and just out of reach the most tempting wisp of hay is being pulled along. "'Now look here, Mammy Sennett,' I began angrily. "'Shh! Look here yourself. I'm a-going to give it to you. 
I promised myself I would that night you got out when I told you to. If the jury say that will ain't a true one, yo having this now won't hurt us, for we'll fight it out in a higher court and we'll use it next time. But if the jury say the pencil wheel's truly Albert Dilworth's, it won't, Mrs. Sennett. It's as sure as... Then you won't mind promising me, if the jury decides for Miss Etta, that you won't print this paper? I'll take your word, your promise, eh? Promise? Who wouldn't promise on a sure thing like that? There in my shaking hand was a written acknowledgment of the boy's paternity. I commend the child known as Jim Dilworth to my wife Muriel. He is my son. There it was in black and white, and not pencil this time, signed Albert Dilworth and dated scrupulously, the heart of the Dilworth case at last beating in sight of the world. Mammy watched me grimly. I want yo to say, if you do put it in the paper, that Mammy Sennett saw Albert Dilworth write that paper, that she told him if he didn't write it she'd tell that stuck-up wife of his the whole bad story before he died, that she kept it out of this here trial to save Miss Etta's name, but that if my lamb don't get his rights through the pencil wheel he'll get em this way or my name ain't Mammy Sennett. Mind yo promise now. She turned back to Mrs. Jim. I danced out into the hall, Jim in my arms. He crowed and clapped his hands at the motion, but he wasn't a bit happier than I. Think what a story. Think what a scoop. Think. There was a stir in the hall ahead of me. It was Brockington, ushering his client into the judge's chambers, from which he and the judge came out immediately and went out to luncheon together. Oh, think what Mrs. Muriel would say to the document I held in my hand. Oh, I must, I simply had to be the first to tell her of it. If the one forlorn chance in a thousand should give Mrs. Jim the victory, her secret would be as safe with her proud sister-in-law as with Mammy herself. If the jury brought in the verdict everybody expected, Mrs. Muriel would know the story anyway as soon as the news came out. So she might as well know it now and from me. I'd heard the lock click behind Brockington and the judge when they came out. So with Jim still on my arm, I hurried back into the courtroom, up behind the judge's chair, and in a minute I had pushed open the other door and stood in Mrs. Muriel's presence. It didn't seem like a presence, though. The great lady's bonnet was off, her brown hair was prettily mussed, and her head lay bowed on the desk before her. She was crying, crying just like an ordinary human woman. She looked up quickly at the noise Jim chose to make just then, trumpeting through his fists. "'I beg your pardon, Mrs. Dilworth,' I said in a rush. "'I have just got possession of a document that concerns you deeply, and—' "'You will please excuse me,' she said. Her voice was still husky with tears. They made it sound strangely soft, very different from the cold, contained utterance we heard from the stand. On my lawyer's advice I have declined, as I supposed you knew, to speak to anyone connected with the newspapers, if you will see Mr. Brockington or Mr. Hewlett. Look, Mrs. Dilworth. I let Jim slip to the floor and held the paper before her. Mechanically she felt for her lorgnette, but before she could get it her short-sighted eyes had recognized the signature. And then, then Mrs. Jim Dilworth came tearing in like a whirlwind. "'You! You give me back that paper! What right have you got to show it to her?' she cried. And then a second before I could think to hide it, she snatched it out of my hand and stormed out again, catching Jim up in a passion that made him hold tight as though the arm he rode was a ship and a typhoon. I turned, hopeless, to Mrs. Muriel. "'I assure you,' I began. But she waved apology aside. "'Tell me,' she interrupted eagerly. Won't you tell me what was in that paper? It is his signature, my husband's name. I caught only that. My eyes are so wretched. I, I, will you please tell me? No, I wouldn't. I couldn't, now, for this wasn't the Mrs. Muriel Dilworth I had been watching week after week in the courtroom, with her unchangeable composure, her pitiless ignoring of the other woman the Mrs. Muriel who dwelt on cold, inaccessible heights where humanity's cries couldn't reach her. Perhaps, Mrs. Dilworth, 
I stammered. This paper may be a forgery, too. She shook her head. That was Mr. Dilworth's writing. I know it. I am positive. Oh! Suddenly her voice broke and the tears rolled unhidden down her cheeks. Do you realize what I am enduring? How I am groping helplessly for the truth? I... I'm sorry, I began, but at that moment the door opened behind us and the judge walked in. They've reached a verdict, ladies, he said. The jury will be in in a moment. I jumped for the door. Miss Massey, please. It was Mrs. Muriel's voice, appealing, insistent. But the jury... What difference does that make? she cried. I don't want the money. I want the truth. I want... Here comes Mr. Hewlett, I put in eagerly. Mr. Brockington must have sent him for you. She wrung her hands. You cruel girl, she sobbed. Has your profession made you utterly heartless? N no, I protested, capitulating. I had to speak in a whisper, for Brockington's young partner was nearly upon us. This is what the paper says. I commend the child known as Jim Dilworth to my wife Muriel. He is... He is not my son. I couldn't help it. Up to the instant before I reached the last two words, it hadn't occurred to me. But with that quivering woman standing before me, I fell down like the miserable little coward I am. When I got to the door of the courtroom, I found it so crowded that, instead of going to the reporter's desk, I let the bailiff make way for me to the first empty chair. From where I sat I couldn't hear the words in which the foreman mumbled his verdict, but I caught a glimpse of poor Mrs. Jim's face, white, drawn, incredulous, and agonized, before she fell defeated into Mammy's arms. It was just then that Mrs. Muriel entered. She passed her lawyer's table and came swiftly toward the spot where Mammy sat, chafing Mrs. Jim's hands and holding her heavy head to her breast. Etta, Mrs. Muriel's voice was shaken still, but it was whispered music, so thrilling it was with the humility of utter happiness. Forgive me, Etta. The boy shall have all this and more. He'll be my son as well as yours if you will let me share him with you, whatever the verdict is. The verdict is already in, Mrs. Dilworth, Hewlett's voice broke in. He had followed her. We have won. Let me be first to congratulate you. But she hardly heard him. Etta, she pleaded, putting out a hand to Mrs. Jim's shoulder. Go away, you. Mammy's eyes blazed furiously up at her. You've half killed her. Instinctively, Mrs. Muriel fell back before the savage ferocity of the black woman's face. She might have yielded then to the pressure of her lawyer's hand, but suddenly she felt a tug at her skirt. It was Jim, lost, forgotten in the excitement of the moment, yet suffering intuitively, feeling and fearing the crisis. Take, he cried with a trembling lip, lifting his arms to her. Take Jim. She bent down and lifted him, holding his sobbing little body with a tenderness and yet a yielding strength that transfigured her. Through the crowd, Cochran made his way with a glass of whiskey. Mammy put it to Mrs. Jim's blue lips, then let it fall crashing to the floor. She dead! My God! Miss Etta! Miss Etta! Her black hand crept to Mrs. Jim's heart, then in a second it lifted, nodded and threatening, over Muriel Dilworth's head. You! You! The old woman stammered thickly. But baby Jim... His blond head curled into the lady's neck, turned his wet blue eyes wonderingly upon Mammy, and lifting a hand like a dimpled snowflake, he touched the black woman's lips with a pleading caress. That same little tender hand still holds back the real, the awful vengeance Mammy Sennett might take if she would. It holds me back, too, though the office would fire me in a minute if it suspected, and serve me right, too. But since Mrs. Muriel has legally adopted the boy, what good on earth would be served by wrecking a live woman's faith and dragging a dead woman's name from under the sheltering benefit of the doubt? 
End of Chapter 3 Chapter 4 The Fascination of Fantan Wherein Miss Massey Scents Graft in Chinatown It was nine in the evening when we met at the corner of the alley. Sergeant Wiss of the Chinatown Squad, Forbes, the big green reporter who had been sent along to take care of me, and myself. The sergeant was brave in his uniform. Forbes was undisguised, except that the linen he wore at the office no longer redeemed his shabbiness, so that with his soft hat pulled over his brows, his collar turned up, and his coat buttoned over the dark flannel shirt, his big, round-shouldered figure might have passed for a type of the depraved young white who haunts Chinatown, who plays the guide on occasions, but plays fan-tan and peddles lottery tickets oftener. As for me, well, half an hour before, when I left home, the Chinese laundryman was pushing the basket of soiled linen into his dilapidated old black wagon. By the time I had tottered around the corner, balancing unsteadily on my wooden Chinese slippers to where Forbes had a carriage waiting. The laundryman had climbed to his seat and caught the reins from his spare-ribbed old nag's back. Then he saw me, and the quick swinging salutation he chanted out in Chinese made my painted face tingle and my long blackened eyes dance with delight. To him I was a Chinese boy, sure enough, and that was all I wanted just to be able to slip obscurely along with a seesaw motion in my dark blouse and wide trousers, with my cued head under an American hat held low, for a block and a half, from the square where I stopped the carriage, to the alley where McCabe had arranged that the sergeant should wait for us. So it's Fantan tonight. You want to see a Fantan game? What won't you try next, Miss Massey? The sergeant spoke in a bluff, hearty voice, too hearty to suit me, for it was easily audible to the group of Chinamen just across the alley, a group that dissolved and hurried away even as Wiss spoke. Shh, I cautioned, and his voice fell. You want to see if there's gambling in Chinatown, eh? Well, there may be, a little, in spite of all the squad can do. You'll never stamp it all out. Chinamen are crafty devils to deal with, particularly the Weong Tong, the Gamblers' Association. We've closed them up pretty tight, but down here on Pacific or farther up the hill, we may catch them, for my men have been kept busy raiding the bigger places. We'll see, anyway. Congratulations on the make-up. It's great. Really? I asked, eagerly looking up at him. A fine big fellow is the sergeant of the Chinatown squad. It's such a comfortable rig if it weren't for the shoes. I put out one of the wooden-soled things to corroborate me. Really, he answered, smiling. Only you don't want to give away the game by looking up like that. No China boy's got any light in his eyes. Keep him down, Miss Massey. Keep him down for the sake of peace. To white men as well as chinks. And demurely I obeyed. There was a flirtatious glint in the sergeant's own eyes and a challenging hint in his voice, but my head was too full of schemes and plans that went deeper than even Wiss suspected to do more than say to myself. It's the subtle influence of the Orient, Rhoda, and the suggestiveness of feminine disguise. Men can't resist either, so the combination must be a hard one for a mere police sergeant to go up against but that hasn't anything to do with the case which concerns Fantan and the hunch the news has got that there's grafting going on in Chinatown, that every Fantan game pays five dollars into the bribery fund, and of the two thousand dollars raised weekly for this purpose, this same gallus Sergeant Wiss is strongly suspected. Up this way, please, the sergeant interrupted my train of thought. He strolled slowly up the hill. Forbes beside him and I following. It was misery at first, balancing along after them on the narrow, crowded sidewalk along which the Chinamen were hurrying. The dirt and the glamour of the East come full upon one in these noisome, narrow streets where the big lanterns swing and the Chinese children, playing in the entrances to subterranean dwellings, are like gaudy dragonflies lighting up the squalor. 
My heart began to beat with absurd apprehension as I fancied some accident separating me from the two in front, and I looked ahead at the sergeant's broad back. It was an easy, muscular, swinging, self-satisfied back, that. And even at Forbes' stooping shoulders, with a most comforting sense of man's place in nature, to do the rough work of women reporters' details. I said it to myself with a grin at the two unconscious backs ahead of me, but just the same I couldn't make believe to myself that I was at ease. The risk and the terror of Chinatown were upon me. In front of this red placarded wall that we were now passing, upon which the big black Chinese characters stood out boldly, Ah Lung, a member of the Chinese Educational Society, had been shot down night before last just at this time, even as he stood reading the notice of the reward for the arrest and conviction of Chinese murderers signed with his own name. And his two bodyguards stood behind him, the two without whom he had never dared show his head outside the door of his shop since a price had been put on his head. Where was the highbinder who had potted him from some nearby discreetly shuttered window? The police hadn't been able to get him, nor had they a trace of the murderer of Fong Gi, the Chinaman who had testified yesterday in court that five minutes after the shooting he saw old Chin Bak Yu, the head of the murderous Tong, open an underground door through which a fleeing hatchet man had passed. I was shivering within myself at the horror of it all as I tottered along, my cue's end tucked into my pocket, my hands hidden in the long sleeves of my blouse. The silence of the crowd, the shuff shuffling of those slippered feet that hushed through the night, broken only now and then by the jangling and toning of a salutation as men passed each other, it got on my nerves. There seemed nothing positive, strong, outspoken in this yellow world of guile, of sardonic contempt for the white man's laws, of cruel confidence in the white man's corruption, of the power of Chinese gold and Chinese craft, and cynical, murderous, never-tiring Chinese patience. I caught myself straining my ears to hear the sound of Sergeant Wiss's big boot as it struck the pavement. But the stones of Chinatown are cushioned and reeking with the years of dirt, as its history in San Francisco reeks with the stain of crime, the guilt of bribery, and the failure of law. Then I found that I was looking into the faces of the Chinamen that passed me, this one might be he who shot Ah Lung, that one the fellow whose hatchet crushed through Fong Gi's skull. It won't do, it won't do, Rhoda, I cried angrily to myself. It's cowardly to be fanciful now, everything in its place. Wait till you're writing your story, then you can spread yourself. But I drew a long breath of relief just the same when the sergeant stopped at a door or rather a blind square of heavy wood, and rapped. Not authoritatively, as is the manner of the white policeman in Chinatown, but discreetly, significantly, with that contributory caution which is the taint the yellow Chinaman's yellow gold leaves on white fingers. "'Still game, Miss Massey?' Wiss whispered. I nodded. I couldn't speak. The door swung open from the inside, Fully three inches thick it was, and without a knob, but on the inside there was a bolt which, when shot, might resist the blows of giants. The sergeant passed in, stepping down a couple of inches. The door itself was longer and broader than the doorway, and overclasped it as with a great seal of wood and iron. Forbes came next. I followed. My heart was beating violently now, but with excitement. The sick terror of imagining had passed. Across a narrow hall, then another door. In a moment it too swung open, thick, stout, like the first, and like the first, extending beyond the sill and beyond the sides like a trap door. Along a bare corridor and then the third door, like the others and behind and above it, where he could look out into the street from his post of observation, the lookout man on his perch, who must have pulled the cords that opened the three doors successively and admitted us at last. To what? Why, to a most orderly, sociable, quiet meeting of half a dozen Chinamen, sitting amiably chatting in sing-song Chinese, drinking tea and smoking their pipes. Fan-tan? Not a trace of it. A lottery or even a ticket? 
tut-tut, a malicious libel upon simple conservative Chinese gentlemen, one of whom looked up blandly as we entered, from the farther end of the long, empty room, as though to inquire the meaning of our intrusion. "'Oh, you! Sergeant! Sergeant Wiss! It was a big, good-looking Chinaman of about thirty-five who spoke the sergeant's name, with an addition of S's that hissed sibilantly about our ears. But the soul of good nature was this Chinaman, and a facile excellence of English was his that showed the value of the mission schools. "'You come look for Fantan game, eh, sergeant?' he chuckled, clapping Wiss upon the back with an ease truly American and an innocent facetiousness that would have robbed defeat itself of its sting. "'Oh, I tell you, you bully officer, sergeant, no more gambling in Chinatown now. No hot air. I no give you hot air either. Who's your friend?' He nodded toward Forbes, but he let out a cadence roar in Chinese, at once guttural and nasal, at me. For excellent reasons I didn't answer, and Wiss's friend— Forbes had caught the message in my eye. Out. Let's get out, quick, it begged. And out we went, with a parting jolly from the loquacious Chinaman, an easy mixture of irony and appreciation of a joke. The life of the party he surely was. Not another man among them had vouchsafed even a grunt, and only one other had turned to look at us, an old Chinaman with a face of wrinkled evil a black eye as cold as fear, and a thin-lipped, sagging old mouth pulled down in a deformed sneer on the side from the pipe-stem that always rested there. "'Who is he? That one?' I asked the sergeant in a whisper as the last door shut behind us and we stood for a moment in a dark doorway. "'Chin back you.' "'The head of the Sui Sings,' I gasped. "'The highbinder's tongue?' He nodded. "'You evidently know your Chinatown, Miss Massey,' he said, watching me closely. "'And the other, the spokesman?' I asked. "'Oh, you don't know him? I thought everybody knew Yet. That's Yet. Yet Kim Guy, head man of the Weong Tong, the gambler's president, the... "'The Chinaman who has a passion for mathematics, but who's a high roller in the Jerome Kirby of Chinatown?' He has a real legitimate wife, hasn't he, who's a little footwoman, and her jewelry boxes are piled so full of gold bracelets that she can't open them without their overflowing? That's yet all right. Good-looking fellow, isn't he, for a Chinaman? You ought to see him in his banqueting regalia, long about Chinese New Year. He looks the Mandarin, I tell you. But I'm sorry for the sake of your story, Miss Massey, that the thing turned out as it did. Still, we've rated him pretty steadily, and as I told McCabe when he first spoke of this Chinatown detail for you, there ain't anything much doing just now. We might go up to Pacific Avenue and try another place I know. No, no thank you, I said. I'm awfully obliged for all your trouble, but as you say... What? Have you had enough so soon? He laughed. Let's go up, Miss Massey, pleaded Forbes, interrupting. The boy was madly interested, but I shook my head. I'm sure it'd be only a waste of time. The coop will be waiting just around the corner here, so don't you bother, Sergeant. Mr. Forbes will get me in all right. I mustn't take any more of your time. I'm so much obliged to you. No, no, really, you needn't come. But your article, you haven't anything to write about, said the Sergeant, still watching me curiously. Oh, I'll have to find something, I assured him. It'll be descriptive, I suppose, which is a bore, but good night. Thank you. Yes, good night. He turned off and walked down the hill. Forbes and I went in the other direction. We didn't speak until we were safe in the coop. The boy was almost sulky at being denied further adventure. The glimpse I caught of his face as we passed a lamp post made me laugh outright. Did it get cross? I jeered just because no one would play with it any more? Oh, he flushed boyishly and apologetically. It is so interesting. I don't see how you can resist seeing more. I can't, I said demurely. Then 
Then why didn't you let Whist take us to the other place? I couldn't think of troubling the sergeant to that extent, I assured him politely. Imagine how much he must have to do with all those gambling games to suppress. What? Oh, nonsense. What is it? Tell me. This isn't the way uptown. What's that driver? Don't. I held his arm as he reached out to call to the driver. Why, he's going in the most roundabout way. He's actually turning back into Chinatown, the idiot. I'll bet he's drunk. Let... I'll bet he isn't, I giggled. I'll bet he knows that on the corner near the alley there are two policemen, not of the Chinatown squad, but from another beat entirely, in plain clothes. And there is also an old China woman, a real one, but bought by the news, with dollars, and a passage on the next boat back to China already paid, for after tonight she'll live here in peril of her life every moment till the steamer sails. Bought partly, too, with good will to one Rhoda Massey, who, if you remember, was a country school ma'am for a year before she became the gifted journalist with whom you have the honor, Mr. Forbes, of taking this drive. But he wasn't listening. Oh, tell me, he began. Who she is? She's Gum Tai, mother of Wan Hoey, the clever, cute little Chinese boy who was in my class when I taught up in Placer County, where Hoey's father was doing a dribbling business in Placer mining on an old deserted claim. Gum Tai fell in love with me when I wouldn't let the little white urchin stone my Lord Wan Hoey, as she called him. Isn't it funny and delightful the way the Chinese women speak of their men children, Mr. Forbes? Miss Massey. We're merely going to go back over our tracks, Mr. Forbes, and... And make a raid without the sergeant on the other places? He shouted. Exactly, or very nearly. We're going to make a raid without the sergeant at the same place. But, but what? Hush, hush now. We're not going to give it away as he did, purposely. Remember how loud he spoke when we met him? The carriage stopped in the square again, and again I tottered out upon the cobblestones. And again we walked up the hill, Forbes and the two plain-clothes men in front, old gum tie and myself behind. The old woman hadn't spoken in answer to my greeting. She only looked at me for a second, a wry smile on her leathery old lips. Then her eyes fell, and with her back bowed and her hands in her wide sleeves, she wobbled on, and so did I. When we got to the great blind door, the three men had stopped at the corner. She stooped for a moment and filled her claw-like brown hands with pebbles. Or perhaps she already had them and stooped to pick up another. I don't know. I looked at her inquiringly, but she shook her head, and just then the door swung open. We passed in, she and I. She seemed to stumble a bit over the low step, and again at the second one. But by the time we had got to the third door, I didn't know what she did or what I myself was doing. For it swung open, and the room, the room was crowded almost to suffocation, that room where, not half an hour before, we had left only five or six Chinamen peaceably smoking. On the table was a heap of the big oval beans of Fantan, the rejected beans, the croupier was piling up the money before him, getting ready to pay out and haul in the bets. One of the counter's long, slender brown hands was just lifting up the bowl from the smaller white heap it had encircled, and chopstick in hand, he was deftly counting out the mass by fours. Yut! One, shouted a gambler. Gee! Two, wagered another. Say! Four! Sam, three, yelled a triumphant chorus as the winner's quick eyes, mentally segregating the diminishing heap of beans, anticipated even the counter's swift stick, and prophesied that the division would have a remainder of three. Sam it was. Sam, declared the croupier, and the clink of American money that went to pay Chinese gambling debts resounded through the smoke-blotted close room and— and suddenly old gum tie caught my arm. I had actually forgotten, in my interest and excitement, why we two had entered first. There came a jarring whirr and a slam, and quick as a flash, one after another, the three lookout doors went shut. No, not quite shut, for strangely enough, in a place where Chinese guile foresaw all, 
and had provided for just such an emergency, something, some little trifling thing, lay in the way of every door's closing. Pebbles. A few pebbles had slipped from Gum Tai's palsied hands as she stumbled over each threshold. And over those pebbles, which just prevented the mighty locks from catching, Forbes and the policeman rushed in. And there was pandemonium in that yellow gambling hell, and the Chinaman cursed and the money flew. I don't know what I did, but I saw Forbes, the greenest cub reporter we'd ever had on the news, dancing in ecstasy first on one leg and then on the other. And then the police whistles blew, and Sergeant Wiss, white as death, came dashing in with his men. His eye caught mine, and for a second I had an absurd sensation of being in peril, in pain, suffering, of feeling what a hypnotized subject must feel when it is suggested to him that he is being knocked down, beaten, trampled upon. When Forbes, waking with a start to memory of what his detail was, dragged me out and put me in the carriage. My teeth were chattering from sheer excitement. I couldn't speak a word and I didn't want to. I only wanted to keep my jaws still and they were beyond my control. Inside the tumult was still going on, though Wiss had placed nearly eighty men under arrest, and down the side hill toward the bay I saw an old Chinese woman just disappearing down into a black mouth basement. It was gum tie. The quickness of her, the amazing celerity and cool-headed nerve of the old creature, who had been first to escape and was even now beyond pursuit. Graft in Chinatown? Well, I wonder. But I don't wonder at all that the Fantan game happened to be closed on our first visit in company with Wiss. I know what excellent use the Chinamen make of a telephone, and of a police officer who gives them a tip. Oh, if only Rhoda Massey might trace the graft a bit further, if she were only lucky enough and plucky enough to catch that same police officer in the act of accepting pay for police protection. I say, wouldn't the town sit up and take notice? End of Chapter 4 Chapter 5 In Chai Fong's Restaurant Where Miss Massey Meets a Missionary all sorts of queer, disconnected impressions kept coming to me as I sat there in utter silence. The ear-splitting crash and clang of the Chinese orchestra in the front room, the gaudy dragon-embroidered hangings to the rear of the restaurant, the gentle twanging of the slave girl's guitars, the teak wood chairs and tables, the handleless cups, the bizarre sing-song conversation of the men at the banquet table in the next room, even my own satin blouse, upon which peacocks were embroidered in silver in the absurd wide trousers of salmon pink, whose bands of purple were embossed in flaming orange, my purple silk hose and crimson gold embroidered slippers, all this was unreal to me, as fanciful and impossible as a mad dream. Reality stood behind it, apart from it, and the strength of its impressions persisted in replacing even the things that my senses recognized. I could see the news's first page of yesterday, with its screaming headline and my story of the raid on the Fantan games below it, more clearly, much more clearly than the expressionless ivory face, so near to me of Ah Oi, the most expensive slave girl in Chinatown, worth three thousand dollars in white man's money. I could repeat word for word the printed statement of Sergeant Wiss, denying the implication of grafting which was the atmosphere of my story as surely as the faint smell from the opium smoker's pipes was penetrating every part of Chai Fong's restaurant. Scraps and phrases of the news's big double-leaded editorial, openly charging Wiss with protecting gambling in Chinatown for a bribe, instead of wiping it out, came to me. And the whole of that last paragraph, accusing him of bad faith, of deliberately tipping off our projected raid, of warning the gamblers in advance through their spies who lurked about when we met at the corner of the alley. But back of all this there was a still stronger impression, as of a thing one has got by heart. No talk, no look-see, no turn head, no move, no listen, no speak, no bite lips, no move fingers, no sit so straight, neck down, so no lift feet when walk, 
slide, slip, soft. All time wait, all time sit still, head down, eyes down, all time wait. And here I was, all time waiting, as old gum tie, the duenna of the slave girls, had taught me in a long afternoon rehearsal, with my eyes on the floor and my sleek black head, with its jeweled bow towel lowered, my senses dulled by the strong perfume of the narcissi in the cloisonne bowls, by the smell of opium, and the dreamlike sensation of being apart, all time sitting still, all time waiting, waiting with an oriental stupefying patience for bribers and bribe to meet here, as was their custom, and pay the bribe before my very eyes. What lifelong rehearsals must these pale, quiet girls' mothers have gone through for centuries and centuries to bring to its perfection that yellow flower of repose that Ah Oi is as she sits idly there with her guitar, ornamented with precious stones, in little hands, closely and compactly made as the sheath of a lily, with nary a twitch of limb nor turn of head, her soft, dull eyes looking straight ahead and down, seeing nothing, and hearing, smelling nothing, one would say, for her ears and delicate nostrils, the color of a softly yellowed magnolia before it falls overripe from the tree, seem less like organs of sense than bits of soft but perfect and exotic statuary. Look here, Rhoda Massey. Memory, the only faculty which seemed to survive in me the drowsy suspension of my wits, brought McCabe's voice and his words to me as I sat all time waiting. Go slow. Yellow journalism and the success you've made of it are turning your steady little head. You're out yellowing your master, and when I came on the news, I held the record. The thing is impossible. You can't play the Chinawoman for a full hour's stretch. You can't fool the Chinamen, much less the slave girls up at Chai Fong's. They're the... But Gum Tai says I can, I had interrupted eagerly. I'm just saturated with Chinatown, Mr. McCabe. I've taken tea at that restaurant every night this week. I know I can do it. I know I can. Listen to this. Shut your eyes and listen, and say I'm not Ah Oi up at Chai Fong's. And then a sweet little nasal voice, more like the plaint of an insect than full-throated human utterance, I sang the Chinese of this. Make me good, O oh great Tin Hao, make me gentle, chaste, and witty. Make me all of these or none. But, oh, I pray thee, make me pretty. Bully! Encore! cried McCabe, tapping his blue pencil enthusiastically on the desk. But I wouldn't sing the other verses. I wanted too much to persuade him while his impression lasted. See, Mr. McCabe, I began hurriedly. Surely that old China woman knows. I'm to be a Hakka woman, while all the other girls are from Canton. Of course, then, I couldn't understand a word of their dialect, nor they of mine. Gum Tai will tell them all that, so I'll not have to say a word or understand anything. Besides, it's etiquette for a new girl just bought, a novice, not to say anything, and the older girls in slavery ignore her rather contemptuously and critically, much as at our fortnightly dances the debutante runs up against the buds of a season or two, and... I won't listen to your wheedling, Rhoda. You've a faculty carefully and artfully cultivated, I suspect, my lady, of making the melodramatic sound simple and natural and robbing sensation itself of its off color. I won't let you try this scheme, I tell you. Am I the news editor of this paper, or am I merely the home secretary for your foreign, very foreign affairs, you conceited and rampant little yellow journalist? I declined to enlighten him, but went on coaxing. Do you see a page story, Mr. McCabe, I begged, with photos of the interior of Chai Fong's, Mr. McCabe, with Sergeant Wynn and Chin Bok Yu and Yet Kim Guy sketched from a description by Rhoda Massey? With a picture, Mr. McCabe. Yes, I'll even let you run a picture of Miss Massey in the costume of a Chinese belle, if only. Get thee behind me, Satan, and let me send for the Lunacy Commission. Please, I coaxed. He threw down his pencil and jumped to his feet. I won't. I can't, Rhoda. The money's been paid there once and will be again, but I don't dare trust you to fool too much with these yellow devils. 
if you could have Forbes come along to take care of you, but to send you alone into a den like that, my God, girl, you're clean daft. You've lost your sense of proportion. You don't know the possible from the undoable, and you've forgotten the elementary rules of the game. I suppose I have, I said slowly. Give it up, Rhoda, he growled tenderly, as I made sorrowfully for the door. At the office they call me McCabe's white-headed boy since that gambling raid, and it's pleasant to know he hates to refuse me anything. We'll think up something else. There's a crisis due in the Lowenthal menage a trois before long. Young Lothal, the son, caught the two, Mrs. L. and Kirby, at the Hummingbird last night at supper after the theater. There'd have been a bully row then and there if Mrs. L. hadn't left the place with her stepson. Kirby came over to my table afterward, and I promised to keep the incident out of the papers. Charming fellow, Jerome Kirby, built for the villain in the play, gay and reckless, handsome and cruel and clever. Just fancy his getting me to... I made an impatient movement. You mean you're tired waiting for that scandal to ripen? he asked. So is the rest of the town. But here's something else that will really come off very soon. The mission is going to make a star play. They're going to rescue Aoi. I'll find out from Miss McIntosh exactly when it is to be, and you can be in on that. It'll be a corking story. But you shan't do this other mad thing with my consent. We'll find some other way to trap Wiss. But not this. Never with my consent, Miss Rhoda Massey. Then without it, I cried to myself as I shut the door behind me and started for gum ties. I went over it all again now as I sat, all time waiting, at Chai Fong's. The slave girls were playing Pai Gao now, dominoes, gambling silently. It was some comfort to me just to think of McCabe, to feel that outside this opium-scented oriental dream a man lived, a big-brained, big-hearted white man, with his fingers playing at the buttons that set the world a-moving, with a head full of knowledge of human nature and all its variety, with a sense of humor that kept him and the rest of us well balanced, and an irresistible strength and originality in his point of view. And this same man, this far-famed old McCabe of the news, was precisely the newspaper man whose commands I had disregarded, whose advice I had scorned. Oh, if he had only stood in! but to have to set oneself the hardest detail in one's whole newspaper life and to miss McCabe behind you. I gave a gasp at my own audacity. I wasn't conscious of making any sound, but instantly every eye in the room was turned upon me. I felt them, those black, ironical, impenetrable Chinese eyes. They made me glow and shiver, and involuntarily I made a motion to get to my feet. I believe I was terrified enough to have scuttled away then and there, if at that minute a dominating high voice, rolling out a chanting string of Chinese, hadn't broken in upon us all. It came from the stairway beyond and bore, even before its owner followed it, so strong and imperious a suggestion of assertive activity that the whole establishment seemed to respond to it. Chai Fong himself came to the door a moment and sang out an order. Doors were hurriedly closed all over the place. A screen was swiftly stretched across, shutting in our corner that gave on to the high little lacquered, lantern-hung balcony which overlooked the square, and in here a table, upon which chop suey, sweetmeats, tea and rice wine were already set in fanciful porcelain, was brought and placed in the farther corner, while the waiters flew about like mad and Ah Oi daintily touched her long pearl earrings and bracelets of jade and silver filigree with a slender tan finger and a long pointed nail, sniffing with nervousness just once or twice, as a deer might through distended dry nostrils. Yet Kim Guy, the first, I knew him. His walk was a bit more assured, more elegantly pompous than it had been the other night when we raided the game. In his long mandarin's robe, the new year must be near, he moved with the dignified role of a sea captain aboard his own ship, even though he was smoking a cigar. I know the smell of a good cigar. McCabe smokes the best in town. Our respected proprietor, who owns the news and Lord knows what besides, 
facetiously declared to me the other day that he couldn't afford cigars such as his news editor smokes. But McCabe's specially imported gold-banded darlings can't be any better than the one this big, young, fine-looking Chinaman removes from his lips to pour out an intoned roar of Chinese, which awakens celestial echoes from his companions. One of them is Chin Bak Yu, the fearful old death's head who presides over the sea yups, the high binders. It is one of his men, Chow La, who accompanies him, a great bulky beast of a Chinaman with a square face framed in the high binder's locks, with a mouth that's a big brutal gash, a nose that's obscene, and eyes of black bestiality. We have his photo in the art room. We keep it to personify the yellow peril and that sort of thing. All Chinamen look alike, they say, to white men, but these three are strong types. Once seen and their characteristics fitted to them, one isn't likely to forget them. What I had forgotten in their coming was the panic terror that had seized me. So possessed was I by curiosity now that it was all I could do to remember the old duenna's words. No look-see, no move, no listen, no turn head. No look-see, when my eyes were irresistibly drawn, fascinated by the three. No listen, when by straining to the utmost, my ears could bring to me only the burden of sound without sense. Listen? I listened as though all my senses were merged into one. Yet Kim Guy's was the voice that rolled out with a declamatory clearness of utterance. I could almost repeat the syllables after him. Old Chen's grunts and whining nasal phrases seemed wrung from him as he sat smoking, his dull old eyes like pinpoints under their wrinkled lids, his everlasting pipe dragging at his misshapen mouth. The hatchet man bellowed out a guttural sound now and then, but he ate, ate like a famished beast till, nauseated, I had to bite my painted lips to keep from crying out at him. I missed my handkerchief then, and was putting my sleeve to my lips, when it was twitched suddenly, and looking up, I saw Ah Oi gazing at me in mute astonishment. I had forgotten, I had forgotten Gum Tai's first and last admonition, to do in Rome what the Romans did, and at just this minute the three other girls were standing about the table. Oh, thank, I began. But Ah Oi had already taken her place, fortunately, and slip, slip, I slid after her. I had been well trained for this part of it. I knew the slave girl's role at the banquet, to be mute, to be vacantly smiling and ornamental, like a figure on a fan, and only to accept wine when a guest has had more than is good for him. I watched Ah Oi take the thimbleful of Sam Shu, rice-fired rice wine, from the high binder's unsteady fingers. I saw her affect a sip a bit, and then with disdainful grace spill it upon the floor. When yet Kim Guy motioned toward his own cup, he hadn't eaten at all but drank with a full-throated intemperance that was most un-Chinese, I was ready. I reached a trembling hand out in front of him, lifted the tiny glass cup to my lips, and, and let it fall, shattered into bits upon the floor. Right opposite me, looking over the screen and straight into mine, was a pair of eyes, gray American eyes, the eyes of Sergeant George Wiss. I don't know what happened for a second. If the penalty for it had been his calling out my name and unmasking me upon the spot, I couldn't have done anything other than I did, put my shaking hands up to my face and sob, sob in tearless terror and excitement and, and satisfaction for he had come, he had come. It was true, then. The money was to be paid here. What did I care for anything else? The slave girl's horrified hush at my clumsiness and fracture of etiquette, the scolding of the head waiter. I knew the accent as a dog might, but not the words. The amused laugh of the sergeant as he pushed the screen aside and entered. The good-natured interference in my behalf of yet Kim Guy, who came to a poor girl's rescue, like the man of the world and gallant he is, his pantomime was unmistakable. It was all nothing to me. My story was coming true, the impossible story, the story that McCabe himself had not dared to tackle. Kung Hai! Fat Toai! The sergeant cried out the New Year's greeting glibly, 
shaking his own hand cordially in the Chinese style, but refusing the chair a waiter offered. Old Chin grunted a recognition without removing his pipe. Yet Kim Guy waved his hand in an airy American fashion. Chow La nodded, taking the briefest respite from the business of eating. "'Ah, there, ah, oi,' said the sergeant gaily, putting an arm around her and another impartially around the girl on the other side. And they tittered these Chinese bells and wriggled, complimented by the queer American attention. In great spirits was Sergeant Wiss, evidently. I watched with satisfaction the quick glances he threw about the place and the flash of intelligence between him and Yet. It was at a word from the gambler that Ah Oi had taken her queer little guitar and was singing a pale little nasal melody, the inevitable ditty, when Hoey translated it for me, whose second verse put into English goes, Make me noble, dread Tin Hao, kind to all, no creature harming. Make me patient, generous, faithful, but I implore thee, make me charming. Wis crooned it with her. He did it better than I could, with a skill that bespoke practice and opportunity. He put out his hand at the end of the verse to pinch my arm, but I reached just then for a cup, and being a merry, easily pleased gay gentleman of the police, he accepted the girl in the red gold embroidered blouse as a substitute. But everybody was merry by this time, except old Chin. His death's mask never changed a line. His horned toad's eyes had never a glimmer of light or life. Wait, Sergeant, I sing for you, cried Yet, taking the guitar from Ah Oi's hand. Ever hear this, bully song? And to my utter amazement he strummed a few familiar bars and burst jovially into, There'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. A hysterical desire to laugh came upon me. It was so maddeningly funny so absurd, so crazy a caricature of ourselves in our silliest season. Yet every stolid yellow face about me looked perplexed or contemptuous or bored, and only in Wiss's eyes could I read a reflection of that amazed and mocking applause that filled me. Great, old boy! Wiss brought his hand down with a thump on Yet's shoulder. Eat leisurely, he went on, guying the Chinese method of excusing oneself. Ho oh, hang! A safe walk to you, answered Yet, entering into the spirit of the translation. Ho oh, hang! The Chinese could buy. I was still shaking with suppressed laughter, but that sobered me, for with a parting squeeze to the girl he still held, the sergeant turned on his heel, pushed past the screen, and was gone. Gone! And not a nickel, not an incriminating word had passed between them. I couldn't believe my senses. I couldn't realize it. I was frantic with disappointment, and I might have stood there yet like a gaping idiot, looking after him, if Ah Oi hadn't touched me again significantly, and I turned to see the other girl slipping away. We were to withdraw, evidently. Gum Tai had told me that when anything of importance was to be discussed, the slave girls were dismissed without ceremony. I followed Ah Oi dully. I was dazed. I couldn't readjust my mind to so unexpected a result. The sergeant, in the course of his rounds, had looked in a moment at Chai Fong's, not in the open part frequented by Americans, tis true, but there he had greeted his Chinese friends, listened to a song of Yet Kim Guy's, and patronizingly hugged a slave girl, not as a man might a woman, but as though she were a child, a doll, or any pretty, non-human, soulless thing that couldn't speak or feel. And that was all, positively all. A fury possessed me as I followed Ah Oi out into the other room. What did I care now for old gum ties, instructions, and apprehensions and admonitions? Suppose I was discovered. The game was up, and I knew the way out. Out this window to the veranda and down into the square. We had arranged that all right. But fortunately Ah Oi was unsuspicious or perhaps she was preoccupied and didn't notice the dropping of my roll, for though I forgot all caution, she seemed hardly conscious of me. She was behaving queerly herself, even I could see that. If she had been a human being instead of a passive Chinese doll, I should have said she had something on her mind. 
for when the other girls sank down into a corner and fell to eating greedily and drinking tea from a tray which had been put there, she gave me one swift, enigmatic glance, imploring, confiding, searching, and passed quickly out upon the veranda. I, too, slipped out. There was nothing more for me inside. But the narrow little balcony was empty. Evidently always guardianship of me, which shrewd old gum tie must have arranged for, was at an end. Now she was looking after herself. What could she be up to, I asked myself. In spite of my bitter disappointment, I had counted on bagging this story and throwing it triumphantly at McCabe's feet. I stood a minute there looking out. Evening had come and the young moon was shining a silver veil down over the hilly town, idealizing its crude, irregular skyline. It poeticized the untidy little square and touched a bit of nickel on a cab lamp that glowed in the dusk below. But it concentrated its soft luster upon the wide, wonderful, shining bay beyond, where the ferry boats became floating castles of light, and Alcatraz, glorified into outlines only, stood out castellated like an Aaron Breitstein anchored on the water. In the reaction of the strain I had been living under, I stretched out my arms toward it all. It was beautiful. It was American. It was Western. It was mine. When clearly down in the street below I heard a whistled melody. Make me shy and straight and still. Docile make me, too, and dutiful. Make me perfect, if you will. But, oh, sweet demon, make me beautiful. Mechanically I had repeated the words to myself of the last verse to Tin Hal, accompanying the whistle below. But I was thinking, thinking hard. A Chinaman might hum that melody, though it was unlikely. A white man might whistle the classic hot time. But only one person I knew would be likely to whistle the slave girl's plaintive little nasal prayer to her goddess. Down I slipped behind a great potted palm. Out here, when Chinese guests have not monopolized the restaurant, white women from the eastern states came to stand for a moment beneath the huge swinging lanterns and look at Chinatown and the bay from on high. My heart was thumping an accompaniment, and over and over in my head the words went singing. I could hear someone coming softly up the first flight of steps and then the second. My fingernails, which had been growing untrimmed for a month, so seriously had I gone in for local color, were digging into my palms. I was trembling, so sure was I, so sure that— A sergeant's cap. He appeared above the top step. I was right. I was right after all. He passed me so close that I could see the three bars on his sleeve and the light from the window, and when he had gone in, I crouched there a full minute waiting, waiting till I could be calm again. By the time I'd got to the window, I had taken off the crimson boxes of slippers that I might be noiseless. He was seated at the table with the three Chinamen and facing me, Sergeant George Wiss, head of the Chinatown squad an American police officer bribed by dirty yellow money to betray his trust. Perhaps you think I didn't make vows to the gods of yellow journalism as I stood there. Perhaps you think I didn't compose a dozen different openings for my triumphant entry upon McCabe before I should throw down the booty before him. I couldn't hear a word, of course, from where I stood, but yet and the sergeant were having it hot and heavy, evidently. Some dispute as to terms, some reproach for the last raid in which one Rhoda Massey had taken part, perhaps. I could imagine how the clever gambler would score his paid servant for not delivering the goods. I could almost fancy I heard him use the very words. But I did see him at last lift a heavy inverted cloisonne bowl from the middle of the table and uncover a pile of twenties. They must have been there the whole evening. I saw both Chen Bak Yu and Chow La scowling in dispute and I saw Wiss reach out his strong white hand among all those vile yellow ones, and—and and all at once I couldn't see, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't cry out nor hear, except dully. Something had been suddenly thrown over my head, and someone had seized me and was carrying me swiftly down the stairs. I struggled. I gasped and tried desperately to scream, and somehow I got the idea that my struggles surprised my captor for he kept murmuring under his breath to me in Chinese, in a tone that I fancied was reassuring. But I was so frantic with fear by now that I distrusted even my own instincts. 
I would have welcomed yet Kim Guy himself if I could have brought him there by screaming, but I couldn't scream, and I was still struggling like a cat in a bag, when the big Chinaman reaching the alley below almost dumped me down into something that quickly moved away. It was a carriage. I knew that as soon as the door slammed and the horses started. But when I tore at the cloth that covered my head, a woman's hands helping me all the time, and at last sat up, red and furious and terrified, I knew in a moment what had happened to me. I had been rescued. Shades of Confucius! I had been rescued at the moment when I would have given the earth for one minute more as a slave girl. Yes, rescued, alas, by the mission. The good, stupid, angelic mission that helps Chinese girls to escape from slavery and even permits them to pretend to fight against their rescuers so that in case of failure the unhappy creatures may claim that the effort was an abduction made against their will and not with their connivance. I sat up and looked at Miss McIntosh opposite me. She was murmuring the few Chinese words she knew in the most reassuring way. I looked at the dear old respectable Scotchwoman, devoted, tender, brave soul, and I longed to beat her. Ah, oi, ah, oi, she asked then, doubtfully. Ah, oi, I cried, the words escaping me after hours of silence with the pop of a released piston. Great gunny bags, how I wish it was. I can see her face yet, and it almost consoles me. McCabe? Oh, he doesn't know yet. I wonder if I'll ever dare to tell him. Gum tie? She's safe at sea, sailed on the China the next morning. Sergeant Wiss? They say he's to be our next chief of police. The graft went up higher, and so will he. Miss McIntosh? She never can understand why I don't write up that story of the slave girls and the mission, which I told her I was after that night. She thinks me lazy and neglectful of the paper's interests, and incapable on the whole of real serious work. Rhoda Massey? Oh, she's living humble these days and walking soft. They say at the office just now that the rumor about her getting the big head was all a false alarm. She's a model of amenability, is Rhoda, of conservative good sense and good judgment, and is actually in line for a desk position, I've heard. But it's way down low, that part of it. No man and only one woman on the paper would believe it. End of Chapter 5 Chapter 6 That List of Bassets, which Miss Massey published. It all came about through Senator Thorpe's constitutional incapacity to take program. Newberry, the other candidate for the senatorship, looked at United Powers' table of facts and figures and promptly threw up the sponge. There was no use fighting Boss Bassett and the mighty corporation that controls politics throughout the state. He knew that. Thorpe knew it, too, but admitting a fact and being reconciled to it were two widely separated processes to Thorpe. "'You're in the fight to stay, Senator?' Bassett had asked by way of preliminary. "'You really expect to be re-elected?' The two men were closeted at the senator's headquarters in the one hotel at Sacramento. Everybody stays at the same place at the Capitol during sessions, even reporters. There is no other place. "'You bet I'm in it. Bill Thorpe's no quitter,' answered the senator. Bassett passed a fat white hand over a close-shaven chin. "'You can count on your men, I suppose, or—' "'That's what I can.' declared Thorpe positively. "'Or you think you can,' amended Bassett softly. Whereupon Thorpe swore roundly, fussed and fumed, announced his absolute conviction of the loyalty of his supporters in a loud, uncertain voice, and then fell silent and uncomfortable, biting his short nails and casting scrutinizing glances at Bassett. But you might scrutinize U.P.'s boss's face till doomsday without finding out anything but what he wanted you to know. I've interviewed Bassett a number of times on the most delicate matters concerning the boss's boss, United Power, and he has sent me away empty-handed regularly, and yet with a pleased little sense of having been permitted to infer something special, a vague something of an intimate and confidential nature which, the boss intimated, 
would be caviar to the mere multitude of reporters. The old fox, with his small, twinkling, cold eye, his stiff, short hair, his shrewd, sharp nose. Oh, I can fancy just how he looked at Thorpe. Why, look here, Bassett. The senator began to bluster. The boss's smiling confidence disconcerted him. These men are pledged to me. Will you? began Bassett, but Thorpe stormed past the interruption. And not only pledged in black and white, but they're bound to me besides. I'm no chicken in politics, but when you secure a man's election as I did Allen's, when you've got a deputy collectorship of the port for a near relative as I did for Brigham's brother, when you've shelled out money to pay a mortgage pressingly due, which is what I did for Kenify, when you've spent your own money in their counties as I have for Grimmin, Glass, Hires, Erton, Johnson, Jameson, and the lot of them, why, you ought to be able to count pretty hard on them. You certainly ought, agreed Bassett, with the openness to conviction that made intellectual contact with him refreshing. Senator Thorpe got to his feet, puffed out his chest, dug his hand down into his pocket, and complacently jingled his money and his keys. "'Well, that's where I stand,' he declared, with pompous self-satisfaction. And Bassett looked at him. "'Yep, that's where I stand,' repeated Thorpe, a bit of irritation at the other's smiling silence betraying itself in his voice and manner. "'Well?' he demanded presently. Well, I wouldn't stand too hard, Senator. I wouldn't. And Thorpe began to bluster, drowning the very words he really wanted to hear in his effort to keep up his own courage. Bassett scratched his stiff, bristling hair gently and waited. Do you mind, Senator? he asked pleasantly after Thorpe had subsided. Showing me your list? Only the true and tried, if you please, those you're absolutely sure of. You can have my word that I'll take no advantage of your confidence, but I may be able to assist, to spare you some trouble and possible disappointment, he concluded, with a delicate hesitation. Of course, Boss Bassett is a man of honor with certain well-defined limitations. Everybody knows that, and Thorpe knew it as well as anybody. A man isn't in politics and a corporation-ridden state for fifteen years, without learning the kind of boss he has to deal with. All right, I'll show it to you, not for the reasons you give, but to prove to you what good grounds I have for feeling confident of re-election. He pulled a slip of paper out of his wallet, and tapping it knowingly with his forefinger, said, You're not the first man who has seen it. Newberry, who's got twenty votes. Newberry did have twenty votes, put in Bassett quickly. Thorpe looked at him a moment, irritated, incredulous inquiry in his face. Then he hurried on. Newberry thought some of these fellows might have been repeating on us. So yesterday we got together, he and I, and just quietly compared notes. By heaven, there wasn't a single name on his list that was on mine. The men pledged to him were true to him. The men pledged to me were true to me. You mean true in your case so far as Newberry is concerned, and in his so far as you are concerned? remarked Bassett imperturbably. I mean, what's that? I don't understand you. Thorpe was agitated. There's a third candidate. True it. Bah! If I have twenty-eight and Newberry twenty, his votes are bound to come to me after a few ballots, and true it. Of course, of course, if you have twenty-eight and he has twenty. What the devil do you mean? Bassett held out his hand for Thorpe's list, then pulled two papers from an inside pocket and laid the three sheets side by side on the table. Come, look, he said, nodding toward the evidence so openly displayed. And Thorpe looked. There was Newberry's list, with more than half the names significantly checked off, and, beside it, on Bassett's list, boldly standing out and paralleling Thorpe's own name for name, was the record of his men gone over to the enemy, pledged to true it. It ran something like this. Allen, $2,000. Brigham, Harry Brigham, son, and the mint. Ewing, 
Post and Railroad Office, San Francisco. Grimmen, $3,000. Glass, can't be bought. Hires, $2,500. Urton, $2,500. Johnson, can't be got. Jameson, doubtful. Kenify, $1,500. Klein, $2,000. And so on down the list. No wonder Thorpe looked shocked. He had been outbid without even a notification that he must bid higher. How did I get it all? Through Thorpe, of course. State Senator Newberry had taken his defeat like a philosopher. A base, truckling coward, Thorpe now called him, and was working busily in the Truett camp with an eye out for future contingencies. But Thorpe, oh, Thorpe was just dancing with rage, just piping hot, brimming over and a tiptoe to pour his tale of woe into a sympathetic ear. And instead of one, he found two, or rather four, mine and Ted Thompson's. Aiken was there, too, to sketch the rampant Thorpe in action, while we listened and questioned. But artists don't count, and Aiken, anyway, never hears a word that's going on. But really, Ted and I hadn't much questioning to do. Thorpe was so ready. If we had caught him ten minutes later, he'd have had time to bethink himself that a corporation outlives individuals, scandals, charges, proofs, and popular indignation. That United Power has a long memory, and that a certificate of political death from Bassett is all that's necessary before burial promptly takes place. But when Ted and I overheard Newberry on the Capitol steps inveighing against Thorpe for cutting him dead in the Senate chamber that morning, with one accord we turned and made for the hotel. While Ted scurried through the bar, the billiard room, and up to the Senator's headquarters at last, I phoned for the artist, and when we got to Thorpe's plush parlor, Teddy had him neatly corralled and not another reporter on the horizon. "'You can have it all to yourself, you lucky girl,' Ted said, when Thorpe had been turned inside out and left for remorse to seize upon him. "'The Times records committed, you know, to the belief that U.P. is the noblest and most generous of public benefactors. I'll give the office the facts, of course, but they'll only print an obscure paragraph vaguely alluding to rumors, etc.' so you've got a bully thing for your own. I won't give it away. We'll keep it in the family. Whose? I asked, thanking him with a look. Why, ours, yours and mine, he chuckled. Oh, you know it'll come to that one of these days, Miss Massey, he added. The bold-faced conceit of him. I don't know anything of the sort. I'm wedded to me art, Mr. Theodore Thompson, I said haughtily. Tell that to McCabe, he jeered. Mr. McCabe would be interested, I remarked demurely. Rhoda, it was half appeal, half affected dismay. You haven't been and gone and taken a base advantage of my being busy to go and get McCabe to fall in love with you. How do you know that I won't get a little leisure one of these days? I do know, I interrupted that we're both a bit intoxicated over this lovely grind on the whole senatorial situation. And I know, too, that I'll never be able to hold you in a breach of promise suit, Ted, for you could always claim that the offer had been made, or scantily implied, rather, under intense excitement induced by the prettiest scandal that ever scandalized scandalous Sacramento. I'm off to work. I want a denial from Bassett. Of course he'll deny till he's black in the face. But there'll be senatorial investigations, won't there, and deputations from the city and mounting in hot haste all over the political battlefield. Oh, dear. Yes, darling, he said attentively. Ted Thompson, I flared at him, take care. I see signs of paresis and... No, you're too modest, Rhoda. It isn't invariably a symptom of alcoholism or approaching imbecility to care for you. Shoo! Oh, there comes Thorpe, I cried. He'll want to retract, scoot. Rhoda, Ted whispered, I'll cover the retreat. The T.R. will print all the retractions he wants, but you don't have to, you lucky little thing. I hurried up the stairs, but before I got to my room, I heard Ted say sweetly, Not the slightest use in the world, Senator. 
Of course, so far as the T.R. is concerned, I'll fix it all right. But I just left Miss Massey at the telegraph office. The whole thing's on the wire by now, and the news will have it sure. The only way you can stop it is by reaching McCabe himself. Suppose you get the next train and go down to see him. Suppose he did, I grinned. It would keep him out of the way of the other reporters. As for reaching McCabe, that duck of a Ted Thompson knew as well as I that McCabe simply can't be reached, and that the news's whole policy is a rabid anti-UP paper made this bit of news so valuable that all the senator's horses and all his men and barrels of money couldn't buy it back again. Now, a secret investigation is a direct challenge to the press. It's an insulting way of telling newspapers to go about their business, which, of course, is to find out by surreptitious means the very thing which is surreptitiously being kept from them, or, rather, which someone is attempting to keep from them. For I never yet knew of a star chamber session, from a grand jury meeting to the solemn silences in the United States Senate, that kept secret, secret things. They're the one thing sure to leak. So at first we were hopeful up at Sacramento, when the legislature appointed a committee to investigate certain charges made by a certain newspaper published in the city and county of San Francisco, besmirching the fair name and fame of California, stabbing to the very vitals the reputation of legislators of this great state, legislators who, if the said grave charges might be substantiated, must be driven with scorn and loathing forever from the honored seats of public office, driven to the festering haunts of obscurity, and left to rot there in their own infamy. I quote from the resolution introduced by the Honorable Horace Kenify of Grafton. It was a beautiful speech, quite Kenify, a grandstand play, Ted Thompson said, but McCabe always believed it to be indignation due to the Honorable Horace's discovering that he had been sold, too cheap. McCabe came up, you know, when I wired him that I was summoned to appear as a witness at the investigation. Ted wasn't in it to any extent, for the T.R. had carefully belittled the whole thing. But my! I was glad to see McCabe's big-coated figure stalking into the saddle rock, where Ted and I were at breakfast. It gave me the snuggest feeling of being personally conducted. Hey, Rhoda, has the sun just come out? Ted demanded as I jumped up to meet McCabe's outstretched hand. No, Mr. Thompson, the father's just come up. The journalistic daddy of Rhoda Massey, who feels just as safe when the news is news editor's on desk as— But suppose the managing editor had come up instead, McCabe asked, still holding my hand. I made a wry face. Old Brofton has always been a figurehead on the news. I knew that McCabe was really running things the very first day he took me into the office in spite of Bowman's prejudice against women reporters. McCabe laughed and, sitting down at the table, called for a cup of coffee. "'So you don't approve of your managing editor?' he asked, smiling. He was positively shining with good nature this morning. "'Miss Massey, rebel, is the way they put it down at the office.' "'I don't approve of Brofton,' I insisted. "'Nobody does.' "'I said you're managing editor,' he repeated significantly. Not. I looked at him. Of course it was. It was gratified ambition that beamed from his face. You couldn't mistake it. Oh, Mr. McCabe, I squealed. Congratulations. And we shook hands all around the table. But it makes a fellow feel a bit as though he were butting in on a Thanksgiving breakfast or some family function of that sort, growled Ted. She's ungrateful anyway, Mr. McCabe. Here I have been coddling and comforting my hated rival ever since she jumped with both feet into politics. She's the most looked-at girl in Sacramento. Raw young assemblymen yearn to meet her. Shy old state senators are afraid of her. And all this time, instead of throwing bombs at her for holding the center of the stage so cheekily, I've been playing guardian and masculine prop and shelter. Yet the minute you appear, she flies to your bosom like a poor little dove who's been all alone among hawks. Fie, Rhoda. With a nod, he was about to leave us to talk things over, when McCabe put out a hand to detain him. I say, Thompson, he said slowly, why not really butt into the news family? 
There's a news editorship vacant since Saturday. Bowman's too limited or he'd have it. What do you think? Oh, jolly, I exclaimed. Ted hesitated. Thanks, I'm awfully obliged, Mr. McCabe, and appreciative, too. Will you let me think it over? A desk position doesn't tempt me. I wouldn't have the city editorship on the T.R., you know, because I've always had a sneaking feeling that perhaps I could write some day, something other than newspaper stuff. But thank you. I'd like to work for you, and can it stay open just for a day or so? McCabe nodded. Ted went off, and we got down to business. It's all straight, eh? This Thorpe Bassett stuff? Was McCabe's first question. Confess now. If this thing's on the level, the news'll back you till the last shot is fired. But if it's a fake, Rhoda, I want to know now before we go into action, and, and the news'll back you just the same, of course. But upon honor, now. Don't be so heroic, Mr. McCabe, I grinned. Of course it's all true, every word of it. Thompson could corroborate it, only it wouldn't be fair to put him in such a position with the T.R. But what makes you think it isn't straight? Thorpe denies it. Phew. In his testimony before the investigating committee, he disavowed the thing altogether, the main thing, that is, the charge that Bassett brought his men and showed him a list with the market price of legislators attached. How do you know what he said before the committee? Even Thompson can't get a line from the inside, you know. Neither can I, for publication, but we got this as a private tip, on condition the news shouldn't make use of it. The thing, the one thing on earth that we want now is a copy of that list of Bassett's. Well, you are modest, I cried. Is there anything else you'd like? It'll be produced before the investigating committee. No. Yes, it will. Not by Thorpe. He is recanted all right. Donned his hair shirt. Walked barefoot to the U.P. office and is now groveling for Pope Bassett's forgiveness. But you see, this ruction of yours has stirred Newberry up. He sees a chance with Thorpe out of it, and with Bassett's man, Truett blasted effectually by suspicion. His usefulness to United Power impaired by the very fact of his being labeled a U.P. man. So Newberry, to whom Bassett showed a copy of that same precious document, of which Newberry promptly made a copy, is going to produce it, or rather to get it indirectly before the committee, have it found by someone in some mysterious way that won't connect him with it, and then, posing as the great reconciler by instancing his submission to Bassett as evidence of loyalty to United Power, and the fact he was not Bassett's candidate, as recommendation to the independents, just naturally gather in the senatorship. Oh, he ought to give it to us, that list, I cried. He'll owe it to us. He was out of the running before. Yes, he ought, but he doesn't dare. Bassett'll watch him like a hawk after this, and connection with any anti-U.P. paper right after the Thorpe expose would be too evident. No, there's no thoroughfare there. But I give my new baton for that paper, Rhoda Massey. The stenographer, I suggested. He shook his head. It's Benson. Abandon hope, all ye who, I moaned. Benson's like glass, incorruptible. He laughed. Well, come on. It's a great fight, anyway. And the office is pleased to be pleased with you, Miss Massey, and if the small sum of twenty more per would be considered any testimonial of our appreciation, why... Oh, how nice of you, I cried. I'll actually be able to pay for the gown I've ordered for the inaugural ball, and... Don't. Charge it to the office. And make it a corker, mind you, and do us credit. He kept me laughing all the way up to the Capitol. McCabe's hair is getting gray, and his lean, strong face can be grim at times. But he's as boyishly interested in newspaper gossip as Forbes, the green reporter, is. And he does tell a story beautifully. Positively, when I walked with him into the Supreme Court rooms, where the investigation was being held, and we met Wilson, the news's lawyer there, I was ashamed to remember how I had quaked when the formidable document subpoenaing me had been handed to me. Even if my story had been a fake, with McCabe to back me, I think I could have gone on the stand and lied like a... like a senator. McCabe was called to testify first. 
Where had he received the information that he published January 3rd? From Miss Massey at Sacramento. Had he investigated it before he published so grave an accusation? The news had never found it necessary to investigate Miss Massey's stories. Did the gentleman mean to have this august body infer that merely on an irresponsible reporter's gossip, on the sending in of a fake, such, his questioner had been informed, was the technical term used in journalism to describe this sort of tale, a newspaper would blast the reputation of honored and honorable men? The news employed no irresponsible reporters, McCabe answered quietly, and for every word Miss Massey had written, the news was as responsible as though it were signed by its proprietor. Very well. The time would come, Mr. Kennify remarked ominously, when that responsibility would be tested in the courts of this great state. In the meantime, the news' managing editor was excused and Miss Massey was called. Miss Massey came. She had been primed by Jack Wilson, the cleverest lawyer in all the West, and her heart was beating with gratification at McCabe's testimonial. But she trembled like a little idiot, just the same when she was sworn, and she had a curious double sense of ridiculing herself from the reporter's desk at the very same moment that she sank gasping into the chair McCabe vacated, and to which he led her with ostentatious formality. It was the Honorable Horace Kennify's lawyer who came to her rescue. He bullied. He started in with a truculent roar, and that gave Miss Massey time enough to get a grip on herself, so as not forever to disgrace the dear old news. And really, after one had sat for a moment in the witness chair, the awful investigating committee faded away, and you just saw through the official mask they had put on. Just 1,500 Kennify, as he was called now, top-notch Grimmon, stanch, kindly old Judge Glass, Lamson the Lion of San Isidro, Mooney the Boy Orator from Siskiyou, and all the other familiar faces that appeared daily at ordinary legislative sessions to furnish copy for newspaper people. "'I call upon you, Miss Massey,' Kennify's lawyer shouted melodramatically, "'to produce the document referred to in the news of January 3rd. I can't. You can't. Do you mean to say there is no such document? I mean to say that Senator Thorpe told me there is such a document, but... He showed it to you? No. You took it down as he read it to you? No. Where are your notes? I didn't take any. Of course I didn't. It would scare confession from volubility itself to see itself being taken down in black and white. Miss Massey, you don't intend this distinguished body to understand that you wrote your interview with Senator Thorpe, so important an interview, from memory. Yes, I do. Ah, then being fallible you are liable to be mistaken? An exact quotation occasionally, but not in the matter reported. It was then that State Senator Loder sprang to his feet. I demand, he shouted, that this committee ask for its discharge. I demand that the absurdity of considering so flagrant a case of journalistic irresponsibility be recognized. Is so frail and uncertain a thing as a girl's memory to be made the basis of attacks upon the probity of legislators whose honor has never been impugned? Is it possible that this body will further dignify with its attention so trivial a charge, emanating from a notoriety-seeking girl who... Both Wilson and McCabe were on their feet then, but I wouldn't let them speak. It was my turn now. Mr. Loder, I cried, if I were to think very hard, perhaps I could remember names that came alphabetically lower down on that list. Perhaps if you give me time, that same frail and uncertain memory of mine... But neither Senator Loder nor half a dozen others whose names begin with letters in the last half of the alphabet would give me time. They were mighty anxious now to excuse Miss Massey, and Miss Massey herself was not anxious to remain. "'We come off with flying colors, Rhoda,' McCabe said as we walked down the Capitol steps at the foot of which Wilson's automobile was standing. "'Wilson's going to take me to the train. Will you come?' "'No, no, thank you. I've something I want to do.' Thompson, 
he asked facetiously, or the ball gown. I shook my head. It wasn't anything so easy as Ted or the gown. As I stood there preoccupied, watching the two men in the bubble as it jumped, snorted, buzzed, and reared preparatively, and then dived off down through the grounds, all I really saw was a bald-headed little man with a shorthand reporter's notebook on his knee and a page of hieroglyphic hooks and curves. My testimony, which I had seen Benson transcribe while Senator Loder was delivering his oration, and then mechanically tearing the page across once, let it fall into the wastebasket. From the reporter's desk during sessions we had often watched Benson transcribe a narrow page of pothooks. When his assistant came to relieve him, and then, tearing it with deliberation across, let it fall into the basket at his feet. And this very afternoon, within an hour, Benson would have just such another page of hooks and curves which, transcribed, instead of revealing the remarks of one Rhoda Massey, would show the cost price of legislators as set down by Boss Bassett, an expert in buying and selling. And when that slim little page of hieroglyphics should be transcribed, where would it go? and to the waste-paper basket after being torn across in that methodical, deliberate manner from which systematic little Benson never departed. But really, really, that narrow page torn in half would not yet have outlived all its usefulness. To any other shorthand man it would reveal the same absorbingly interesting exposure that had startled Newberry and Thorpe, and would startle the members of the committee this very afternoon. The sessions were over at four, by that time I had hired a stenographer. "'You're to have your typewriter in my room and be ready to transcribe another man's notes,' I told him, "'from six in the evening till two in the morning. "'If during that time I want you, I'll come down for you. "'I've taken another room for tonight. "'If I don't want you, you can go home at two. "'But you're not to mention my name, "'nor to let anyone know that I've hired you, "'and you can set your own terms for the evening's work.' I left him then and went upstairs to my new room. It wasn't nearly so large nor so airy as the one I'd had ever since the legislature assembled, and it was two stories higher, just under the roof, in fact. But it had some advantages. One was a big old-fashioned transom, exactly like the one belonging to Benson's room next door. On the score of my new room being so small and my needing a lot of room to dress for the ball that night, I had Sam the porter set my square-topped big trunk outside in the corridor. Sam misunderstood the number of my room and set the trunk in the little blind square off which Benson's door opened. But I tipped him just the same, in fact, twice as much. I heard little Benson stumble against the trunk when he got home that afternoon at 4.20 precisely. The little square landing was already dark, and he must have come upon it unexpectedly, but he didn't swear. Nothing perturbed Benson long. In just five minutes I saw the light he'd lit through my open transom. His was open, too, and I heard his typewriter rattling off a of volley, its clacking, crackling commentaries, punctuated by the singing little bell and the almost as regularly rhythmic tearing across of each sheet of paper as he finished with it. I ate my dinner alone there, what I could eat. I was so excited that nothing on the tray I had had sent up appealed to my appetite but I drank the coffee down like a toper, and then I waited. I waited years, years of moving the typewriter carriage back at the end of a line, years of insertions of new sheets, and in spite of my excitement and the tension of my nerves, I laughed at myself as I sat there in a snug, short golf skirt and trim knit jacket, looking like an athletic, even acrobatic Cinderella, while my new, my first, my only ball gown lay spread in dainty fluffiness on the bed, waiting its chance, too. I wondered whether either of us would be gratified. It must be neither or both, I thought, as I sat there in the dark listening to the perpetual clatter in Benson's room. I couldn't see myself going to the ball knowing I had failed, though everybody else there should be talking of my success, and I didn't dare to fancy myself on the way there with this thing accomplished for that was enough to intoxicate me, and I'd need all the small wits I had before I got through. It was half-past six when Benson's bell sounded the last time, and the typewriter gave a discordant screech as the last sheet was torn from it. It took Benson ten minutes more to get ready. He'd been working two hours without a second's breathing space. 
I waited till I heard the patent lock on his door click behind him, and he ran hungrily down the stairs to his dinner. Then guiltily I opened the door. Yes, guiltily. I felt as though the dim corridors were alive with suspicious eyes. They weren't. Everybody was downstairs at dinner. All I could hear was the opening of a door now and then and the porters scurrying busily about in the hall below. It didn't take me a minute to get to Benson's door and on the top of my trunk and, with a good grasp on the lower edge of the open transom, I was just about to slip through when... When I heard a heavy step in the hall behind me, Oh, I'll never forget that minute. It serves you right, Rhoda Massey, I cried bitterly to myself. It's a nice, dignified detail you've chosen. You will be famous now. The whole town will ring with it, and when you're laughed out of Sacramento, you can go down to the city and meet it at every turn. Your very own office will hoot at you. You greedy little pig, why couldn't you be satisfied? But I didn't have much time to scold Rhoda Massey. For the steps came nearer and nearer till I could see Black Sam, the porter, a heavy suitcase in either hand. He saw me, too, in the same minute, and the necessity for a quick fib almost made me dizzy. Can't, can't you take time to fix this transom for me, Sam? I gasped, sliding to the floor. I was sure it wouldn't occur to him that not this one, but the next room was mine. It won't stay open, and the room's awfully close. Suddenly, miss, he sprang upon the trunk and wedged the thing open with a wad of paper. My purse is inside, I explained as he waited expectantly. Tomorrow, eh? Oh, that's all right, miss. You newspaper ladies ain't so stingy with tips as plain common ones, he chuckled. Just as though a newspaper woman could afford to be stingy with tips. I waited as he shuffled off, and the banging of my heart seemed to die away with the lessening sound of his footsteps. Then quickly I climbed on the trunk again, and in a second I was through the transom and hanging inside Benson's room by my fingertips. For a moment I swung there. The room, being on the garret floor, wasn't high, but the couple of feet that separated me from the floor, a yellow journalist's education ought really to include athletics, terrified me. It must be nice to be a man. You can count on so many more inches, and inches count when you're hanging by your fingertips. When I did let go, it was because I had to, and the fall gave my ankle a nasty twist. But I limped gleefully over to Benson's desk. There was that blessed basket full to the brim of half-sheets, just as my fondest fancy had painted it. I took a towel and, spreading it on the floor, turned the basket upside down and dumped every bit of paper into it. Then I knotted the ends tight and slung it over my arm. Oh, it was easy, easy. All I had to do then was to open the door and instead of letting it latch itself behind me, leave it slightly ajar. I had got my back to the door fortunately, most fortunately, and I was giggling to myself with delight when, when as though shot from out of the blue, Benson's dumpy little figure appeared before me. What to do? He was within a few steps of where I stood. There wasn't time to get to my room. I, I'm not proud of it. Still, it oughtn't to be charged up to me, but to that vice of secret investigation which piques reporters into doing things you couldn't hire them to do under other circumstances. I bent over quickly, almost double to hide my bundle, and in a voice of anguished uncertainty, the voice of the female in distress because something's given away, I stammered. I... I beg your pardon. Have you got a pen? Oh, and to Benson, bashful Benson, as the boys call him, who can't talk to a woman without blushing to what was once the roots of his hair. In spite of my terror and agitation, I wished I could see his face. I couldn't, but I could hear his embarrassed voice, which was almost as good. No, no ma'am, he bleated. But, but will I go downstairs and get you one? Please. I faltered, and with a fleetness that betrayed his emotion, he ran downstairs. By the time he got back, I was safe in my own room. How relieved he must have been not to find me. I waited there in the dark, listening. I was wondering, should he notice the empty basket under the desk, whether he'd conclude that some housemaid had been cleaning up. But I needn't have worried. He was able, evidently, in his methodical old maidish way, 
to put his hand on the thing he wanted in a minute, and slamming the door behind him, he was out again and down the stairs. So was I. I got to the door of my old room, and had my shorthand man at work within five minutes. While he transcribed, I was matching ill-assorted halves. We must have worked together for hours, and we didn't hit upon that list of purchasable legislators till nearly the last page. I didn't realize how long we'd been at it. I was so absorbed in it all, till a bellboy came up with a great bunch of roses. From Ted. I looked at my watch. Nine, and we were to have started for the Capitol at half-past. Tell Mr. Thompson, I said to the boy, that Miss Massey has hurt her ankle and can't be ready till ten. Then we went at it again. When we got through, I gave that shorthand man an order for one hundred dollars on the office for his evening's work and as a reward for discretion. But I didn't tempt him too far. I didn't let his transcription out of my hand till I had filed it with the telegraph operator. And every single one of those half-sheets of Benson's I tied carefully back in the towel. Then I dismissed the stenographer. Then upstairs once more, up on the trunk, I hadn't counted on Benson springing the lock of the door again, over on the most undignified of details, say that the writer's life is a sedentary life, another wrench of that unfortunate ankle, the papers dumped back into the basket, and Rhoda Massey back in her room with two maids to help her get into her ball gown. Said Ted as we paraded through the crowded hall, I wish some miracle might make life all one long inaugural ball, in which one's partner is a witch in pink, with an ankle damaged just enough to prevent her dancing away with other men. Are you aware how triumphantly sweet you look, Miss Massey? I shook my head. I was trying to get calm. Calm as a statuesque Miss Chipchase, for instance, who was coming toward us on Senator Newberry's arm. But really I was intoxicated with success and Ted's praise. I don't believe you, he said, getting in front of me as I nodded over at them both. Mary Chipchase was the heroine of one of my biggest stories. Besides, you've got to look at me. Don't waste smiles on politicians. They're notoriously ungrateful. Rhoda, when are you going to give up newspaper work? Never. Fancy me with nothing doing day after day and year after year, with nothing to find out and nothing to crow over. I just couldn't. The old habit would come strong upon me at the first temptation, and like a well-trained fire horse, I'd run away from home at the signal of a story. No, I'm afraid to try. I say, Rhoda. He was bending down now, and there was something shining in Ted Thompson's eyes that I'd never seen there before. Try, do, do try. Let's try together. I'll accept McCabe's offer and reform and be a solid, substantial, stiff old desk man. I'll get in and write the things I've only talked about hitherto. I'll basely undermine McCabe if you say so and take his job away from him. I'll set the bay afire. I'll... Oh, Rhoda, I'll worship you all my life, sweetheart, if you'll only let yourself care for me. It's... it's the gown, I stammered. Ted and the music and the flowers. You... You wouldn't have said all this if you had seen me an hour ago. He looked at me quickly. What are you up to? Oh, what do I care? What do I care? You haven't said no. Glory hallelujah. Rhoda Massey, you haven't said it. And you would have said it quick enough if... Miss Massey? It was Newberry's voice. What's this latest sensation that's been wired up from the city? Are you going to keep us stirred up with a daily bombshell? He was smiling delightedly. I thought you two were deadly rivals. What are you plotting together? He added, looking at Ted while Mary Chipchase and I renewed acquaintance. Oh, that's all done. There was a break in Ted's voice that melted the very heart within me. Oh, it's wonderful that a man can care so much for a girl, as wonderfully glorious as it is to be the girl. We're all in the same family now, he went on merrily. I've gone over to the news. Behold, Ted Thompson, news editor. I congratulate you. Then perhaps you can compel this young woman to tell us how she got the complete report of this afternoon's secret session, including a verbatim copy of the Bassett list that the whole state's mad to see. No. Ted looked at me. Scoop me, have you, Rhoda Massey? 
taking base advantage of my, my preoccupation, he went on quizzically as I looked up apprehensively. Tell us, how in the world did you do it? But I wouldn't. Do you suppose I'd tell this new Ted Thompson a thing like that? I might have yesterday, but now. A page skimmed over the polished floor while I stood there hesitating. I saw the telegram in his hand, and somehow I knew it was for me. I tore it open and gave just one glance at it. Oh, Ted, Ted, I cried, gathering up my train. No more playing lady for me. The Lowenthal stories broke loose at last. End of Chapter 6 Chapter 7 The Legion of Honor, which Miss Massey earned. It was just like a play. The minute I stepped inside the door and saw old Lowenthal seated at the fire, his back to me and the paper held high before his eyes, and lawyer Brockington, his features masked, coming courteously forward to meet and intercept me, I knew the tip was straight. Rhoda, I said to me, something's up as sure as there's a theatrical trinity of which Tossick is the brains, Isidore Braun the hands, and Lowenthal the artistic temperament. Things have been doing in this same big beautiful room, and they have only reset the stage. It looks as though your knock had crystallized things, sent some of the actors flying and posed the two that are left, posed them in altogether too ostentatiously careless attitudes. It's too good to be true, this stage setting. Don't you believe it? I was shaking hands with Brockington all the while, of course, and listening to the stately sort of flattery which he considers suitable to the vanity of my kind of woman. Ah, Miss Massey, the Miss Massey, Lowenthal, the Benvenuto Cellini of journalists, who puts on finishing touches as a rule, and only accepts a bit of work as a whole when the subject particularly pleases her. Lowenthal laid aside his paper and rose. His face was ghastly. The hand with which he pushed back the thick white hair from his forehead, a characteristic gesture, shook so that his haggard eyes stared at it in impersonal astonishment for a moment before they met mine. But he did not speak. It is quite an honor, Brockington went on smoothly but of course it was only to give Lowenthal time. It is distinctly a privilege to have Miss Massey investigate one's affairs. Have you any affairs, Lowenthal? He asked with an excellent imitation of his own stately smile as ha-ha. And then, turning again to me while he placed a chair for me over by the bookcase, Just what is it, Miss Massey? Some ingenue's disingenuous doings or a star's matrimonial puzzles, eh? he asked easily, thrusting his hands into his pockets and balancing lightly on his patent leather toes as he carefully placed his sleek, well-cared-for big body between me and the theatrical man. "'Would you say,' I answered lightly, peering around his broad white vest to where Lowenthal sat, manifestly struggling for composure, "'would you call Mr. Lowenthal a good lead on theatrical scandals?' Not a bit of it. And all the time I've been a newspaper woman, I've never heard of a real vicious bit of gossip about the stage that came from Mr. Lowenthal. Isidore Braun, the middleman of the syndicate, is the man for that, Mr. Brockington. Let me tell you, if ever you contemplate becoming a journalist, or even Tossig, I found that out when he was in charge of the theaters here. Mr. Lowenthal is altogether too tender-hearted and conscientious to give away a fellow creature's frailties, aren't you, Mr. Lowenthal? I demanded squarely. And Brockington just had to get out of the way. I hope so, said Lowenthal. His hesitation was half sigh, half sob. But having mastered his agitation sufficiently to speak, the sound of his own voice apparently gave him courage. "'You'd never do for a yellow journalist, Mr. Lowenthal,' I said archly. "'I hope not,' he answered seriously. I laughed. Oh, yes, I laughed. Partly because it's always funny to me to hear people abuse the newspapers, particularly the people who are yellow themselves in their methods and don't dare admit it, 
and partly because a woman's laugh's a mighty good weapon when she's dealing with a man. It sounds so light, so giddy, so altogether silly, that he wouldn't for a moment suspect her of having either brains or purpose. I vowed to myself to prove to these two, the renowned artist manager and the biggest lawyer in town, that I had both, but not just now, not till it was too late for them to benefit by the knowledge. Of course, Brockington was on, partly. He didn't know how little I knew, but he had had cause to read my stuff in the news, and the one drawback about showing how smart you are in print is that you can't successfully go back on your reputation, even when it would be to your advantage to be taken for a fool. Yes, Brockington was on guard. He didn't know just what I wanted, but he knew me well enough to be sure that I had something to go on. He must have had some purpose in letting me get at his client. He knew probably that I'd reach Lowenthal one way or another, and he preferred the interview to take place when he himself was there to guard him. But evidently something unforeseen had just happened. What? I looked down a moment trying to frame the question for which Lowenthal was bracing himself. I looked down, but in a second my eyes had lifted. Had they seen, too? No, for Lowenthal's eyes were lowered as though he feared I might read too much in them, and Brockington's eyeglasses were just then giving him trouble. He stood, his lips pursed impatiently, his eyes squinting at the tiny screw which, with a long, well-shaped fingernail, he was trying to tighten. I breathed easier, and with the slightest movement, merely as though a fidgety girl were rearranging her draperies, I lifted the edge of the old Persian rug with the toe of my boot, pushed the pistol a few inches to the right, and let the rug fall again, covering it. A pistol! A pistol lying on the floor in Lowenthal's library! And Lowenthal, a man all poetry, all sensuous delight in beautiful things, a dreamer, not a man of action or business like his business partners, but an artist in whom the genius of his wonderful race manifested itself in stage productions that were embodied masterpieces. If you'd find a pistol in little Isidore Braun's house, you'd suspect that someone had at last come near murdering the cowardly, amiable little blackguard. If it were in Tossig's office instead, you'd fancy that the shrewd head of the syndicate had determined to do some shooting himself. But Lowenthal... I looked at that fine, long hand of his, lying nerveless just now over the side of his chair. It was a hand to wield a violin's bow, or with the touch of a connoisseur to handle royally rich stuffs, or to hold a woman in a strong, passionate embrace. But a pistol? No, not Lowenthal. I must beg your pardon, Mr. Lowenthal, I began cautiously, for the sort of quick I got no further. The door was flung open violently, and a young man came in. He started when he saw me and drew back. Brockington hurried forward to intercept him, and Lowenthal, who had been leaning forward in a listening attitude, fell back, every drop of blood drained from his face. "'Excuse me,' stammered the young fellow. "'I—I I am looking for something.' Leo Lothal it was, of course. I recognized him now. Lothal, who had dropped a syllable of his father's name when he went on the stage. Lowenthal's son by his first marriage with the little Jewish wife, who had accompanied his life till great success came, and then faded away as though before the anticipatory splendor of the present Mrs. Lowenthal. We are much occupied, Mr. Lothal, Brockington broke in hastily. Evidently he dared not let the young man speak. Miss Massey, Miss Rhoda Massey of the News. He spoke with such deliberate emphasis that even Lothal comprehended the warning in his voice. This young lady is. I bowed prettily as though it were an introduction. Mechanically Lothal bent his head, but it was only for a second that his attention was diverted to me. Instantly his eyes left mine to flit searching about the room. I had wondered that so delicately able a fighter as Brockington should use so obvious a weapon as the tone in which he had spoken, but as I looked at Lothal I saw that only the directest words and tone could reach him. In a daze he seemed, 
as though the self-centering wall of strong emotion had shut him in from the world. Something had happened, had just happened, something that must have a vital bearing on my story, a development of it, surely. Perhaps, Mr. Lowenthal, I suggested sweetly, the rather painful subject I have to speak of might better be discussed with Mr. Lothal? Something fell with a slam. It was a book that Lothal had lifted from the table in the quick fluttering search his nervous hands had been making. "'You've told her?' he cried. "'You can't have.' "'No,' interrupted Lowenthal steadily, facing me. "'I am ready to answer your questions, Miss Massey. I appreciate, though, the delicacy which would spare me direct knowledge of them. Brockington didn't, though. His face was set and sardonic when he came forward, after a quick pressure on Lothal's shoulder, and again stood between us. It is that very delicacy, he said with ironical courtesy, that makes me think that perhaps Miss Massey might excuse us all this evening. Oh, I'm aware he went on hastily, with a lifted hand to anticipate me, that the appointment was for tonight, and that the young lady's time is most valuable. But, he went on, turning to include Lowenthal and so give authority to the dismissal, as you may have noticed, Miss Massey, Mr. Lothal, whose professional engagements have been as trying as they were successful this past season, is nervously in a very bad condition and, on the whole, you agree with me, Lowenthal? I'm exceedingly sorry, Miss Massey. Some other time. I rose. There was nothing else to do. Lowenthal put out his hand with a gesture of acquiescence and leave-taking. Lothal, his back to me, was searching along the mantel for the thing he missed. I'm sorry, too, I said simply. But my, I was furious with disappointment. I don't like to print the story without corroboration, and yet it came so straight. In fact, I went on manufacturing testimony to brace my case. Our Sacramento correspondent wired that Mrs. Lowenthal and Jerome Kirby were on the limited eastbound this... It's a lie! In his frantic search, Lothal had reached the bookcase near which I stood. He turned now and faced me. I... I'm glad to hear it. I stammered. I wasn't. I didn't know much, but what I knew I was sure of. And all the town knew that the story might have been true any time since Kirby had followed the Lowenthal's west. Of course it's false, Brockington corroborated smoothly, with a laughing, patronizing recognition, as between us two wise ones, of the young man's heat. No need to turn upon the young lady, though, Leo, as though she had said the thing herself. Miss Massey's a clever girl, clever enough and kind enough to overlook a young fellow's impatient resentment of scandal that attacks the name of his beautiful and beloved young stepmother. Eh, Lothal? But Lothal's face was grim and dissenting. You can say from me, Miss Massey, Rockington went on, that the story's utterly false. As the legal adviser of my old friend Lowenthal, and in the family's name, I deny it in toto. Mrs. Lowenthal is at present. She's upstairs, blurted Lowenthal, nursing that. Exactly, Brockington went on, inaudibly snapping his fingers. It was a habit every city hall reporter in town knew. It came unconsciously to him whenever he feared that a client on the stand was on the verge of a damaging self-revelation. As Mr. Lothal says, she is upstairs in her own apartment. She's not ill? I asked quickly. Mrs. Lowenthal is quite well. Of course, then. It was the signal for retreat. There's nothing to it. I'll say good night and thank you, Mr. Brockington. My voice was sugar, and I did actually withdraw as I spoke to the door. Lowenthal, who had risen courteously, subsided like a broken man in his big chair, and his son resumed his search. Even Brockenden had drawn a breath of relief, I verily believe, when with my hand on the door I spoke again. But about Mr. Kirby, 
I said, turning suddenly. I have positive information that Kirby's trunks went east on the overland, that he hired a closed coop and drove up here, where he was joined by a golden-haired lady of Mrs. Lowenthal's height and that unmistakable, striking, graceful figure we all admire, and then— I looked down pensively, and as I did so, my foot struck against something under the edge of the carpet there by the bookcase. The pistol. It was that that Lothal had been looking for in vain. In a second I knew it. I was sure of it. I looked up then, hazarding a guess. "'There's a rumor,' I said deprecatingly, "'that Kirby has committed suicide. It isn't true, is it?' I asked, turning directly to Lothal, who stood almost behind me. N no his voice wavered. He's not dead. Yet. Ah! I couldn't help it. That yet was too significant. With his agitation and the pistol lying concealed almost at our feet, and outside, as I live, at that minute outside the window, toward which his back was turned, old Dr. Norris coming up the stone stairs. I flew out then. Brockington himself couldn't have wished me away more sincerely than I did myself. I whisked out of that room in a jiffy and met the doctor just at the foot of the first short flight that leads to the entrance, whose praise is sung by every architect who's seen it. It took me a full minute to get just the tone I needed in my voice. The tone of the busy, careless reporter who is too experienced to expect news of his patient from one of these secretive, technical, and pompous balkers of journalists, but who merely in passing, oh, in the most hurried manner, as though one's own story were the most important thing under the sun, and one could hardly spare time to be conscious that anybody else might know something concerning it, comments on news familiar to both. He's no better, doctor, I murmured, nodding casually as I passed. Do you think he'll live through it? He shook his head gravely. Doubtful, he said curtly, and rang the bell, turning his back upon me uncompromisingly. But he hadn't denied it. He hadn't denied it. I danced off the landing and down the wonderful staircase. It was too mad to be true that Kirby should be lying wounded in that house. But it was madder to keep separate all the tiny clues that pointed that way, our tracing of him and his disappearance beneath Lowenthal's lofty porte cochere, Lothal's preoccupied search, his declaration that Kirby was not dead, yet, Brockington's unconcealable desire to hide things, old Lowenthal's pitiable agitation, and— Old Dr. Norris's admission that someone, some man, was lying dangerously ill in that house. Who could it be if not Jerome Kirby? Jerome Kirby, bohemian, man about town, hero of many scandals that had crossed the continent before him, the lover of Evelyn Randall long before poor old Lowenthal fell bewitched by the power of her bad, beautiful face. Jerome, the idol of the tenderloin, a pattern for rakes and macaronis, literary dilettante, patron and friend of artists and chorus girls and all that Philistia condemns. And this the end, to die in the house of the man he had wronged. Oh, what a story, what a story. Positively I ran down the street. A motorman, thinking I was after his car, stopped it at the corner and waited for me. I got on. I was too excited to do otherwise. I was mad with the chances the thing offered, and I couldn't stand still long enough to find out what I wanted to do. I found out all right before I had traveled two blocks. I had nothing to go upon. Nothing, absolutely nothing. I was sure, sure of the facts. But what managing editor in his senses would print such a story, on such hints as I could give, about one of the great ones of the theatrical trust? I stopped the car and got off but I wrung my hands as I stood there in the night watching it twinkle its way downhill. If Kirby were to die in that house tonight, his death must be reported, and that would mean a scoop for the evening papers with only a warmed-over second-day story for us. Oh, I couldn't bear it. Not with such a bully chance as I had to get it and get it first, and, oh, lordy, exclusive. 
"'You'll give up the elopement story, Rhoda Massey,' I said sternly to myself. "'Let the office think you've fallen down, that you've been beaten, or that there's nothing to it. "'Anything that'll give you time and a chance at this biggest story San Francisco ever slept over "'and wake to find spread out before it.' "'I looked down over the twinkling town. "'I was due down yonder where the news building towered, but I couldn't go. "'Something pulled me up, back where the Lowenthal house stood.' a palace in stone modeled after the little Trianon, looking out over the gate at the bay, and even to Tamalpais and Diablo, and beside it a littler Trianon, also built by Lowenthal, not for wife or mistress, but for the old mother he adored, the gentle, timid, sweet, little old-fashioned Jewish mother who, who... I had it, I had it. For a second it whirled me down toward the corner where the car was coming, and then it sent me right about up in the opposite direction. I don't know how I got to the servant's entrance of old Mrs. Lowenthal's house. My head was so full of plans, of scenes played halfway through and then shifted in a second to make way for others as short-lived, that I wasn't aware of myself save as an embodied determination, a determination to get into the house and to get the story no matter what might be the obstacles, no matter what I might have to do to overcome them. "'You can't see the old lady,' said the maid who opened the door. "'It's too late. Grandma Lowenthal is never up as late as this.' "'Except tonight,' I added confidently. "'Nobody in either house is going to bed early tonight.' She looked at me a moment, but she was not so sure by now. There was hesitation in her face. "'Oh, little loyal maid of the Lowenthals, you, and they too.' were lost in that moment's hesitation. The Rhoda Masseys sing jubilates in their hearts when that shade of hesitation falls upon your faces. They know victory's in sight then. "'What's your business? What do you want with her?' she asked sharply. "'You don't suppose,' I retorted quite as sharply, "'that I tell Mrs. Lowenthal's business to any saucy maid that happens to answer the door.' This isn't a time to gabble about people's affairs, I can tell you. She flushed at this and twisted her lips resentfully. She was hurt. Her face was troubled, too. I could see by the light that swung above her head she had been crying. Grandma Lowenthal must knit her servant's souls to hers in a consistently old-fashioned way. Lucky for me that I hadn't tried to bribe this one. And, I went on significantly, as late at night as this, I wouldn't be likely to come here if I wasn't sent. You'd better believe that. And you'd better not keep me here any longer than you can help. For it's you that are keeping the old lady up by it, remember? She fell back and motioned me in. She's not here, she began. What? I stopped in the hall, dismayed. She's in the big house. But there's a passageway that connects them in the second story. Come on, I'll show you. Don't bother, I said lightly, hurrying up ahead of her. I know where it is. You needn't wait for me. I may stay all night, but if I don't, I'll go out the other way anyway. Oh, then you, you are the nurse, she called after me. I thought they finally decided none should come. I looked down over the banister pityingly upon her. Glory, hallelujah, I was in. It took you a long time to guess it, I chirped back at her. Of course I was the nurse. I was anything that could get in. Grandma Lowenthal in the big house at this time of night. Why, why, for any reason but one, I kept asking myself as I scurried noiselessly about looking for the passageway. Everybody in town knew that the old lady and her new daughter-in-law seldom met. A daughter-in-law of another religion, a different caste, an outlandish woman, lightly contemptuous of the man who was sacrosanct in that clean, simple temple, his mother's heart, who trailed her husband's honor in the dust, and as contemptuously counted upon consideration she received, without repentance, and accepted without gratitude. Rhoda? I whispered to me. It was very still. The family must all be on the third story where the bedrooms were, but my heart beat a terrified clamor within me. There is only one reason for this, 
There has got to be only one. And, and, oh, the luck of you, there it is. Yes, there it was. At sight of it, my knees knocked together. I had known it. I had been sure it was there. And yet when I saw it, I stood staring unbelievingly across the passageway and through the open door. A man's body with a bloody bandage about the head lying supine upon the low, broad couch. And opposite, the shaded lamplight falling upon her white hair and soft, round face, her fingers moving mechanically at her knitting, while the tears fell resignedly over her withered old cheeks, Grandma Lowenthal in attendance upon this wrecker of her son's home. Oh, what a situation! What a story, Rhoda! Rhoda, what a story! You can bet I had pulled myself together by the time I got to the door. I had skimmed over the heavy velvet carpets. She hadn't heard me. I knew she hadn't heard me, but it took nerve, I tell you, to walk in casually but softly, with just an offhand business-like nod to her. Not too respectful. Your trained nurse is acutely conscious of that dignity which doth hedge her own greatness. As she lifted, surprised, mild, old, spectacled eyes, my finger to my lips, while leisurely I scanned the doctor's chart pinned up on the door. I'd seen nurses do it at the receiving hospital and elsewhere, and I've seen them since. Those seismic charts of fever and suffering. But since that night, I never look at one without feeling a hollow panic inside of me, and without seeming to look through a weary, gentle old face upturned like a child's, and, hooray, as guileless. I tell you, I thought fast as I stood there. I thought of Lowenthal's face if he should happen to come in. I thought of the tone of Brockington's voice. I thought a dozen different fibs for as many occasions, but I couldn't be prepared for what really happened. I couldn't be ready for the quick benevolence that moved this old lady, that brought her toward me with a cup of hot tea in her little old hands, and a benevolent pitying care in her face. Drink it, she said under her breath. You're wet through. How it rains. Raining? So it was, just buckets full of black water tumbling against the windows. My clothes were drenched, but I hadn't noticed it. I did drink the tea. I scalded my throat as I poured it down. So young, she said, nodding gently as she watched me slip off my jacket. I hoped they wouldn't send a nurse, and you're just a girl, and out all alone on such a night, poor child. Again I put my finger to my lip and motioned toward the couch. It was all I could do, a blind battling for time. She shook her head sorrowfully. It will not wake him. Nothing will, you see, any more. He will be like that, the doctor says, till the end. It is no use my being here, but... She put out her hands and then clasped them together. Hadn't you better leave the case to me now? I asked. Pity knows I wasn't anxious to be left alone with that still-breathing, bloody shell that had once been Jerome Kirby but I could see she was exhausted, this poor little old lady, by the agony she must have lived through this day. But just then a shivering sigh came from the couch. In a moment she was beside it, a soft-footed, light little thing, a healing creature whose touch could have been no more soothing, whose sweet old face could have shown no greater compassion had it been her own son over whom she leaned. When he was still again she came back to me, See, child, she said, stroking my hand apologetically. You must let me take care of him. It is not an atonement, but, but I must. All that knowledge you trained nurses have I lack, but an old woman like me has here. She put her worn old hands to her breast with a passionate emphasis. Something that teaches, but neither of us. You with your fresh young body and wise little head, and me with my age, my sorrow, and my experience. Neither of us can do anything. Only, I have worked, too. Hard, very hard in my youth. It will be well earning your day's pay, my dear, to stay with me and comfort me with the sight of your bright young face. Yes? She drew me down on the lounge beside her. Me, Rhoda Massey. 
a journalistic dynamo charged to the brim with questions and waiting the very first opportunity to fire him off. But how to begin? She was simplicity itself, but you can't drag in such a topic as I had to deal with by the horns. Oh, I promised the maid to tell you, Mrs. Lowenthal, I said in an abstracted, gentle little tone of respect, that two reporters had called to see you. To see me? she exclaimed, startled. Oh, I, I couldn't. I'm very sorry not to be polite to the gentlemen, but, but... I know, I said sympathetically. They happened to come just as she opened the door for me. They tried to question me, but I wouldn't give them any satisfaction. And as I didn't come in nurse's rig on purpose, why, they... About... About... she gasped. Yes. I nodded over toward the couch. Her poor little hands flew up to her face. Do they know, she whispered, that Leo... Lothal. I knew it, I knew it. But I caught myself and only answered in as careless a voice as I could. Oh, yes, one of them said he'd, he'd talked over the phone with young Mrs. Lowenthal. Evelyn. Her hands fell onto her lap, uncovering a face that had gone gray. We haven't suffered enough through her yet, she mused, nodding her head in miserable abstraction. I had a qualm, but I buried it. The interview I was faking as I went along would be an accomplished fact, of course, within a day or a week. I was merely anticipating it. I suppose it is natural, though, that she should blame Mr. Lowenthal, I said thoughtfully. But not in a questioning voice, not Rhoda. My tone was merely a continuation of her own, and I got up as I spoke and walked away from her toward the couch, as though preoccupied by professional solicitude. In a second she had followed me. To blame my son. The reporters told you that. She blames my son. She repeated in a horrified whisper. Why, she knows poor Leo did it. She was there when... Oh, not for the actual fact. I interrupted quickly. I was in for it now and had to go on. But for driving her to... to destruction. She looked at me dazed two days to speak, but her whole quivering body was an eager question. By his stinginess, she said, his cruelty to her, the difference in religion which, which he would never forget, his devotion to you and his family by his first wife, and, and affairs with, well, actresses, you know. Phew! It was a large order, and for a man like Lowenthal, but I had to fill it. The only way to get some women to talk is to outrage the things they value most, to, to imagine the bill of wrongs the other party might have filed, then to consider it filed. After that, retail it to the lady in the case and blandly wait for her to retaliate. She'll do it all right. She wouldn't be human if she didn't, and women who come up for newspaper attention are usually very human. I thought poor old Grandma Lowenthal would faint for a minute, but she didn't plucky little soul. I wish, I wish, she said slowly when she could speak, that I had seen them, after all, those reporters. God in heaven that she should say such things about my son. Yes, yes, I should have seen them, the reporters. It would have been terribly painful, but it was my duty. She sighed, wringing her hands. But what could you have said to them? I asked, in open-eyed innocence. I knew it, I knew it. The effect of my apparent belief in young Mrs. Lowenthal's griefs was the one touch needed to open her lips. Said. She held herself very straight in that minute, and her white head was haughtily erect. I should have said nothing. His old mother cannot say any more for David Lowenthal than all his life has said. But I should have shown the gentleman Evelyn's checkbooks. She threw them at my feet this afternoon just before that man came in the carriage. I should have sent for Evelyn's maid, her confidant, the flighty little Frenchwoman who was devoted to her. I should have not tell them how my son would have carried her upon his hands, how he forgave what everlasting patience he had, and how at last, at last, 
he actually gave his consent to this, this separation, hoping that the passion she truly had for this strange man might redeem her from that terrible morphine, and only imploring her, by all his love for her and pity for herself, by his heart she had broken, by her faith in the stranger, to wait, to wait only till a separation could make her legally that man's wife. Oh, I gasped, I could not help it. But she would not, she could not wait. She was maddened by the scene, by his discovering. Something fearful was hurrying her on to complete her misfortune in hours. And when Leo, crazed by his audacity in coming for her here, rushed upon him then at the last, frenzied poor boy by his father's dishonor in our wrecked miserable home, he, this man, drew a pistol. They struggled, it went off, accidentally. There he lies. She is locked in her room, and since the doctor has said he must die unconscious to the last, she will open to no one. The lawyer says he must give himself up to the police. Leo, my only grandchild. The pistol. What does an old woman understand of such things? He says is not this man's pistol. He is known never to have carried one, they tell me. It is David's own pistol, they say. But how did this man get it? No one saw the struggle between them, no one but Evelyn, and she, she... What more will that woman do to torture us? What more can she do? She broke into sobs. Shh, shh, I cautioned, pointing to the couch. Kirby's body was rigid, but his hands were fluttering like light, bodiless things trying to detach themselves from the inert thing he must become. It was the tonic she needed. Her unselfish soul forgot its own misery and turned mercifully toward the dying man. O oh, eternal, our God, she prayed passionately, bending over him. Pardon all our sins and forgive all our iniquities and grant us remission for all our transgressions. Forgive this one. Forgive. Ted Thompson caught me in the hall as I came flying into the office. He had on evening clothes and an expression of wrathful hauteur, and the unusualness of both these things, together with the fact that they were mighty becoming, got to me in spite of my mad rush to get to my desk. Oh, oh, I exclaimed, really half bewildered with trying to grope back of my story, my great big bully story that I'd cut out of life itself, to the personal memory Ted and his new dress suit evoked. Oh, I remember, Ted, the opera, wasn't it? Yes, yes, it was to be Carmen tonight, and, and we were going. His eyes went black as he stood silently looking at me. Phew! He was in a towering rage. Ted, the gay, the good-natured, whose sense of humor is too strong to permit him or anybody else's taking himself seriously. I looked from the nice, long, clean, straight figure he made and the new rig he got just for this occasion to my forgetful little self, disheveled, dripping, with my rain-washed but triumphant face and my soaking boots. It all came back to me, the details of the spree we'd planned for Ted's night off, the first since, since a certain day in Sacramento last week. A carriage was to call for me in that same pink chiffon gown. There were flowers Ted had sent, La France's, to match. The box at the opera to hold our glory, the reserved supper table afterward in the palm garden where, where, oh, Ted, oh, <laughs> it was too funny. I giggled outright. That settled his dignity. Damn it, he cried. What do you think a man's made of? It is a shame, Ted, I gurgled, trying to stop laughing. I was awfully tired and, and overwrought. Such an elaborate party we'd planned, too, and... That for the party! He brought his fist down upon the stair railing with a force that made it vibrate like a tuning fork. You, you're more like a ghoul than a human being, Rhoda. There's something repulsive about your preoccupation in this sort of thing. You might have forgot all about our party, he sneered, and it could hurt only my vanity. But to let pass clear out of your head, the... The thing that sang itself into every moment of my day, that changed the whole world for me, our first evening together after. 
Our, our being engaged, you mean, I interrupted. But, oh, if you knew what a story. He ripped out a swear then. Bowman himself couldn't have done justice to the occasion more completely. Say, Ted, I said slowly, I, I guess I haven't time to, to be engaged. I, I may marry somebody some day, but really I, what's that? I cried suddenly. A buzzing shiver shook the building. The presses. The paper going to press without my story. Oh, stop them, stop them! I sobbed, and turning my back on him, I dashed into McCabe's office. He gave me two shorthand men, McCabe did, to dictate to alternately, so that one of them could be reading off notes to the linotype man, and we worked over the stuff, we five, for an hour and a half, the paper was late, but oh, what a stunner it was when we did get it out. There were two pages of it. The story of the elopement and the murder played up big on the right half of the first page. And Rhoda Massey finds the missing revolver, a flaring head for the other half. Of course, we'd built this part of it on the assumption that the police hadn't found the gun. Still, they were so much obliged to us up at the city hall when McCabe's phone reached them telling them to lift the corner of the rug close to the bookcase, that Chief Wiss would have let us claim the whole works if we'd wanted to. But we were modest, we were. We had everything in sight. End of Chapter 7 Chapter 8 Hanged at the Yardarm Which Penalty Miss Massey Suffered I read the news in bed next day. It was all I was good for, to lie there and crow, crow hoarsely, for the cold I'd caught pelting about in the rain had shut up my throat. There was fever, too, and in spite of that glorious first page, I was cross and peevish. Way at the bottom of my cup of delight there was a bitter drop, so bitter that at last I got to hate the sight of the wretched story that had made me forget what, what women don't forget. Just the same, I put on my new checked gown and my sauciest hat, and sauntered into the office just before five. You always go down to the office the day after a thundering scoop. You pretend it's to get your letters, or to blow up the artist, or to look after some pictures which are in the clutches of the art room, and which you've promised to return. But it was none of these reasons that brought Rhoda Massey downtown with a hot head and a strained throat, to the local room when the place was full and every editor small and great on deck. Nor was it just a greed, greed to savor the last drop of honey in the bucket, to get the satisfying second round of applause, to listen to the deliriously sweet echo of success, and get the full flavor of the aftermath. But she got it that day all right anyway. There wasn't an office boy that passed her without an appreciative grin and a heartier pride in the office borrowed from her achievement. The whole local room exploded in one magnificent hoak when she opened the door and stood there, smiling a bit deprecatingly before them. The stars of the office and the editors and that same Rhoda Massey, in her checked gown with the elbow sleeves, held an informal powwow in McCabe's room and our shifty little boss himself joined the party. The story was talked about. Talked about? It was discussed fore and aft. Every great scoop in the history of journalism was dragged from its grave and compared with it. And it held its own triumphantly. A thing bigger than precedent. A challenge to posterity. Perhaps you think Rhoda Massey wasn't happy? Well, she wasn't. She was miserable. The lack of one clear, dominant tone from the chime of bells made discord of the music. "'That's what happens to a girl, Rhoda Massey,' I said crossly to myself as I sat down at last before my desk and began to tear open letters. When she quits watching stories and makes an item of herself, when she stops editing a page and becomes a miserable little paragraph, when she opens the gates of her heart like a simpleton, and lets the floodwaters of another individuality bear her off her feet, when she gives a man the right to make her miserable, and, and he takes it. Oh, he might have been magnanimous, Ted Thompson. Not last night. I deserved what I got then. 
but in the morning when wrongs don't look so big as they do the night before. If he'd have got a scoop like that in the days when he was a journalistic freelance like Miss Massey herself, I'd have forgiven him anything he could have done to me. The moment I had read the thing, I'd have rushed to him to pat him on the back, to exult in him, to give him the pleasure of telling me how he did it, and me the delight of listening. Somehow a scoop hardly seems a scoop if you can't tell one man about it, if you can't know he's proud of you and admiring and glad to call you comrade. I didn't know it. I suppose it was depression from my heavy cold and the fatigue and reaction from the strain of the night before. One good thing was that Colburn, the commercial editor who shares my room, never comes down in the evening so no one saw me. Still, when the tears came plashing down on an envelope I had just torn open, obscuring the news letterhead in the corner, I was furious. "'That's right, cry, Rhoda Massey,' I sneered at me and wiped my eyes fiercely. "'Cry like all the women you've written up because of some man. Oh, you beastly little coward, you're like all the rest of them.' "'But I wouldn't be. I wouldn't.' I tore the letter out of its envelope, and, and then, oh, fancy a city editor crying, a city editor in her best checked gown, with a tiny new polo turban perched upon the proudest head in the office, in the office, in any office, a city editor, Rhoda Massey, city editor, oh, I say, do you know that for one woman who gets to the city editor's desk, Nine hundred and ninety-nine go down to death and obscurity in the woman's page. Do you know there's not another woman in the West holding such a position? Do you know that reporterettes, as Bowman calls them, ahem, Bowman, Bowman who trampled upon a poor little green girl reporter when she chirped her first hoarse, timid note, Bowman had evidently been superseded. By whom? by that same small Rhoda Massey he'd scorned. Oh, nuts! Mr. Bowman, will you just take the waterfront detail for this week? I'll see what can be done later to make a change. Or, who's responsible for that rot from the city hall? Bowman? Now look here, Mr. Bowman, the news won't stand for copy like that. A little more news and a little less Bowman hereafter, if you'll be so good. Or, Mr. Bowman, I'm awfully sorry, but you're scheduled for the late watch again. Now there's no use kicking. Any man in this local room who doesn't like the way it's run. But this last was too much like a quotation. Did he know, though, Bowman? Did anybody except McCabe and the boss know? Did, oh, did Ted Thompson know? I jumped from my chair. This was a way, a natural, a bully, an irresistible way, it seemed to me. With that bewitching note clutched in my hand, I made a dive for the news editor's room, just across the little hallway from mine, and... And there in the dark I stopped short. Through the open door came the sound of an old woman's voice talking to Ted and McCabe. It all left me then, the glow of triumph, the intoxication of power and pride in my work, the assurance that in sharing my happiness with Ted I'd double it for myself. It all shrank and shriveled away and left not Rhoda Massey, city editor, but a girl whose heart hung trembling upon a chance, the fickle chance not of discovery, but of interpretation. She seemed so young, so innocent to be working so hard, my heart bled for her. My own burden was heavy. You will readily understand, gentlemen, yet I was good to her, that a child like that could be so deceitful, so heartless. But you knew Miss Massey was a reporter, Mrs. Lowenthal. Ted's voice was gentle. The old ladies' department, we used to call him, so susceptible he is to some quality that belongs to mild old faces and patient spectacled eyes. A reporter from a paper? Oh, no. She was a nurse, she said, sent by Dr. Norris. I thought at the time it was strange he should change his mind and send a nurse, but I couldn't bear to deprive her of an opportunity to make a little money. 
She might need it badly. She did not wear the nurse's uniform, and I thought her too poor, perhaps, to afford one. How could I tell? There was a pause. Oh, if Ted would only speak! I knew what McCabe would say. I knew he'd back me in anything. But sometimes a perverse something makes you care nothing at all for the man who judges you leniently, and everything in the world for another man who lifts you to a standard it tries your soul to attain. But not a word came from in there, and the silence seemed to be weighing me, and to find me miserably lacking. And yet what had I done? Brace up, Rhoda Massey, I said to myself. You've only made use of the common stratagems of war, and I tell you war times all the time if you're a girl making your own living. But just the same, just the same as I stood there and listened to the story of Rhoda Massey's biggest scoop, told in that soft, slow, dignified voice, all the smartness, all the devotion to duty, all the victory was stripped from it. It looked, seen through tear-dimmed old eyes, it looked a wanton, cruel, treacherous holding up to the public gaze of innocent creatures sore wounded, who asked only the boon of silence and solitude to bear their misery in. Such poor little fake pretenses, these were, of saucy, dashing Miss Massey and black with deceit. Her smart little lies were cheap, detestable. Her courage was brazen. Just the soft, sorrowful murmur of an old woman's voice had, like a charm, transformed a bold, fearless, and skillful journalist, fighting against odds, into a hard young creature cozening helplessness, taking base advantage of old age and bitter sorrow, and planting strong, cruel feet upon the very tenderness that gave her her opportunity. And at the end, when she had what she had come for, though I was still ignorant of it, she hurried to the door, the old lady was saying. I followed her surprised. I was interested, attracted by the bright little thing, but she caught the door on the outside and held it closed. Her strength, sir, against mine and in my own house. When finally I got the door open, she had noiselessly stolen away. I writhed there in the dark, but I wouldn't go away. Something held me. It was a craving to know, not what Ted would say, but what he thought. It does sound rather bad, Mrs. Lowenthal, McCabe said lightly. But you must remember that a newspaper reporter has no choice but to report what he sees and to see as much as he can. He holds a commission to make public a certain matter. The details of its execution are left to him. A newspaper is a business property, not a school of ethics. All that the office knows of Miss Massey's manner of doing things is that she never fails. I can well believe that, she said slowly. She is heartless. There was a moment's pause. McCabe shifted his big body in Ted's chair. I heard it squeak. No, I wouldn't say that, McCabe laughed. Heartlessness implies malice personal malice. To Miss Massey there is not the least personal element in a case. It is merely a story, and to make a painful story public does not give her pleasure. Nor pain, she added. There is something inhuman in that. No, he contradicted cheerily. It is merely the essence of newspaper success. It makes an excellent reporter. Success? she repeated. And you are not going to discharge from your paper a young woman capable of such an action? I beg you will not, though I... Hardly, replied McCabe with perfect good nature. We couldn't consistently, seeing that we have just promoted her for it. Grandma Lowenthal rose. I am much relieved to hear it, even though I do not understand. She said with soft sincerity, and I squirmed out there listening to her weary, bewildered voice. It almost prevented my coming to you, the thought that I might be injuring a friendless girl. But I promised myself to befriend her, to see that she was not thrown helpless out into the world, poor child. And as I said in the beginning, 
since it is my weakness and simplicity that have brought this terrible publicity upon us. I thought it was just that I should try to do what I could, though I know Mr. Lowenthal would disapprove. But I am merely asking your paper to be fair to my grandson. That, that article in this morning's paper made me fear what more you might write about him. There are circumstances which, which justify the boy. I, I have never been in a newspaper office. In my foolish inexperience, I thought I had only to explain the way in which this girl procured her facts to make you disapprove, and even, I am very old, and as you see, I don't understand these things, wish to atone. I see my mistake. Good evening, sir. McCabe followed her to the door. I promise you, Mrs. Lowenthal, he said, touched, to handle the thing with consideration. We may be heartless, but in a case like this we are not deliberately unkind. I'd like to assure you of my own sympathy, Mrs. Lowenthal. She bowed. Ted opened the door for the old lady, and drawing her hand within his arm, he took her to the elevator. McCabe called out to him after the elevator had gone down. That's straight about Rhoda's promotion, Ted. City editor. Saucy Rhoda Massey. How's that? Ted waited to answer till he got back into the room and closed the door behind him, and my heart stopped beating and waited, too. She's earned it, hasn't she? McCabe went on. Earned it? Of course she has. She's earned more than that. There was a thrill to Ted's voice that terrified me. She should be decorated with the ribbon of the Legion of Honor for such an achievement, for being a journalistic hero, and then hanged for an unfeeling blackguard at the yard arm. End of Chapter 8 Chapter 9 A Way Out Which Miss Massey Discovered why, certainly, Rhoda, take your vacation, McCabe wrote. The office will wait your convenience. Bowman's just the sort of man to agree to keep the desk temporarily after he's been bounced. He'll run things till you're ready to come back. I enclose transportation for you. If there's anything else the office can do to make things pleasant for you, call me up like a good little girl and let me know. I sat with a note in my hand. It was addressed to Miss Rhoda Massey, City Editor News, and it was the first time I had been officially addressed. But it gave me no pleasure. Nothing did. Something had gone out of the world. Something that used to make everything in it intensely, deliciously worthwhile. You're a chump, Rhoda Massey, I declared fiercely. What do you propose to do about it? Go on a pilgrimage barefoot and beating your breast? Join the Salvation Army and tell thrilling tales of the time when you were a bold, bad reporter. March up to the mourner's bench and whine of your sudden conversion. Confess your journalistic sins of bad taste, indelicacy, and insensibility, and be pointed out as a star convert, as well as a warning to would-be newspaper women? How do you like it? I didn't like it. Its humility held something of weakness and surrender that didn't appeal a bit to a fighter and something useless after all, for it didn't alter facts. And that was all I wanted, to make things be as if they had not been. Oh, to fight a way out, to plan, to scheme, to plot a way that might cure the sting of it all and make me whole again. A journalistic freelance without conscience or country, a beggar, save for your pen, that may be drawn in any fight and becomes more valuable with every scalp it takes. What has the journalistic soldier of fortune to do with reasons? His not to question why, but merely to wade into battle and perhaps get a chuckling satisfaction in being paid for running amuck. Oh, the bloom's off the rye the minute you lose the office's point of view. Woe, woe to the Rhoda Massey who stops to think. She'll get all tangled up in other people's whims and prejudices. She'll be troubled by pity and hampered by taste and worried by doubt. The very ground of her insouciance and assurance will give way beneath her feet. She'll find her conscience and, alas, never be able to lose it again, and her story will go a-glimmering. Ditto her self-respect. Oh, yes, I had had it, 
self-respect. I had even been a bit in love with Rhoda Massey. I'm a privateer, I used to say, one of the privateers of publicity. It's my mission to prey on secrets. I'm not to blame. I'm not responsible for the secrets nor for the public's demand for them. I'm just me. And it wasn't Ted Thompson's words that had taken that from me, nor even the fact that he had said them. It had been leaving me as I stood there in the hallway the other night, little by little, drained away merely by the sound of a voice, old, feeble, sad with the sorrow of many years. No need to hang Rhoda Massey to the yard-arm, Ted. She was swinging there all right, long before you suggested it. In her own eyes she was gibbeted already, a guilty, cruel thing, to whom a public shame couldn't add a twinge more misery than that she was ready to heap upon her own conceited, nasty, vulgar little head. "'Stop there, Rhoda,' I cried suddenly, when I had got this far. "'That poor head of yours is all you say, but, oh, it's got a memory, a precious, precious, trained memory, that acts automatically and on occasion drags up from your subconsciousness a thing as valuable as self-revelation. And that thing? It may be a false alarm, a straw that'll melt away from drowning fingers, but it's all you've got, Rhoda. Take it and fight your way back to the desk, your desk, or, or... But I wouldn't see an alternative after that. I could see but one thing. That's always been the trouble with me. I can see but one thing at a time. And this time it was something old Mrs. Lowenthal had said. The words were distinct and suggestive, as though they lay printed before me. She knows the truth. Evelyn. She knows how David's pistol got out of his own room. But she will never tell. Never. Perhaps not. But there are ways, and ways, of getting at the truth. Old Brockington, whose specialty is only cross-examination, would go about the loathful difficulty in his own heavy way, yes, and miss it. He'd scorn little useful subterfuges and neglect play-acting and needlessly antagonize young Mrs. Lowenthal and, and... I got on my hat. Oh, to have a story in sight again. For days I had sat in my room as though the world had stopped making stories and reading them. But to feel your conceited, vulgar little head set itself manfully to the task again, to be conscious that it is reaching out in a dozen different directions, making suggestions, dismissing them and considering others, in its own limited way doing the wisest thing, shutting out the rest of the world and putting every effort upon one thing, the story. For the story you're working on is the story to you, the story that might never get printed this time, but whose success must print the piece of atonement upon the heart of a girl who deserved to hang at the yard-arm all right, but who had once merited the Legion of Honor just the same, and who would again if any amount of work, self-denial, pluck, and persistence could earn it. You shall have it, Rhoda. You shall have it. There may be nothing to do, but if there is, I'll bet on you to do it. And, and perhaps the Board of Pardons that's in a session inside of you will review your case. Newspaper people always have a pull, you know. And then... But I wasn't wasting time preaching optimism to Miss Massey. I was too busy. I was out. Out in the bustling, clear, windy afternoon, and I'd caught a car and got up to the office of the chief of police in the city hall, scarcely aware that the sun was already going down, and the electric lights were flowering out with a sputtering explosion. So busy, so tremblingly, happily, hopefully busy I was. There was nobody in the chief's ante-room, into which I was shown, and I was just as well satisfied to wait a moment there alone. I had followed my instinct in getting to the storm center as quickly as possible, but it suddenly occurred to me that, to him who hath shall be given, is mighty true of news, and a wise reporter will remember it. I crossed over to a desk on which a telephone stood, and called up Forbes at the reporter's room. "'Why, Miss Massey,' he cried, when we'd gone through the preliminaries. "'Everybody at the office thinks you're out of town.' "'Well,' I answered authoritatively. It must have been my brand-new city editorship working upon me, 
like a king's royalty through his disguise. I might be, and I'd still be able to use a long-distance phone. Oh, he exclaimed, your voice sounded so close I thought you were in town. I want to know, Mr. Forbes, just where the Lothal case stands, I said. Nothing much has happened, Miss Massey. Forbes's voice was beautifully respectful. The potential city editor in me just loved it. We can't get an interview with Lothal. He won't see a soul. The Times record had a faked in... That isn't what I want to know. I... Wait a minute. I broke off. I had heard a step behind me. I thought it was the chief, but it wasn't. A white-faced, fat, black-mustached man came in and sat down heavily. I was relieved. I don't care for the newspaper side of it, Forbes, I went on. I want the news. Oh, don't you understand? N no, frankly, I don't. What's the good of the news except to be used in a paper? There wouldn't be news, would there, if there were no papers? We won't discuss that at long-distance rates. Tell me what has actually happened. Well, Kirby's body was shipped east to relatives, and— Oh, get down to business, I exclaimed wrathfully. Lowenthal is ill at his mother's home. Mrs. Lowenthal is ill, or pretends to be, at the little Tryonon. Chief Wiss was up there yesterday questioning her. She went over the whole thing with him. Lothal came out with the gun in his hand, she says, and fired before Kirby could realize that he was attacked. It looks black for Lothal. He won't talk, of course, but Brockington says, very politely and circuitously, that she's lying that Lothal wrenched the gun from Kirby and it went off in a struggle. But how the deuce could Kirby get Lowenthal's gun? That's the rub. It is Lowenthal's gun, and... Yes, I know. What's Brockington's theory? He won't tell us. But Chief Wiss has got hold of Nanat Sabatier, the French maid. Her husband's Francois, you know, who has a little restaurant on Sacramento Street. She's supposed to know a lot and the chief has had her here all afternoon. Now, now, do you mean, I cried, is the maid actually here in the chief's office now, Mrs. Lowenthal's maid? There? Forbes clicked his phone vigorously as though to clear it. I didn't say the maid was at Coronado, but... I beg your pardon, mademoiselle. You speak of my wife, who was the maid of Madame Lowenthal. I slammed the receiver on the hook and turned breathlessly. There at my elbow was the fat-faced, black-mustached fellow who had come in while I was talking. What luckiest chance in the world had brought him here just now? I ask your pardon, mademoiselle, he repeated in careful, slightly accented English. But I am anxious, I am most, most anxious, tonight, this very evening. It is ten years since I established my place. Francois, you know it, of course. To celebrate, I have invited many friends to dine with us, my wife and myself, and the time goes by. Nanat is still inside there. The whole afternoon is gone, and— Did you say, I interrupted suddenly, that Mrs. Sabatier was Mrs. Lowenthal's maid? Isn't she still? No, no, mademoiselle. He shook his close-cropped head decidedly. Nanat will stay with me and be cashier, as Achet's wife is in his restaurant and de Poisier's wife in his. See what comes of the wife leaving her place. Such a scandal. Bad for business. And our friends to be there in an hour. I am dressed. He put out his arms with the vanity of the child, indicating his short, stout figure packed tight in evening clothes. But Nanat, I would give, I would give half a month's receipts to get her out. Oh, monsieur, a deputy had just entered. My wife is finally... The officer laughed. You had better put off your dinner, Francois, ten years more, or eat without your wife. The chief will see you now, Miss Massey. But, monsieur, I implore you, began the Frenchman. My wife has done nothing. You cannot possibly... She only holds her tongue too well, interrupted the officer good-naturedly. 
The chief's got a dinner on hand himself, Francois. As soon as he sees Miss Massey, he'll go off to that. And in a couple of hours, say, when he gets... A couple of hours? And my dinner, such a dinner as mine, squealed the Frenchman. But the deputy only gave a roar of laughter and led the way toward the inner office. Do you really care a great deal to have Madame with you this evening? I asked Francois in a quick whisper. Do I care? It is my reputation, my pride, my shop. My neighbors will laugh at me. Like mistress, like maid, they will say. Old Henri Ache will shrug his shoulders. Eh bien, we unfortunate husbands, my poor Francois, he will growl. We must at least pretend that we believe their excuses. These women. It is better for the world. Without doubt it seems absurd that Monsieur le Préfet de Police should detain Madame. But, but me I will not admit. I will burst with rage. I will... You will wait here, I interrupted. Perhaps I can do something for you, I said, and passed on into the office. Behold Chief Wiss at his desk, a fine, imposing figure, broad of back, big of chest, long in limb, a dash of early gray, just powdering black hair, that has all the vigorous tang of masculinity and youth in it. The sergeant's stripes were gone, of course, pale before the splendor of promotion. The easy familiarity of the head of the Chinatown squad was gone, too, but those same merry, shrewd, tricky eyes met mine that had looked down so flirtatiously at me one night in Chinatown months ago. They did try to assume a dignity and sternness appropriate to Wiss's new role and his recollection of my estimate of him in the old anti-chief days. But it is the charm of the grafter that he never takes himself very seriously, and so cannot be a good determined hater. In his own estimation, his is only a venial sin, and the gulf is wide between the tragic consciousness of guilt in a self-confessed criminal and the tolerant recognition of the thief in office of his own peccability. Still, the sight of him there in the old chief's chair, consciously stiffening a bit when I entered, and even flushing rememberingly, yet inclining his handsome head gravely and motioning me with dignity to a chair, it was all too funny. I assure you, chief, I burst out flippantly, I never bear malice against anybody I've roasted. Is, is it all right? The fake gravity of his big face broke into good humor. Even a small pebble will send a pond's surface to smiling and shimmering in early winter, when the ice on top is hardly more than a coating. What can I do for you, Miss Massey? he asked heartily leaning forward and stretching out a big, broad hand. Sure, that was a great scoop of yours, that Lothal case. Is it about that you've come? It is. It was, Chief. No, it is yet. But since I've got here, I've a more definite idea of what I want. Can I have it? Not an interview with Lothal. I couldn't help you there. Brockington's on guard, and he's up to all the tricks. I can't see him myself without... Oh, I don't want an interview with anybody, I exclaimed contemptuously. It's funny, though, how circumstances do alter cases. I might have been turning the world topsy-turvy to get this very thing I scorn now. If only that uneasy newborn conscience of Rhoda Massey's hadn't butted into the game. He looked at me queerly. Trust me? Not a bit of it. I'd bamboozled my way to the thing I wanted so often, and he knew it so well that he saw only a move in the old game. It sort of disgusted me. Oh, there's no fastidiousness like that of one who has just turned over a new leaf. The perfectly pure cannot resent suspicion as he does who knows how well-founded it may have been once. It's the maid, Ninat Sabatier, chief, that I'm after. It's not exactly a story that I want either, yet. You've got her here. If, if you've really wiped out old scores between us, you can prove it by letting me hear you put her through the third degree. Miss Massey, since I've been chief, he began. You've done away with all that barbarity? Yes, of course, I know. Every chief has. It's understood. Oh, you're not going to take the trouble to tell me that sort of thing, chief, I exclaimed appealingly. Listen, I will not print a line of it. I'll never let anyone know I know anything that I get this way. 
I'll never use the thing itself against you or the department. I'll only make use of what knowledge I get in a matter that isn't for publication. I won't get facts, I know that, but I may get something more valuable. An understanding of the sort of woman this maid is, and that's what I'm working for. That, and to put her and her husband under obligations to me by getting you to let her off after she's told you all you can get from her. I'll be grateful, I added slowly, as effectively as a newspaper person can be. How's that? He shook his head. It can't be done. It's impossible. I, I wouldn't do it for a paper that had been as friendly to me as the news has been nasty. You don't trust me, Chief Wiss? Too bad, isn't it? I went on lightly, leaning forward on his desk and smiling over into his fine, knowing eyes. And yet I must be very trustworthy, if the news thinks enough of my discretion and judgment and experience to make me city editor. Oh, didn't you know? It's a fact. I'll take the desk as soon as I have had a little vacation. It's a bully desk, the city editor on the news, you know. You couldn't hire me to be city editor of the Times Record, for Derby, the news editor, has so encroached upon the province of the local room that the city editor there is a mere copy reader. But on our paper, every desk mans the head of his own principality. And, I dropped my eyes to pull up my long glove. In spite of all I knew about him, I wouldn't give it to him too straight. And Rhoda Massey intends to be the boss of every line of news at City News. Don't you think I'm right, Chief? He didn't answer for a minute. He was thinking hard, playing with the paperweight and looking absently out of the window. Bowman's Chinatown fight hurt the news like everything, didn't it? He said at length. Don't go in for digging up musty old fights, Miss Massey. It don't pay. It ain't good policy. I looked at him squarely, and his eyes, meeting mine, agreed. All right, I said. I won't. Personally, I'll keep out of that sort of thing, as far as one can individually, you understand. Thank you for your advice, Chief. I congratulate you, he said, rising and reaching for his hat. And I congratulate the news, too. You'll set a pace, Miss Massey, for a few of these fellows that are soldiering their way through the other offices. I'm going out to dinner. Sorry, but I've got an engagement. If, if you have any writing to do for the next half hour, say, I hope you'll use this office. Take my chair. You'll find it more comfortable. The light is better here at the desk. You'll see better. I'll leave word that nobody is to disturb you. It is possible that Jackson may be questioning some people connected with this Lothal case in yonder. He nodded toward an open door leading to a small room beyond. If it bothers you, the noise, why, just ring. Jackson will understand. Good evening. I do congratulate you, Miss Massey. And pulling on his overcoat, out he went. And out I went, too, the moment the door closed behind him. Out into the anteroom where poor old Francois sat huddled up, his white expanse of shirt front creased, his rumpled head bent dejectedly, his face bowed in his hands. "'You shall have your wife to go home within twenty minutes, monsieur,' I said, and retreating quickly before his voluble gratitude, I shut the door between us and seated myself in Wiss's big leather-cushioned chair. "'Behold Rhoda Massey, then,' chief of police for a minute, looking about the comfortable, dignified office and laughing in its very face. Well, if it could stand Wiss, it might bear me. I looked out of the window at the big figure of the chief crossing the lawn. I looked at the open door, but from where I sat I could see nothing but an angle of bare wall. Perplexed, I leaned back in the chair and waited. It went rather far back, but stopped at last at a comfortable angle. Just so must Chief Wiss lounge backward when, relaxed from the cares of office, he lifts his gay, tricky eyes and lets them rest idly upon... Great Scott, upon a mirror! A mirror hung rather high up and pitched well forward and reflecting, just at this minute, two figures entering the little room beyond, grim old Captain Jackson in his blue and buttons, and a fascinatingly dimpled alert little woman, 
French from the heel of her pretty little pumps to the tiny toque that was set anywhere upon a mass of bright brown hair. I leaned back, charmed. Oh, there's nothing like the service a rogue will give you for value received. Some day Rhoda Massey may have to do only with honest men. Let's hope by then that she won't want much. But the show had commenced. How he badgered her, that big brute Captain Jackson! How shamelessly he threatened her! How unsparingly he told her everything he said he had found out about her! How, in spite of her pluck and her loyalty and her delicious little insulted airs, he compelled her to tell him details of her mistress's life! But after all, what did he gain? There was nothing in it all that a captain of police or a newspaper woman could not have imagined, nothing relevant or vital anyway. For old Lowenthal's blasted honor and the captain's asserted confirmation of poor Francois's suspicions could not alter the fact that Kirby was killed with a pistol belonging to David Lowenthal. "'What were you doing in Mr. Lowenthal's room the afternoon of the shooting?' Jackson asked her sharply. "'Monsieur?' she questioned. "'I say, what were you doing?' "'But I have not said I was in Monsieur Lowenthal's room, Monsieur le Commissaire.' She chirped saucily with a soft, throaty R that was irresistible. "'No, you haven't said it, but one of the maids saw you coming from there all right, and you had something concealed behind your apron. Aha!' he cried triumphant as she shrank before him. "'Out with the truth now!' "'It is true, monsieur. I did go into Monsieur Lowenthal's room. Madame sent me.' Oh, the sweet, resigned candor of her voice! Too suddenly sweet, too candid altogether by contrast. For what? Jackson's questions caught the end of her sentences with a snapping alertness, as though he were trying physically to trip her. Must I answer? She asked appealingly. You'd better, and get a hurry on, he growled. Silly old Jackson! She had him going, and he didn't know it. Well, for, for madame's photograph. It always stood on the table of monsieur the husband. She went on hurriedly as Jackson's face grew red with wrath and disappointment. Madame had a, what you will, a sentiment about leaving it there. You understand, monsieur le commissaire? Poor monsieur le commissaire. He did understand. He understood now the guile behind her sweetness, and he raged inwardly and impotently. And you haven't seen Mrs. Lowenthal since the morning the whole thing came out in the papers? He demanded at last. But no, Monsieur le Commissaire. She was ruffled but very charming in her dove-like hauteur. Monsieur, my husband will not permit of my leaving him for the future. I have not seen Madame since I told you. I repeat it. "'But you have heard from her?' he demanded. "'Heard from her? Heard from Madame?' The little Frenchwoman repeated the words as though she wanted to make him believe she did not quite understand him. Ah, but she was crafty, that small bit of Frenchiness. She was dainty and alert and witty, and though she was exasperated by Jackson's bullying, and really had something to hide, she was as saucily defiant as a bantam or she pretended to be, which is just as effective with thick-fingered fellows like Jackson. "'I say you got a letter from Mrs. Lowenthal yesterday,' he bellowed. She wilted, she crumpled, she fell to pieces. Evidently she did not know that he knew this fact. Positively, as I watched her in the glass, every spark of resistance seemed to go from her. What could have done it, I asked myself. For it affected me, too, that bellow of Jackson's. If there was a letter from Mrs. Lowenthal to her confidant that Jackson wanted, Rhoda Massey wanted it harder, and should have it. I jumped to my feet and, and lost the tableau up in the air so speedily that it made me almost giddy. Quickly I got back into position. The little madame had recovered. But certainly I got a letter yesterday, she sang back at him. Give it to me. He held out his hand. But, monsieur. Oh, the shocked, the grieved intimation of indelicacy in her voice. We want that letter, I tell you. But I have not said it was from Madame Lowenthal. 
but we know it was. We know she mailed one to you. Now there is no use lying. We know it. It would be to betray a trust, monsieur. Her hands flew to her breast. I implore you, monsieur, let me go now. My husband, he is very jealous, monsieur. He is old. I am, she shrugged her shoulders, young. He is what you call heavy. Me, I am quick, spiritual. I am gay, me. He loves the money we must make before we go back to Paris and tonight. If you don't give up that letter, roared Jackson, and stopped suddenly, merely because he had heard a bell touched in the chief's office. There was just a second silence. I could see Jackson's mottled red face twitch with anger. He had been called off in the thick of battle. Make up your mind to give up that letter, he growled, turning away and making for the outside door. If you don't want Francois called in on the case, and don't you dare to destroy it, or you'll regret it. Now go in yonder. It's the chief's bell. No, you're to go alone. She came in slowly, her eyes downcast. Oh, it was a play to watch her. As soon as the outer door closed behind Jackson, she gave herself an unmistakable shake and toss, preliminary to coming in to where I was. All the coquetry, all the natural theatrical instinct the little thing had, and it must have been considerable if Jackson's record of her was true, was brought to bear. Plainly she intended to fascinate the chief, and really if Wyss had been there. But he wasn't. There was only a city editor now at the big desk, a city editor who was something of a woman herself, and whose eyes amusement at the little feminine farce must have been so apparent that Madame Sabatier's astonishment changed to confusion. A quick blush overspread her face. But I giggled outright then, and in a moment her face dimpled appreciatively. I am surprised, mademoiselle, she stammered. So am I, madame, I retorted significantly. But I assure you, mademoiselle, she began. You needn't, I interrupted. I'm not your husband. He's outside, a wreck of a restaurateur pining for his wife. I promise to give you back to him. Oh, thank you, thank you, mademoiselle. She held out her hand eagerly. You are perhaps the shorthand lady for Monsieur Le Prefet? I am perhaps not. My... Oh, it would be very natural, mademoiselle, she hastened to assure me, that Monsieur Le Prefet should have much confidence in his secretaire, who, it is plain, is a young lady of esprit. Very natural, I find the case. You will not be embarrassed if I say so. I understand thoroughly. But I had opened the door to the anteroom and hurried her out with me. Oh, the joy of Francois! He fell upon her like a treasure regained. He talked French and English at the same time, pouring voluble thanks upon me and the little madame smiled delightedly and impartially upon us both. But, I said at last, and most regretfully, madame cannot go home with you, monsieur. Cannot? Oh, it is infamous! he exclaimed explosively. But, mademoiselle, began the little Frenchwoman. I'm so sorry, I said gently. The chief would permit her to go home only on one condition, and that, of course... Catching the contagion of gesture, I threw out my hand expressively. "'But what is it, this condition?' he cried. "'Why, that someone, that I accompany her, monsieur, that I be with her every minute. You see how impossible.' "'But no, but no!' cried madame. "'You shall come with us as our guest to the dinner, mademoiselle. She shall be an old friend, Francois, to survive from, from, what do I know, from Guatemala.' No one will guess. Mademoiselle is discretion itself. She has wit. She... Oh, I couldn't. I really couldn't. I deprecated soulfully. She was so determined, and he was immediately so inflamed with the idea, that it was pure joy to interpose objections. How could I intrude upon you at such a time? Intrude, pardon, exclaimed Monsieur. It will be, it will be an honor... We are much indebted to you, mademoiselle, and, and, and we were going to ask you anyway, lied little madame prettily. And upon that triumphant bit of mendacious flattery, 
the inspired Francois whirled us into a cab, the three of us, and down to the restaurant where the kitchen, with its white-capped Frenchman bending over the ranges, is in front of the shop, and guests coming in from the street must walk through it to get to the tables beyond. But not the tables beyond for us on this gala night. No, no upstairs where the rooms had been thrown into a large banqueting salon, with pianos standing in four corners thereof, where the well-smoked lace curtains hide the street without, and within the long tables stand a glitter with glass and a glow with flowers. The guests already gathered are waiting, when in bursts Monsieur, perspiring but happy, dragging Madame after him, her little powder puff, which she has tried vainly to use in the dusk of the hall without, still in her hand, and dragging, too, Madame's devotedly intimate dearest best friend, Miss... Miss... Why, Mademoiselle Henriette Pommier, certainement, you stupid, supplies the ready little madame, and her husband blinks reflectively at her adroitness, yet quickly profits by it. Then madame, going about among her friends, flows into a soft little torrent of explanation in French that fills up every chink and cranny of doubt or suspicion. I am tell them, she whispers to me as she draws me down to a seat beside her that your father was a Frenchman, but he died, poor man, very early. So you are left a half orphan, as we say, and your mother, that excellent lady, she knows no French, and it is you that have detained us to find you that make us so late with the dinner. Enfin, Henriette, I really love you. She squeezes my hand delightedly. But that is nothing. Everybody soon is squeezing everybody else's hand delightedly, and the champagne flows. Plain va ordinaire, the guests downstairs are drinking, and the waiters fly about a beam with good will and on excellent terms with those they serve, and the crackling nasal French seems exquisitely adapted to express good cheer, high spirits, and that spice of gallantry and coquetry which little Madame Sabatier provokes and radiates by merely living. Oh, it was a charming function, I assure you. Everything went beautifully. Every man there was so busy envying Francois that there was no room for the smallest insinuation that might ruffle the important little host's sense of well-being. Only one thing marred the occasion, but that was most unfortunate. Mademoiselle Henriette Palmier was suddenly taken ill, perhaps because she was only half a Frenchwoman, and so not a reliable table d'hôte diner, or perhaps it was due to a weak heart as she explained to Madame Sabatier who helped her from the table and down the back stairs into her own bedroom, where Mademoiselle was made to lie down and rest after being drenched with cologne and offered all sorts of tisanes. "'No, no, I'm all right if I lie still,' declared poor Henriette presently. "'Only I'm miserable to think I'm keeping you from your friends. If only—' "'If only one could say she never did lose sight of a lady, even though she did a very little,' Madame suggested anxiously. I know, I murmured sympathetically, and I could if... If? If it weren't for that letter, madame, I said, stumbling in my eagerness. That letter of Mrs. Lowenthal's. They fear you might destroy it. Poof! she exclaimed airily. Is that all? Oh, that letter is there in that top drawer of my bureau, lock up there tight and safe. Wait, I prove it to you. And she opened the drawer, let me glance at the envelope, replaced it, and locked the drawer. "'It is well?' she asked then in her saucy, bird-like way. "'Well, I should say it was well. It was better than the best that a runaway yellow journalist could have dreamed. In fact, it was so miraculously good that I lay there after she left, content merely to look lovingly upon that drawer and plan ways of getting into it. It was an old-fashioned marble-topped bureau, like a dressing-case, low in the middle and high on either side. Oh, almost any key in the world ought to fit a lock like that. Would mine? I jumped to my feet and hurried to the door. Ah, me, it wouldn't bolt. Of course it wouldn't, and I did. I did so want that letter. It seemed to me that I'd never in my life wanted anything so badly. It stood for more than mere success to me, more than a newspaper triumph. In that envelope was contained Rhoda Massey's forgiveness to herself, the most precious thing on earth. 
the thing that would permit her to live again on good terms with herself and her world. Oh, I must have it. I set a chair against the door and flew to the bureau. My desk key. Almost. My own bureau key. No. The desk key again. No, no. It turned, and once or twice it almost caught, but the drawer wouldn't open. And yet it rattled exasperatingly as though the least touch would make the old lock yield. Oh, Rhoda, Rhoda, I wailed. Think of your opportunities and how you've neglected them. Remember quick-fingered Peters and all he tried to tell you the day you interviewed him about his methods? And you obstinately kept him pinned down to the story of his escape from jail? Remember Doby the file, who grinningly assured you that with an inch of wire he could persuade any lock? I danced over to Madame's hairpin box. Not one, not a single old-fashioned hairpin. Bone ones the little coquette must have, limited, specialized, foolish things like those in my own hair. I tried her nail file, her button hook, in vain, and I was feverishly searching for a hat pin when, when I heard a rap at the door. I flew to it. I had to or have someone come stumbling in over the chair, but my cheeks were aflame and my heart was in my mouth. With the compliments of Madame, said the waiter, who was standing there, a horrible dish of fried cream with a brandy sauce in his hand. She hopes Mademoiselle is feeling better. He set the dish on the bureau, touched a match to the brandy, and left me. Mechanically, I stood there dipping the flaming sauce over the cream. No, decidedly, Mademoiselle was not better. She was worse, much worse, for the diners upstairs must have progressed to the dessert already. Francois's great dinner must soon be over, and then... Discouraged, I dropped the spoon and leaned miserably against the cold comfort of that graveyard slab beneath which was buried my hope and Grandma Lowenthal's. "'Oh, you stubborn old bureau!' I cried, giving it a shake. And it moved. At least the marble top did. Yes, it moved. And ignoring the burning cream, I jerked the slab back and forth delightedly. "'Hallelujah, Rhoda, you didn't need those lessons from Peters and Doby after all,' I chuckled. In a minute, then, I had cleared the few traps from the top. In a minute, I had that heavy piece of marble slid to the side, and there, innocently exposed below it, yet naively locked in, was the contents of Madame's safe and secret drawer. I giggled outright. "'Oh, what fools we mortal women be when it comes to keeping our valuables!' It must be enough to tempt a handcuffed saint to think how easy it would be to get at our possessions. But just the same, Madame's box that held the letter was way in the back part of that drawer. I had to pull up my sleeve and thrust my hand far in the depths before I felt that precious envelope under my fingers. I skinned my arm cruelly, but I got it. I got it, and... And just as I did so, I heard Madame's high, gay voice on the stairs. I lived an hour... A bad, long hour in that next second while I stood debating there. It was only a second, for almost immediately I heard the rustle of her skirts outside. When she came in, the bureau was straight, and I was lying down, of course. "'Is... is it you, madame?' I stammered without looking up. Thief was written all over my face. I was sure of it. But she only cried out a merry inquiry after my health, stepped past me, and and went straight to the bureau. I heard the click of the key in the lock of that top drawer. "'I want to show the bracelet Francois has given me last Christmas to my friends up above,' she said as she bent over the drawer. I waited. I clenched my fist and bit my lips, but I waited till it came. "'Francois, Francois, et moi, et moi!' screamed the excitable creature. "'Vite, vite, Francois!' I jumped up then, but she would not listen to me, only shot suspicious, outraged glances at me and screamed for Francois. He came and she flung herself sobbing upon his breast, jabbering inarticulate French. He soothed her and tried to get her to listen to him, but with him there her courage came back and she turned upon me. She hadn't English enough to say it in, but she expressed what she felt. Hers was a speaking little personality anyway. Her eyes, her hands, her very body lent itself to expression. 
and I quite understood. I got what was coming to me, not for this alone, but for innumerable other little transactions like it. And hate it? Oh, hate's no name for it. I loathed myself every minute of the time, but I'd have loathed myself more if I hadn't played the game this last time, and, and once determined on playing it, why, there's no choice of weapons. But, madame, I managed to say at last, I haven't your letter. I almost had, I added to myself, shamed but regretful, but it slipped from my trembling fingers back into the drawer, and I hadn't time to get it again and have the slab replaced when you came in. Mea culpa, I have failed. Where is it then? Where is it then? She cried frantically, turning over the contents of the drawer. Ah, voici. I must have put it back wrong. I was so hurried. Pardon, pardon, a thousand pardon, mademoiselle. Tut, tut. "'Francois clucked deprecatingly. "'His dinner was over. "'He was radiant with wine and satisfaction. "'After all, Mademoiselle has done for us, too, "'to accuse her of taking a letter which, which was not there, my little one.' "'Not there!' she cried, holding it up before him. "'Oh, the envelope!' he shrugged his shoulders. "'I did not say anything about that. "'That I left you, Cherie, to, to comfort you.' He patted her cheek apologetically. But the letter was too valuable. It might be too valuable should Madame ever wish to redeem it, to be trusted to such a lock. "'You have it in your safe,' I cried. I couldn't help it. "'No, no, miss.' He shook his sly old head. "'One time my safe was broken open, robbed. I have a sister who is sore de charity. It is she who keeps my papers for me. Better than a bank is so that you have foreseen. But you are sick, miss. Yes, miss was sick, really sick this time. The way had been made so easy that she had lost all judgment and counted upon the thing as one, when fate was only luring her on to disappointment. She mumbled a few words, that miserable miss, about there being no necessity for her remaining on guard, since the letter was no longer on the premises, and quickly she left the place. End of Chapter 9 Chapter 10 A Dream Trousseau, Which Miss Massey Ordered Pretend you see the slanting road around a high hill, which bursts into twin peaks at the top, the convent of St. Anne brooding in a comfortable crotch of the hills to the west, and camped out on the roadside leading to it, Rhoda Massey. Rhoda Massey tramp journalist, once a reporter, not yet a desk man, officially still out of town on a vacation, but really, and with that fixed idea of digging up the Lowenthal letter, hovering like a little lunatic about the place that held Sister Euphrosyne and the precious thing she held. Oh, a convent's the easiest place in the world, Rhoda, I sneered at myself that day. No rules, no regulations, no distrust and independence of the outside world. All you've got to do is to sail in and tell any old fairy story to sister you for seeing, and she'll be charmed to give you anything you want. I sneered, but I sat there just the same at the side of the road, looking out over the city and the bay beyond, and wondering, wondering how in the world I was going to get inside those gates. A nun, who had passed me twice a day for the past three days with the uniformed little girls out for a walk, told them in a whisper that I must be an artist studying the view, and in a sense she was right. I was an artist in my own yellow little way, even if the view in question was the one that you see yearning with half-shut eyes and wide-open fancy, the land of desire where you get what's coming to you. What was coming to me? Why, just a bit of paper with a few lines scrawled on it. That was all I wanted. Instead of that, I got a nod from a woman inside a blue coop that had already driven past me up the hill and stopped now at the bend of the road on its way back down again. A blonde little boy was jumping up and down on the cushions inside, and a woman in black leaned out to say a word to the driver. Why, Miss Massey, she said as she faced me, you don't know me. 
I looked at her. Some story of mine she was, of course, but stories have a way of erasing their predecessors in your mind when you do a lot of them. I hope, she added prettily, you haven't forgotten Mrs. Dilworth? Oh, indeed I haven't, I exclaimed. Nor baby Jim. How is he? Mrs. Muriel laughed and pointed to the fine little fellow beside her. Happy she was. Anybody could see it. Happier than she had ever been during James Dilworth's respectable life. I'm just turning to go back to the convent again, she went on. I'm going out of mourning as soon as Sister Euphrosyne. Sister? Yes. She looked at me queerly. I know the blood must have rushed to my face. As soon as she can get me ready. But I've come away without leaving some fur with her she will need. Jim caught up the bundle and was playing with it and carried it off with him. So Grant, she called up to the coachman, will have to go up the hill again. Oh, no, 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 I exclaimed, the words tumbling over themselves in my eagerness. Let me take it for you, Mrs. Dilworth. I, I'm on my way up anyway. "'Why, how very good of you,' she said, hesitating. "'But no, the best way, if you are going up, too, is to get in and let us carry you up, won't you?' "'I'd love to,' I answered quickly. "'But—but but the exercise is very good for me, you know.' "'I suppose it is,' she said pensively. "'Writers lead such sedentary lives. "'Don't they?' I thought of the strenuous times I'd been having. Won't you let me take back the bundle? Well, if you will be so kind, she said, taking it from the child and handing it to me. Just tell Sister Euphrosyne how it happened, won't you? Tell her. Oh, depend upon it. I'd tell Sister Euphrosyne everything she ought to know. While Mrs. Dilworth said pretty polite goodbyes, and baby Jim danced for pure joy of living, I hugged that precious bundle to me, and didn't hear a word she said. I only knew when I was free to go on, and then I took to my heels. So glad and grateful I was for this bit of a chance. The convent gate's a massive affair, seemingly. I suppose it patterns in wood some great bronze door of the Middle Ages, when timid nuns sought shelter behind it in the world ward outside. Today, though, and on this particular day, a haughty nun stood within, and a timid, despairing, and very yellow journalist cringed without. But Sister Euphrosyne is occupied, the inexorable, placid-faced warder was saying. I know, I said gently, but it is most important that I should give her the bundle into her own hands. Why, it isn't about a fitting, is it, that you've come? A fitting, I gasped. If it is, you ought to have gone around to the other building, the side entrance. She motioned to the right. But I will take the bundle to her if... It's, it's a fitting, I interrupted hurriedly. It must be a fitting, I guess. She looked at me disapprovingly for a moment, then she motioned again to the right, and with a nod left me there. It's you for the side entrance, Rhoda, I cried to me as I hurried around to the right. Oh, if your early education hadn't been neglected, you'd know what sort of religious exercise a fitting is. I wonder. But I stopped wondering. Before me a door stood hospitably open, and an immaculate little maid in the convent uniform bending over her embroidery rose at my approach, and in the most casual voice imaginable. "'What name, please, shall I tell Sister Euphrosyne?' she asked. "'What name, please?' And here for days the smartest reporter on the news had been yearning her heart out, scheming a way to get inside, when all one had to do was to walk around to the side and say a name. Oh, I was humiliated, but I gave her a name quickly just the same. Tell the sister, I remarked, Mrs. Dilworth, and the rest she didn't need to hear. 
and neither did Sister Euphrosine, evidently, after she heard that open sesame, Dilworth. She came in, a clear-faced woman of fifty, say. She wore the nun's gown and coif all right, but in her eyes and about her lips there shone that same alert, business-like intelligence that makes one understand Francois Sabatier's success. "'You're up against it now, Rhoda Massey,' I said to me with an inner sob. "'A nun, a Frenchwoman, and a business head, all in one. What can you do against a combination like that, you poor little schemer?' Ah, she said, I understood Marie Sophie to say it was Mrs. Dilworth. No, only a, a friend of Mrs. Dilworth's, I answered gaily, and talking quickly. When your heart has tumbled down into your boots, your lips have just got to pump it up again. A friend of Mrs. Dilworth's, she said cordially, motioning me to a chair and seating herself, is always welcome. What is it to be, mademoiselle? I looked at her. If the sphinx ever opens her granite lips and tells her secret to the world, in an unknown tongue, perhaps it'll know what I felt just then. Here was my chance. I knew it, I knew it. And yet I dared not speak, for fear of spoiling things, but could only sit dumb and crimson and stupidly embarrassed, while I struggled vainly for the right thing to say. I saw Sister Euphrosine's large, clear eyes open in astonishment, and then, all at once they closed, as Francois Sabatier's do when he thinks he has found a good joke. Ha, 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 she laughed enjoyingly. But, mademoiselle, I have guessed your secret. It is not a crime. <laughs> I half rose from my chair. Oh, how could she know? How could she know? tell me she leaned forward laying a large white hand on both of mine it is a trousseau eh am i right right of course she was right but whose trousseau and what of it i felt like the stupid odd one that can't guess a riddle when everybody else is on for a moment more i looked confused into her smiling significant face then my eyes fell on what I defy you to guess. The very last thing in the world you'd expect to find in a convent, but it was the solution of the riddle all right. A fashion plate, actually. On the table, there, at my very elbow, some fashion magazines from Vienna and Paris were spread open. I did blush then, for my own blundering stupidity. I had forgotten the nun who is the worth of San Francisco. Ah, me, it shows how far from being swell Rhoda Massey is, since she has never had an embroidered gown from the convent of St. Anne. All I could do was to nod consciously, and she laughed merrily then, pleased as a child with her own divination, but pleased as a woman is who deals with a bride, and pleased as an artist who finds a subject. My congratulations, mademoiselle, she prattled. If there's anything I love to do, it is to plan a trousseau. I hope you have not arranged details of it. Oh, charming, you will let me do it all. Slip off your jacket and let me take some measures. I obeyed as in a dream, and stood patiently, my mind a whirl with wonder and wishing, while she wound the tape measure about me, calling out a series of numbers to the little maid in the hall, rapidly like the signals of a football coach. I can't get over my surprise, sister, I said cautiously. At, at, at a nun's being a modista, she supplied quickly. It is all for the glory of God, my dear, from each according to his capacity. I was apprenticed at Paquin's shop and had ambitious dreams of becoming a Paquin myself when I turned from worldly things. If the good God had given me a voice instead of quick hands, a good eye, and a delight in beautiful lines and textures, I should be teaching singing here at the convent, instead of embroidery and dressmaking. And then you, you would not have been shocked, mademoiselle. Oh, shocked, sister, I exclaimed. Oh, but she was big and fine and workmanlike, 
flitting about me, and her long, deft hands played inaudible music when she turned over a heap of silks and chiffons to choose a material from the mass. "'Well, well,' she smiled agreeingly, and somehow I felt that she was conscious, as I was, of being in tune. There's a subtle something that tells you when you're in accord with the other fellow. We both felt it. This talent of mine came from God. Its benefit flows back to him, and I am twice happy in working and working this way in his vineyard. See how we prosper out here, how God blesses the work of our hands. Some day I will ask you to step into the workroom and see the embroidery my little girls do. Ah, it is charming, it— but they are not wearing the pouch this year, mademoiselle, and twenty-four around the waist. In dismay she interrupted herself and drew the tape measure about me again as though she doubted her eyes. The reproachful note in her voice made me feel grossly guilty in the waist. Oh, oh, it is this. What in the world? It's just my pygmy Kodak, sister, I answered relieved myself to find that the deformity she deplored wasn't natural. Haven't you ever seen one? I took out the tiny machine and showed it to her. She was as eager and interested as a child. Oh, the beautiful capacity for enjoyment in that sweet nun! She was sunshine embodied, and couldn't help smiling and shining. But she hadn't much time to give to anything but gowns. With a serious face like a big Belgian Madonna's, she turned to bend over the figures which, interpreted in a knowing way, formed the plans and specifications of that piece of humanity known as Rhoda Massey. There was an expression of delight on her lips, and she looked from the statistics of me to my own small self, standing erect and on parade before her, with such impersonal and unconscious flattery, that my whole face went red and embarrassed as a kid, I slipped down on the stool beside her. "'Pardon, pardon me,' she said, her voice half laughter, half contrition. "'But the proportions are exquisite. You must let me make you a décolleté gown, and—' "'Sister,' I gasped. But she was too far gone. The nun had been swallowed up in the dressmaker. "'Not for the wedding gown, of course not,' she said, wholly innocent of my meaning. Do you know I have never made just the bridal costume I long to? And a diminutive bride, a round, gay little figure like yours, with the mignon face. Come, come. She pulled herself up suddenly, crossing herself remorsefully. It is true what Mother Marie Catherine says. Instead of taking the trip to Paris next year to look at the fashions, I must give up my work and for a time go into retreat. But not but not before the trousseau is finished? Ah, no, mademoiselle. But expect no more compliments from me. I must not turn this sunny head of yours. He will do that. He? She laughed delightedly at my puzzled face. But surely he, she repeated as she turned over the pages of a fashion book on her knees. Where there's a trousseau there must be a he. Ah, so there must. I looked down pensively at the slim-waisted figures in their modish gowns as her fingers rapidly turned the pages. Her face, too, was pensive, absorbed. For the moment I had become merely a lay figure, a living fashion plate, just a frame for her art to hang pretty things upon. None of these, she said with gentle disdain. The fashionable bride's costume is still too much like the decoration on an old-fashioned wedding cake. Too sumptuous. The bride must rise above her clothes in this supremely poetic moment of her life. Too much satin, too much veil, too much conventional stiffness and observance of modes. Naturally, what can one expect? It is designed by a man dressmaker. She shrugged her shoulders beneath her coarse serge gown a perplexing, fascinating gesture in a nun. Now, my idea, my idea for a bride. I have it. Impulsively she laid a hand on my shoulder, while she used the other to sketch her conception, in the air or about me as the lines suggested themselves. This skirt, she said with the solemnity of inspiration, 
is round and full and very, very girlish, just a bit of train, nothing stately. It is not the awe of maidenhood, but its sweetness, its humanness, its approachable, perfect modesty that we wish to express. At the edge just three bands, narrow folds of the material, at the waist the softest, vaguest shuring. The bodice, too, is full, dainty, youthful, with a sweet, round, lacy line at the throat, like in the Virgin's pictures. Simple as that. In the sleeve, oh, in the sleeves, mademoiselle, we will permit ourselves just the smallest play of fancy. To the elbow, of course, but not too full. And the lightest, finest Valencienne, I think, or... My child, my child, what is it? What is it? No, nothing, nothing. I sobbed and buried my face in my hands. But she couldn't bear that. The loving, generous soul. She drew my head into her lap and laid her still hands gently upon it while I... When the big things come into a girl's life and fill it full to overflowing, there isn't room for much else. It was only the husk of a wedding her words painted, but to me they brought a forlorn, ghastly picture of a girl walking miserably, in the supreme moment of her life, alone. A girl who had wagered happiness on success and and God help her, won. In her loneliness, her tragic successful loneliness, she was a travesty on all the sweet intimate dependence this bridal figure of Sister Euphrosine symbolized. Ten days since I had left the office, and in all that time, Ted Thompson had not missed me enough to make allowances for a mad, selfish, unthinking thing like me, as heedless as an animal whose instinct to hunt down has been aroused. The necessity for making a fool of myself hasn't come very often in my life, but when it did come I found I could be as silly and hysterically without reason as any woman I've ever interviewed. So I wept now, sobbed hard and plenty, and with my head in the lap of a woman I'd never seen before today, gave capricious vent to the impulse I'd always found so contemptible, so unaccountable in other women. Sobbed and strangled and shook, and got quiet after a while and dried my eyes, yet still lay there, with burning cheeks and shamed swollen lids, exhausted from the new strange passion of tears. My dear, my dear, Sister Euphrosine murmured. She had sat quite still through it all, like a beautiful big statue of sympathy, but not unmoved. I knew that by the thrill in her deep voice when she spoke. I drew a long, quivering breath. I, I'm very sorry and silly, I stammered. It's because, do not tell me, do not say anything, she pleaded, as I rose and pulled my veil down over my feverish face. But let me say one thing to you. It may be a mistaken thing, my child, but you will know that it is heartfelt and forgive if, if I'm wrong. I know of a woman... I do not know her name, who married a man, not loving him. I know that she lived with him years, loathing him. I know that at last her sin brought death to her lover, and terrible affliction to her husband. And yet in a letter she wrote since all this has come to pass. In, in a letter? I gasped. I had forgotten, forgotten the whole thing. Yes, I have a letter in my room. See, child, what selfish misery brings a woman to. She shows she has no pity even now for the husband she has wronged, and writes this very letter to caution her confidant against revealing some secret that would bring comfort to him. But... But how can you keep such a letter, I cried, from the man who ought to have it? It was given to me, she replied with dignity, for safekeeping by a... A person who will produce it when the time comes. When the time comes. The time when Francois Sabatier should decide which side would pay him most for it. Oh, the sly old Francois! How well he knew the way to secure his sister's cooperation. Being apart from the world, she went on gently, I cannot, of course, understand the whole sense of that letter, but I... I would not have a girl's nature become so warped as that. Rather than see her marry a man she does not love, 
rather than have her weep at the thought of her wedding day. I would counsel her to come, come into the great compassionate church, as I did. I stood trembling before her. I was all at sea. How good, how good you are, I mumbled helplessly. We will not speak of your trouble any more, she said softly. Be comforted, my child. Sometimes a girl does not know her own heart. But, but if before the day comes for you to wear the pretty frock I will make for you, if you look into your soul and feel that you need something to strengthen you in a resolution, come to me and I will show you that letter. The name you need not know, but the lesson it... You will... It's a promise, sister, you foreseen? You'll keep it? But suppose you should have to give the letter up? I will let you know, then, before I do. It is a promise, my child. Pray that you need not ask me to fulfill it. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 The Act of a Thug Which Miss Massey Committed a fantastic fiancé I seemed to myself in those days, ordering a dream trousseau. Sweet sister Euphrosine pitied me, thinking me promised to a man I couldn't love. I wondered what she'd have thought if she had known I hadn't any bridegroom at all. It's strange, though, isn't it, how sentiment finds one out? I tried to think of all that elaborate planning of clothes, of my frequent journeyings out to the convent, of the fittings, the consultations, as merely the outside of a story I was working on. But all the time I was conscious of the real story, the story of which these things are the evidence. No, no, you can't touch the symbols that move the world without feeling all the emotion the race has felt before you. You're a ninny, Rhoda Massey, I railed at myself. The thing's a farce, and it hasn't any significance anyway. If you don't get this dream bee out of your bonnet, you'll lose your chance for that letter as well as all the pennies you're squandering on nonsense. But just the same, there were times when I loved it, and dreamed, as I stood before the nun dressmaker in the filmy prettiness of my wedding gown, that it was not a dream trousseau, but a real one, meant to begin a new but a very real life with, with Ted, my dear, dear Ted dreamed that I was sweet and honest and merciful, fit to wear the white of womanliness, fit to shine out before him in my beauty. Oh, yes, really I was beautiful. I didn't know it before. But you couldn't help being lovely when Sister Euphrosine's fingers and her fancy took possession of you. If he'd really cared the littlest bit for you, Rhoda, it came to me one morning while I was looking at some lace in a big department shop, He'd have found some way to excuse you to himself before this. He'd have given you a chance to tell him you were sorry and ashamed, and— "'You say it's for a wedding gown, Miss Massey?' interrupted the clerk cheekily. "'Yes, but not—' I was going to say not mine, and was trying not to blush so brightly, but I didn't say a word, for I looked up just then and—and and met Ted Thompson's eyes. He had heard— Oh, yes, he had heard, for he stood there as though transfixed, quite deaf to the floor-walker who was directing him to another counter for the traveling bag he'd asked for. I put out my hand. I couldn't help it. The sight of him set the sun to shining and scattered all the fog of misery from my sky. But he made no motion to take it, only raised his hat stiffly and passed on. I, I think I'll take this, I said to the clerk. I pointed to the wrong pattern, of course. But what difference did it make? I couldn't tell one from the other just at that moment. All I could see was Ted's wrathful, incredulous, suffering, adoring, yes, adoring face. "'Miss Massey!' I exclaimed inside of me, smiling upon the clerk as he handed me the package in a way that bewildered and excited him. "'Oh, Miss Massey, you lucky, lucky Miss Massey!' I was still smiling with the joy of it when I caught a westbound car, and when Sister Euphrosine came into the fitting room with her arms full of white fleeciness still nearer completion, I gave a rapturous squeal. Oh, if one could heal all the hurt in the world! 
it wouldn't be enough to earn the right to wear that wedding gown of mine and choose the bridegroom. I slipped into it, and that nun artist put her two hands upon my shoulders as I stood smiling at all the world. It is... You will forgive me, but you know I care, little miss. The trouble is past. She whispered, her clear eyes smiling into mine. I nodded. I couldn't speak. I was so happy, and my heart was so full. She hugged me then. Oh, but carefully, for she loved the crisp curves of my sleeves too well to risk mussing them. My dear little mademoiselle, I am so glad, so glad. "'Excuse me, then, a moment.' And with the lace in her hand with which she had been draping my sleeves, she walked over to a telephone standing on the corner table. "'Call Mr. Sabatier to the telephone,' she said after she had got the number. "'Not there. Well, tell him he can send for that letter immediately. "'What is it? Oh, I cannot understand. Do you say he is just coming in or has just gone out?' "'Oh, all right.' I will hold the telephone. I had been standing in front of a long glass, looking at my happy self and loving the very sight of me. Why? Oh, just because I knew Ted Thompson's eyes would rest on that little girlish brighty thing shining out of the mirror some day, and I was grateful to her for being worth looking at. There. Conceited if you say so, but true just the same. But the picture in the glass melted away with Sister Euphrosine's words. Like a flash, the youth went out of the face and figure and all the happiness, and in its place there seemed to be a white-haired, sad-faced little old lady whose accusing, miserable eyes looked out at me reproaching me for her misery. "'How dare you be happy?' she seemed to say. "'How can you smile and be glad, you selfish, cruel girl?' and trembling i looked back at her and knew i couldn't i couldn't you are tired oh pardon me sister euphrosine said when she got through chattering french and came back to me you are not very strong are you i should not have kept you waiting but that same letter of which we have spoken has been demanded of me i told the person that it was not quite convenient to let him have it this morning i wanted to see you first mademoiselle but now there. It is perfection, is it not? She had been deftly shaping the lace at my neck. The while she talked in a preoccupied way, hardly conscious of what she said, so absorbed was she in her work. Ah, but you will look sweet and dainty for him, child, but pale. She pinched my cheek affectionately. I smiled back at her. I knew she liked me. How could she help it when I was so fond of her? Yes, truly, genuinely fond. But I wished I wasn't, I wished I wasn't, for every scheme that came into my head ran plump against something intangible yet insurmountable. A tone of her voice, a look of her eye, the placid fall of the black lines of the robe she wore and never for an instant thought of changing for the silk and lace draperies her big, capable hands used so artistically. But I fought against it. That sorrowing old face in the mirror. It was gone now, but somehow I fancied it being there still, when I looked, but overlaid, as it were, with my own. Seemed to give me no choice. I'm tired, tired, sister, I said slowly. The fitting has been long, and, and... My poor little mademoiselle, she exclaimed. Let me get you something. No, no, thank you. I want only to rest. If I could lie down a minute, I added shamefacedly. Ah, me! The fun I used to get out of playing the subject for my story, of hedging him in and leading him on, of laying demure traps and slyly pushing him into them. So you shall, child. Come this way. She caught up my own gown and led me out into the hall. To your own room? I cried. How nice! N no, I was taking you to a little fitting room we don't use just now, but... Oh, please, Sister Euphrosine, I begged softly, slipping my hand into hers and pressing it appealingly. Please, I'd just love to lie down there for a minute in the sweet, peaceful place your room must be. 
she stopped to look at me. "'I wonder,' she said slowly, "'if you know how charming it is to an old woman who has never been a mother "'to have a young thing like you seem fond of her. "'The good God knew best when he made me a nun. "'If I had been a mother, he knew well it would have been such a worldly, idolizing mother.' "'You—you you will let me?' She nodded. "'Dear little mademoiselle,' she said, turning with me off the main corridor, "'you have a way to wheedle this sternest sort of creature, how much more a self-indulgent woman who has never outgrown her passion for making dolls' dresses. Tell me, does everybody grant you everything you wish? Do you always have your way, or is it only to weak-minded old nuns that you are irresistible, you winning little thing?' Is this to be my punishment, I wonder? To deserve to be hanged at the yard arm whenever I earn the thing the whole of me longs for? I, I think, I began slowly, confused and miserable. I'm better. It isn't necessary for me to rest. Let me go home, dear sister. She shook her head and playfully pulled me along. On the threshold of a simple little room she paused a moment, after unlocking the door. "'Aye, my dear,' she said softly, as though in prayer, "'keep your heart pure and true and pitiful. If ever such gifts as you have be put to ignoble uses. But I must hurry away. Lie down, child, till you feel quite rested. This is not really my own cell, you understand.' I only occupy it during the season when we are very busy, and it is not fitting that I should carry the hurry of worldly things into the peace of the convent. So here is my office. Here I keep my accounts. Here I sleep, so that the discipline of the convent may not be disarranged. So rest. She helped me out of my finery and went off, carrying it over her arm. And I stood there after the door had clicked behind her, not moving, not thinking, I knew so well the race was run. There on the open desk before me lay the nun dressmaker's account book, her sheaf of bills, her memorandum of engagements, a few samples of silks and chiffons, all the incongruous vanities of her profession, and all incongruously, methodically, systematically arranged. It fascinated me, that desk. There it was, the end of my struggles. If the fairy who grants wishes had fallen out of the sky and lighted in that spotless saint's spotless little room, she might have offered me anything in the world, but if she had left out the letter that must be inside that desk, I'd have refused it all. Truly, I don't know how I got my hands on it at last. There must be a magnetism in the thing you want when you want it hard enough. And, oh, I wanted this. Even while I was glancing over the first part of it, I saw not the passionate, revengeful words before me, but just Rhoda Massey dancing off with it. I saw myself back again at the office, sitting in a lordly fashion at Bowman's desk and running that bully, busy old local room. I saw endless opportunities for bedazzling and enraging and fascinating a certain red-moustached news editor and bringing him repentant to the feet of a city editor who was only waiting for his formal capitulation, to surrender herself humbly, abjectly, joyously. But it all left me when I turned the half-sheet and read the words on the back. There it was. There it was. And not one word, Nanot, to anyone about the pistol. If anyone should have happened to see you going into Mr. L.'s room, remember it was for my photograph, the big one that was on his desk. Remember. I'll be ready to testify that way, too. Be sure, Nanot. I count on you. E.L. That settled it. I could think of only one thing now. If I'd had all my clothes on, I'd have been off with it in that instant. But I didn't dare wait to get dressed. Something, anything, might happen. In a moment I had it. I propped the sheet of blue paper up against Sister Euphrosine's account book, and there, with the clear light from the big window shining square upon it, I clicked my camera at it. The best and biggest lens in the art room shall enlarge it for you, Rhoda, I gabbled to myself as I hurried into my things, and with the big copy of it, 
but see here you'd better take another shot at it to make sure. In a jiffy I grabbed the Kodak. Horror! There wasn't a film in it. There hadn't been any. I might as well have tried to take a picture with the empty button box in which Sister Euphrosine's pens lay. Oh, oh, fancy the misery of me, fancy the idiocy of me. I had left the roll of films in the fitting room that day I'd explained the mechanism of the box a sister you foreseen, and had never thought of them once since. I lost my head then and decided to do a half dozen things in as many seconds, but my fingers were thick and unsteady. I was so rattled, I was so nervous, I was so miserable. When I flew for the door and out into the hall, I had ceased to care whether anybody saw me half-dressed or not. I made for the fitting room to get my films and stood stock still in the hall as I reached the door. Mrs. Evelyn Lowenthal, blonde, tall, stately, and heavily veiled, was standing there opposite me. She herself had come for the letter. For a second the sight of her seemed to petrify me. Then I turned and ran for all I was worth back to Sister Euphrosine's room. No time now to be squeamish about methods. I would grab that paper and, half-dressed as I was, jump out of the window with it and make for the cars. Yes, I would have, I swear I would, but... But the lock had caught when I slammed the door behind me and I flung myself desperately at it, only to come bang up against its unyielding, stubborn surface. It was just then that Sister Euphrosine came up. I knew what she had come for all right, and the thought set me frantic. Don't give it to her. Don't give it to her, I begged. Oh, please, I'll explain to you. I'll explain it all. But trust me, won't you? Trust you, dear little mademoiselle, she exclaimed, amazed at the sight of me there clinging like a little idiot to the door as though I could keep her from entering. She put the key in the lock and opened it for us both. Come in and tell me what is the matter, child. Of course I trust. Her eye fell upon the desk. There, propped up against the account book, the white north light falling full upon it was the letter just as I had left it. Caught? Of course I was, but do you suppose I cared? I intended to tell her the whole thing anyway, but she wouldn't listen to me after that. With a look of horror and a hand lifted as though to shield herself from the sight of me, she caught up the letter and hurried from the room. Clapping on my hat, I hurried after her blindly, fastening on my collar and tie as I went. What did I expect? Nothing, nothing. But I saw her give the paper to Mrs. Lowenthal, who glanced over it with a queer expression on her lips before shutting it with a click inside the satchel that swung from her wrist. If she had made a motion to destroy it, I think I could have flung myself upon her and torn it from her. I couldn't? That shows how little you know Rhoda Massey. But you see, she didn't. With a nod, she swept across the hall and out the open door, and I followed. Sister Euphrosine must have called after me, but I was deaf, blind, to everything but one. I couldn't let go. What's the difference between Rhoda of the news and the bulldog I named after her? Is a riddle that pert, facetious Frank McGowan loves to spring, in my presence, too, on journalists who have too strong a sense of dignity and perhaps a bit of a crush on me. And when, with a shocked stare, said journalist had to give it up, Frankie would murmur gently, Well, the four-footed Rhoda will give up after a time. As I ran a step or two to catch up with Mrs. Lowenthal, I thought of Frankie's wretched little riddle. But it didn't amuse me any more. It terrified me. Perhaps I was holding on hopelessly. Perhaps it was only instinct, not reason at all, that kept me doggedly on the track. But anyway, I had given the last handicap to fate. Hereafter, we'd played this game of the letter for every point in it. Pardon me, I gasped as I caught up to her. Are you going into town? So am I. Sister Euphrosine has sent me in to match some trimming, and she says I'm to show you the shortcut over the hill. I said it lightly, hurrying on beside her, but my heart was beating so I could hardly get my breath. Thank you, she said, falling into step with me. I took the wrong car coming out and had to walk quite a stretch. Are there any open cars on this line? 
I have been indoors all forenoon at, with, with many people. I've had a headache. I'd like to ride outside. I nodded, but inside of me I was thinking. Many people, many people. How could a woman whose name was on everybody's tongue be with many people unless? Lothal's preliminary examination. It came to me in a second. She had had to testify there, and she hated her stepson. She... Perhaps, said Mrs. Lowenthal, her eyes on the overloaded car that came plunging up toward us just then. We'd better wait for another. I shook my head. I couldn't speak, for, for just then it came to me. And it needed just such a car, the reckless thing, the only thing left to me. A man got off and let us climb up. She wanted to stay outside, but the platform of the dummy was too crowded, so we went in. There was a bit more room here, but we had to hang on straps, both of us, while the car whizzed on again. The conductor reached me first. I gave him a dollar purposely, letting go the strap to open my purse, and stood balancing and swaying there while deliberately I put back the change in my purse. Oh, very deliberately, you may be sure and bumping stupidly against Mrs. Lowenthal, as she, in her turn, let go the strap and prepared to pay her fare. She never paid it, though. That is, I never saw her pay it. For the car gave a lurch just then, and with a squawk, I threw out my hand, plunging bulkily forward, and knocking satchel and all out of Mrs. Lowenthal's fingers. Do you know what I felt down there on the floor of the car, with the conductor in the doorway vainly trying to get me to my feet? with Mrs. Lowenthal exclaiming and all the passengers standing now or stooping to pick up the scattered contents of her bag? It wasn't triumph. No, though I had a page of blue paper covered desperately with my sprawled right hand. And it wasn't the pain in my wrist, bleeding and strained and agonizingly hot. No, it was disgust. This wasn't the guile of the journalist. It was the act of a thug. And a thug had taught it to me. I deserve San Quentin for it. Remember quick-fingered Peter's last break into jail? You don't? Well, read the news, Miss Massey's special article on the subject. Just the same, I wasn't proud of it. Not Rhoda. But, oh, I was glad. Glad and savagely unrepentant. How awfully stupid of me! I'm so sorry! I exclaimed looking tearfully up at Mrs. Lowenthal from under the smashed straw of my hat. Oh, they were genuine tears, all right. I was trying to close my hand on that paper, and the slightest motion stung me as though a million needles were pricking it. But she wasn't paying any attention to me, nor did she seem to see the outstretched hands that held out the various articles picked up on the floor. There's a paper, she said breathlessly to the conductor. A half page of blue note paper. Find it. I must have it. That was just how I felt. I, too, must have it. I had nearly broken my wrist to get it, and indeed I virtually had it. It lay under my sprawled and suffering hand, but try as I would in the quick second that I lay there, I could not close my bleeding fingers upon it. No, no, I cried to the conductor, tears of agony rolling down my cheeks. Let me lie here a minute. I, I'm hurt. And turning, I put my other hand over that poor crippled one, lifted the fingers of it as though each was a dead weight, and, and, and the wind, the capricious, cruel wind, blew a little eddy about the open door, caught the paper away from my tortured fingers, and I fell back nearly fainting. There, there it goes, cried the conductor. "'Should I stop the car, madame?' he asked Mrs. Lowenthal. "'Do you want to get off?' "'Yes, yes, quick!' she cried, and he gave the bell a sharp clang that stopped us on the slant of a steep hill. That meant me. Of course it did, I knew that. But for a second I couldn't get to my feet. Oh, to have to begin all over again. It was the rustle of Mrs. Lowenthal's silk ruffles that roused me. She swished swiftly past me as I lay there propped up beside the door, and, gritting my teeth, I started to rise and follow her. But I didn't get up. 
I fell back staring with popping eyes out toward the dummy. At what? Merely at a bit of blue paper playing like a leaf in the afternoon breeze about the motorman's feet. The others were standing or sitting. They couldn't see it. But from where I lay, in the minute it took for Mrs. Lowenthal to hurry off, and the car to bound forward up the hill, I could watch the gay, imprisoned bit of blue flutter there, and just be content to smile wistfully at it. "'She's fainting!' cried an old woman opposite. N "'No, I'm not,' I said quickly. "'But I do want more air.' I got it. Out on the dummy with the concerned conductor propping me up, asking my name and address, and beseeching me to say it wasn't his fault, I got it. All I had to do was to drop my handkerchief. After such a clumsy accident, it wouldn't have surprised that wretched conductor if I'd fallen to pieces at his feet, and insist upon picking it up myself. "'I'm Rhoda Massey,' I said to the police court bailiff when I had struggled my way through the crowd in the corridor. "'Yes,' he said stolidly, looking cynically at my bedraggled hat and swollen tear-stained face, but not budging an inch from his stand in front of the door. And this is the third time today that same dodge has been tried on me. What did Rhoda Massey be coming in at the end of the examination for? At the end? I cried. Oh, call Brockington out, do. And he did, strange to say. But why not come in yourself? Brockington urged when I stammered a word or two and jammed the bit of paper into his hands. It would be... I... I can't, Mr. Brockington. I'm ashamed. He looked down at the disheveled thing I was. To meet Grandma Lowenthal, I mumbled. He stared. Then quickly he dropped his head and over his glasses he looked at me. Oh, I've seen a look of admiration in old Brockington's eyes before. In court, after I'd done a good piece of work on a trial, a character sketch with any subtlety, or or when I had put on a gown that fitted, that spoke of the feminine. But attorney Alexander Brockington had never looked at me like that. And, oh, Rhoda Massey just loves to be looked at that way. With surprise, but with gratification, with admiration, perhaps, but, oh, with esteem and kindly, kindly regard. He caught my hand in his as he grasped the hand of young Hewlett, his partner, when they'd fought through the long Dilworth case and won. It was a grateful, cordial grasp, but it caught my right hand, and the agony of the pressure, as well as the excitement, I suppose, and the suspense and the blessed relief of it all, sent something quivering into my knees, and made the crowded, foul-aired courtroom swim before me. But I couldn't fall down then. There was too much to see. And I can see Brockington now. I can see this very minute the delicious deliberation with which, when he got back to his place between young Lothal and Grandma Lowenthal, he put on his glasses and prepared to speak. The whole courtroom was in a state of suspense, but he looked around gravely to invite the district attorney's attention, as though even in that supreme moment the ethics of legal courtesy must be observed. And then I heard him, oh, with the most beautiful aplomb begin. It appears, Your Honor, End of Chapter 11 Chapter 12 The Ex-City Editors Club And How Miss Massey Became Eligible for Membership The list of members, a select one, was pasted up against the local room door. It was Ted Thompson who had found the name for it. He wrote out the list one night late, when he was on the paper before, the night Halsey was discharged, and Frankie McGowan, who was our office boy then, cheekily pasted it up there, where Halsey's eye couldn't fail to see it. Ever since my time it had been there, a mute history of the evanescence of the power to hire and fire, as McGowan called it, a threat to the incumbent and a consolation to the reporters whom he harried. As we lost his city editor, his name had been added to the list, sometimes fittingly in blue pencil, occasionally as though to testify to some bullied reporter's gory gratification, in red ink. 
but no entry was ever made with the satisfaction that must have animated the anonymous historian who wrote at the bottom of the list. Proposed for Membership Edward K. Bowman It's natural, you see, that a city editor should be the best hated man on a paper, but it was Bowman's forte to provoke the very flower of detestation. I remember how it used to comfort me in my early days, when he trampled upon everything I did, to look up and see that mute legend on the wall, and to read therein a prophecy. The day it came true, when Forbes scratched out the words, proposed for membership, and with a connecting line, added Bowman's name to the gallant company of Hadbins, was the day the press scooped the town on the grand jury's investigation of United Power's bribery of supervisors. The moment I opened the paper with Frankie McGowan's almost verbatim account of what had happened at the secret meeting, I was sure, as though I had seen McCabe's bye-bye note on his desk, that Bowman's temporary head was off, and that it was time for me to get down to business. It was just as well, too. The news editor was still out of town, on his vacation, and the city editor wanted to be back at the office and very much mistress of herself and her surroundings, when she should become aware again of a certain quick, masterful presence, when she would listen to the one voice in the world which could fuse the most commonplace words into something exquisitely and unforgettably significant. Oh, I knew how it would be. A man would come stalking into the city editor's room. A man, big, straight, alert, and strong, his dear eyes seeking me with a look of such love and longing they might be my very own, so like them my own must look then. But that would be three, four days off. Today, today, I had to shut it all off in an airtight compartment in my heart to blow breezily into the office at noon, assume the desk, and the open press in my hand, demand reasons why. "'I can't understand it,' I cried to Forbes, who was down early. "'If Bowman couldn't land it, why didn't McCabe take the thing out of his hands?' Forbes looked thoughtful. "'Mr. McCabe,' he said with a significant glance toward the managing editor's closed door, "'has been, he is, unfortunately—' "'Oh, oh, I'm sorry. But he isn't altogether off the reservation. He still comes down to his desk. He is here today. And gone tomorrow, eh? Poor old fellow. But it's up to me, then. The grand jury's still in session. The news'll print a bigger story than the press's tomorrow morning, or, or you can propose my name for membership. I nodded over toward the list on the door. Listen. The first thing to do is to find out how McGowan got that story. Find out for me. No, no. I don't care what becomes of all the other details in the office. We'll steal every bit of local we need, but we must have this. Just get me Frankie's story of how he did it. He'll be bragging all over the town, will young Frankie, about this time of day. Peacocking round at the press club, I guess. You get him talking. Be humble. Be very green and inexperienced and admiring. Just lie down and let him walk all over you. Tell him he's put Bowman out of even the temporary city editorship. He hates him, and that'll make him still more cocky. Tell him, yes, give him that, too. He'll believe anything the morning after such a scoop as that. I would myself. It'd turn my head so. Tell him the boss has raked McCabe fore and aft about it and that McCabe's gone down against the bottles in consequence. The vain little wretch. He'll actually believe you. Tell him Rhoda Massey is wild-eyed and threatens to clear out the local room. Oh, just pile it on. He'll grin delightedly. You know the Frankie grin. I can see him prance about and ask you what you'll take and rub it in a bit about our defeat. And then, then when everything's soft and comfy, then's your time. By Jove, it was great, McGowan. How in thunder did you manage it? Like that. Not for the sake of inquiry, you know. Merely an unconscious explosion of admiration from the beaten but wondering foe. See? He didn't, very clearly. I could tell that. But I had to let him go with that much. It was his early watch. 
and though I'd had a general alarm beaten over the phone for the whole staff to turn out, nobody else was on deck yet. When they did come down, they were sulky and heavy, and not a suggestion from one of them did I get. Half of them hadn't seen the press yet. The detail men were indignant at being mustered in like privates. It was unlucky that on my first day on the desk I had to go in for martial law, but I had to. My fingers were itching to get at the story, and we had no time to lose. "'There's no use rushing things now, anyway,' growled Cottrell, Bowman's crony. "'The jury don't meet till two. "'There is use,' I snapped back at him. "'At any rate, you make it useful. "'You fellows ought to have been down here without my sending for you. "'A beat like that is an emergency call for every last soul to get into the ranks and—and and dig.' I was getting mixed, but I tried to laugh with them when I saw the grin on Fairboy's face. Never mind. What I've got to say is that there's only one detail on this paper today, and every last one of you is on it. Mr. Fairboy, detail a man on every grand juror's track. Send two to investigate the building. It's the new Chamber of Commerce, isn't it, where they meet? How in the world could there be a leak there? Send someone after the stenographer. Look up the janitor. I tell you, we're going to lay the press out cold tomorrow, and the man that gets the story needn't be backward about asking for a raise. I was dancing with excitement myself by this time, but that lazy mass of men only shuffled off, talking among themselves without the least bit of contagion. Oh, I know now why editors used to take to Rhoda Massey. She was so ready to enthuse. She caught the eagerness in the voice of the man who gave her her detail, and in a flash she had all the symptoms, the hankering, the tantalization of the thing, harder than he. And yet it was a good staff, the news, the finest fellows in town. What in the world? Suddenly it came to me. It wasn't being routed out. It wasn't that they were sore at being beat. The news's local room has too often carved victory out of defeat. It wasn't Bowman. They weren't resenting his downfall. They were resenting me. Yes, they were. They wouldn't stand for me, for my skirts. They were remembering what I'd clean forgot, the thing that I'd always been first to forget in all the years we'd worked together, these boys and I, and because it never occurred to me to remember my petticoats, because I had grown to think myself one of them, I took it for granted that they, too, had accepted me, taken me in, and now they were banded against me, not because I was stupid or inexperienced or a freak or a fool, but because I was a woman. Oh, but it made me indignant when it got to me finally. Of late, lately, you see, since the heart of her has been living its own full life, the office part of Rhoda Massey has been, well, atrophying. Stories and scoops and things have gone down in her market, and the bulls have been out buying shares in, in futures. But this strike this sullen, silent strike of those prejudiced men under me had roused the old fever in me. Beat the press? I'd beat the press in spite of them, if for no other reason than to make them ashamed of themselves and proud of their city editor. I hurried into McCabe's office to talk over a campaign with him when all the men had gone, leaving only Fairboy at the assistant city editor's desk and old Enderby, whom I had coaxed McCabe to make a copy-reader when he was dismissed from the mail. But I saw immediately that there was no first aid to the injured to be got here. McCabe was at his desk all right. Very gravely and imposingly he was seated there, writing. Can he write? Nonsense. You ought to know better by this time. What does it profit one to be associated with a renowned yellow journalist if you haven't learned that a managing editor never can write? He's like the stiff old ballet master who never danced, like the singing teacher who never had a voice, like the professor of literature, in short, who cannot lit. No, the managing editor only knows it all. He cannot even tell other people how, but he knows good stuff when he sees it, which isn't such a common faculty as you might fancy. McCabe has it, that sort of echo of talent, that left-handed gift for directing others to do what he can't do himself. The other, the real capacity, he has only, or rather fancies he has, when, poor fellow, he has fallen by the wayside. 
after he sobers up and is McCabe again, clean, strong, sure, with a sense of humor and unerring taste, if of a yellow cast, the biggest toady in the office couldn't make him believe that he could write more than an ordinary stickful of commonplace reporting. But now, listen. Good morning, Rhoda. Glad to see you back again at the old stand. Your coming in is most opportune. That dignity which doth hedge the managerial desk is very much in evidence when McCabe is ghost dancing. It affects his speech and makes him pompous. At other times, of course, he laughs at it. I wish to ask your opinion of a, a little essay, an epistolary essay, one might call it, which I have written. Do you mind? I sighed, told him I didn't, and sitting down, crossed my hands and feet to listen. It has always been my ambition, he went on confidentially, to leave the, er, mechanical side of journalism for the higher sphere of, of composition, to discard, as it were, the scissors for the pen. I am telling you this, he added, looking hazily at me over his glasses, in confidence. Apart from this present mention of it, I have never breathed the matter to a living soul. I nodded gratefully. McCabe's alcoholic confidence is given to the first one who happens upon him in the labor of composition. Last time it was Peter, the office boy, who had to listen to his stuff and save him from the consequences of it. This time it meant me. And the reason that I consult you, Rhoda, he said with emotion, is that I have noticed a literary distinction, a discretion about your work that is a thing apart from your character, yourself. You have, what shall I say, a conscience of the pen, an intuitive sense of the fit in writing that is conspicuously absent in your conduct. Thank you, Mr. McCabe, I said appreciatively, but sarcasm couldn't reach him where he'd gone. "'Of course, there is a certain vivacity in your stuff "'that partakes of your temperament,' he went on, "'with painstaking and pain-giving deliberation. "'But a natural and very valuable hypocrisy, "'feminine, I suppose, "'lead you instinctively to avoid complete self-revelation. "'No one to read your stories would realize "'that you are not a girl of heart, of taste, of wholesome womanliness. "'Only we who know you, Rhoda, See the journalistic blackguard, as Thompson so absolutely put it once. Furious? Oh, I was consumed with wrath. It's all very well to tell somebody else not to mind the simple, straight, whiny truce that will out when McCabe's incapacitated. As for me, I forgot every nice thing he'd ever done for me, and hated him as though he'd been sober and saying, with rancorous intention, what he neither meant nor would remember. "'Don't you think, Mr. McCabe,' I cried. It was silly of me to argue with him when he was so obviously not himself, but I couldn't help it. His quoting Ted had hurt me so. "'Wouldn't it seem impossible for a writer to put on paper what isn't in himself? Mightn't there be some of those qualities in, in Rhoda Massey that her work shows, even if circumstances have made her act like an altogether different sort of creature?' I heard my voice break before I could control it, but he was tone-deaf, shut in in a tipsy mist. He got the words of what I said. The rest, and it is the rest that counts, passed by him. I thought so myself once, he said, with the impersonality with which he can discuss your pet weakness with you at times like this. In fact, the quality of your work deceived a number of us. Ted, now, I rather thought he was... "'Seriously interested in you before he so cleverly characterized your performance in the Lowenthal case. "'Later I complimented him upon his clear-sightedness. "'Ted,' I said, "'I admit that at your age the glint in that girl's eye, "'the tantalizing turn of her lips, the color of her hair, "'and her gay, piquant face would have blinded me to defects in her character. "'I must congratulate you, Ted,' I said." upon being a young fellow of balance, of stability. "'That was very sweet of you, Mr. McCabe,' I snarled, "'and awfully clever.' "'No. Do you think so?' he asked deprecatingly. "'It seemed so to me at the time, but something Ted said. "'This happened just before he left town to go off fishing up the Truckee. 
He was looking seedy, rather done up, as though the whole damned world had got on his nerves, poor chap. And he already, young as he is, the very best newspaper man in town, bar none, he... He stopped uncertainly. The sentence was too long for him. He let his head fall into his hands. Poor old McCabe. Dear old fellow. There's something irresistibly gracious and charming about the man at the top, whose recognition of talent on the way up is cordial and ardent as Daddy McCabe's. But something he said? I prompted softly. Yes, he told me to go to the devil, he said absently. I laughed outright. Fancy Ted calling his managing editor down like that, and a man like McCabe. He added, McCabe went on with a stare at my squeal of laughter, that he would punch the head of any man in the office who repeated that absurd and indefensible expression of his, that men were cads and cowards anyway in their dealings with women, and that you had once said to him that the sweetest thing in a working girl's life was to earn men's praise for doing men's work in a workmanlike way, and that I, I myself a man and more than twice your age, had given you just that, and, in a sense, had made you what you are, Rhoda. He looked at me dreamily. I didn't say anything. You don't say anything when words like that come back to you. You only sit still and, and promise yourself many things. That being the case, McCabe went on with sudden briskness, I decided to ask your judgment upon a, a composition of my own, which, have I told you, is in the form of a letter to Mr. Offield. I didn't see the connection, but relevancy is too much to expect of McCabe at the stage when he's capable of writing letters to our respected proprietor. Straightening himself then so that he almost looked like the real Daddy McCabe, he read aloud in his easy, well-modulated voice, and without the least passion or even emphasis. My dear Mr. Offield, Permit me to denounce you as a contemptible little businessman, a sordid scoundrel, whose money has brought him the privilege of associating with men of brains, yet who is incapable of benefiting by such association. Sir, an unprincipled cad like you is unfit to meet gentlemen of the sort that his money hires. For my part, in expressing the sentiment of the office as a whole, I say to you that there isn't a drunken printer upstairs who isn't a worthier human being than your detestable self, your measly, suspicious, rascal self. I weary me, Mr. Charles Staniford Offield, of the task of trying to make a gentleman of you, or rather of making you appear to be a gentleman. I weary of standing between you and your blackguardly greed for graft that would ruin the paper's reputation and expose your own real characterless, contemptible, cowardly self to the public, before whom I and the men who work for me, for me, not for you, sir, you merely hire them, have erected a figurehead that stands for honor, probity, and civic decency. This letter is for the purpose of informing you that I have just heard of the latest rascality in which you have compromised the paper. After permitting me to engage my talents and my journalistic reputation, in an altogether contrary course of action, and even approving our expose of the Sacramento business. You are the Louis the Fifteenth of journalism, too cowardly either to adopt a policy or to keep it. You are a tin-horn gambler, betting against your own hand. You are a vile, contemptible little scavenger. He broke off suddenly. Offield Pear made his money with street-sweeping machines, you know, he said explanatorily. Still, the old man had some starch in him, but the sons. Yes, I know, I answered breathlessly. He watched me a moment. The style, he said interrogatively, is good, don't you think? Direct, incisive, yet without passion? Oh, I answered, getting to my feet. The thing certainly says what it means. You think so? Oh, thank you. But where are you going? To get a story of the grand jury's investigation of U.P., your vile, contemptible little scavenger will make mine a short city editorship if the press scoops us again. He looked at me owlishly. The peculiarity of McCabe drunk is that nothing interests him which interests McCabe sober. 
But, oh, how I long for him to be straight just now. I did so need his help. Don't bother, Rhoda, he said in his most fatherly way. Life's too short, and take warning by me. Don't serve the scavenger too well. First, be sure you're right, and guessing at your boss's policy, then go ahead. Otherwise, you make a spectacle of yourself. Behold, James McCabe. I did, but the sight wasn't edifying. James McCabe had risen and, rather erratically, catching up his hat, had made for the door. Don't monkey with U.P., he whispered stertorously. You, you'll attend to the mailing of my letter to that scavenger? I nodded. He hurried out and I tore his communication to the scavenger in two and let it fall into the waste basket. What if I hadn't? Oh, nothing. Offield has received at least one such ingenious epistle from McCabe that I know of, but his managing editor is too valuable to lose. Forbes rushed in at that minute. It was this way, he commenced without preliminary. McGowan's bragging all over town about it. There's no need for him to keep still because they've plugged up the heaters now. The heaters? That's what? Frankie bought the janitor to see that the heater in the grand jury room was left open, and with his ear close to the one on the half-story above, he got the whole thing. Oh, disgraceful, disgraceful, I moaned. What? Not of Frankie? Of Frankie, not much. Of you and every man in the office. The simplest scheme in the world, and not a one of you thought of it. Forbes nodded miserably. Of course he went on uneasily. McGowan's pretty cocky, so you can't believe all he says, but he swears that in spite of their closing up the heaters, he'll have another scoop tomorrow. Forbes, I shouted, fly out to the Chamber of Commerce and hire every room that's to let in the whole building, every room that touches that grand jury room on any side. Hurry, hurry. He did. And Forbes, I rushed out to the local room calling after him. Keep in touch and let me know if you've got them. The men were getting back when I sat down to the desk. Bowman reported first. It was this way, he said under his breath, leaning over my desk in a confidential attitude. The grand jury's foreman, Farwell, who hates Offield, has got on to a story that the news is secretly in with United Power and it was to make Offield hot that he gave the stuff to the press, making McGowan promise to put it up to any old thing, heaters, Frank says. The news in with U.P., after that Sacramento story of mine about the Bassett list, I exclaimed. Yes, after, I may even say since, Bowman replied significantly. In fact, they say that very story brought Bassett with this proposition to Offield, who... I don't believe it. Bowman lit a cigarette and went off to his desk. The only thing to do, said Cottrell, coming up, is to get hold of a new sensation. Anything will do. Play it up big and scream the press down. There's the rumor. Tell it to the Marines or to Fairboy, I interrupted. It doesn't interest me. Nothing does but UP stuff. What did you get, Dexter? Nothing very exciting drawled Dexter. But I want something exciting, I cried angrily, and I want it quick. Glory, it's two o'clock. You three fellows go out again and haunt that place. I tell you, we've got to get something. Forbes on the phone, Miss Massey, chanted Peter, the office boy. Yes, yes, Forbes, I asked, taking the receiver off the hook. I got all the rooms, came over the phone. The bill is... Never mind that. Have it sent to me. Tell me, is McGowan out there? He did show up. Uh, I'm afraid. Well, what? He seems so confident, and he has sublet one of the upstairs offices from Crowley, the lawyer. I know that. Bid over him. Too late. The window cleaner saw him take possession half an hour ago. Forbes, I said slowly. Forbes, do you hear me? You've just got to find out what he's up to. I jammed the receiver back on the hook and jammed my head between my hands. Ladies came to see the city editor. 
club women a wanting favors. Telegrams came to her. Tickets for the prize fight were brought in to her. Dinky little municipal politicians came in upon her and retreated precipitately when they saw her skirts. Offield himself, just before he left for his country place at Burlingham, put his head inside the door, but I passed everything over to Fairboy that I could, and even tried in vain to wave our respected proprietor in that direction. He's a nasty, slinky little R.P., ours, a mean-spirited manling who accepts the situation his socially ambitious wife has contrived to get him into, or rather herself. Society doesn't know our R.P., is not aware of his existence. But it accepts theater tickets and box parties from his wife, sends in accounts of its dinners and teas to his paper, invites our respected proprietress to its functions, and will even go to hers, provided always that Charles Staniford Offield is conspicuously absent. "'What about this grand jury investigation in United Power, Miss Massey?' he asked me. "'Nothing. Plain nothing.' I threw out my hands. The thing's hopeless. We can't get a line, Mr. Offield. He looked at me. You can never tell what Offield is thinking. McCabe's supposed to know, but Ted has always insisted that he guesses, and then squares the result by bullying the R.P. into believing he guessed right. On the rare occasions when both guesses and bullying fail, the R.P. takes to walking soft-footed about the office and putting his finger into the journalistic pie which, of course, drives McCabe to ghost-dancing and writing voracious letters. I looked back at Offield. I was wondering just what particular guess of McCabe's had gone wrong. If I hadn't been thinking so hard of that, my brand-new city editorship might have taken alarm, and I might have made the mistake of trying to follow an impression through those crooked brown eyes of his, and into the tortuous maze where Offield makes honey of the flower of the world's activities. But just then there came a whir on my phone, and I grabbed the receiver. "'It's Forbes, Miss Massey,' came with a welcome giggle over the phone. "'Say, Frankie did have a scheme all right, and he's been caught red-handed at it. He was in Crowley's room and was boring a hole with an auger down through the floor when bits of the plaster he'd loosened fell plump down on Farwell's head. Yes, Farwell, the hardware man. He's foreman. My, but he was hot.' He got up and made a speech about the shamelessness of newspaper men and advocated the juries moving back to the old Chamber of Commerce. You know old Farwell's a Silurian who voted against the new building. He did succeed in having an officer sent up to catch Frankie, but McGowan's wise all right. He'd skipped. And now... Now, interrupted Offield in his most amiable tone. I put down my phone to stare at him. Now there's no danger of the presses getting anything either, so don't you bother your pretty little head any more about it, Miss Massey. Good day. I sat there petrified, looking after him. He'd actually taken the other phone and listened to everything Forbes had been telling me, and the nerve of him to patronize me like that. Oh, he's a gentleman of taste, our respected proprietor. Marvelously philosophical about this United Power investigation, isn't he, Miss Massey? Fairboy asked with a grin as the elevator carried Offield out of sight. Is it merely consideration for the new city editor's pretty little head, Miss Massey? See here, Fairboy, I growled. It may be a pretty little head, but it's your city editor's just now, and it isn't safe to guy it at this present time of writing. Just you begin planning an alternative first page. I'll sink or swim on this U.P. business. But we've got to have something ready if I go to pieces on it. Why, if the press is out of it, that's just double the reason for us to... to... Glory! I've got a scheme. Upon my soul, I believe. Hello, hello, Forbes! I cried into the phone. Yes, Miss Massey, he answered. You know the bridge across the alley that connects the old Chamber of Commerce with the new one? Yes, yes, cried the boy eagerly. Well, listen, that bridge is on the second story, isn't it? And the jury rooms, too, are on the second. And a slender man... No, no, you're too big. Listen to what I tell you. I'm going to send Enderby out to you. 
Get him out on that bridge and tell him when he crosses to lie down under the window and... Exactly, you've got it. Get Enderby there for me and you can choose your detail as long as Rhoda Massey runs this local room. I cut off and rang for Peter to send little Enderby in to me. I gave him a good quick talk and sent him off in a rush. Then I sat down to try to hold myself steady and to read the afternoon papers. But I didn't really read. Three o'clock came and not a hint of success. Four o'clock and no word from Enderby. I could hardly keep my seat, but I was sitting there with my hands up to my blazing cheeks, trying to fix my mind on the possibilities of the little commonplace murder the afternoon papers were playing up to conceal their lack of information about the U.P. investigation, when the phone at my elbow mercifully jangled. "'It's Forbes, Miss Massey,' the boy called fretfully. "'What in the world's become of Enderby?' "'Of Enderby?' I cried. "'Oh, surely. Do you mean he didn't get there an hour ago?' "'No. McGowan saw him go into a saloon with Bowman, and since then—' "'Bowman,' I gasped. "'But Bowman's on the water wagon now, I know, Miss Massey, so how—' "'Never mind, never mind. Wait a minute. "'Shall I hang up?' "'No, no, I tell you, wait a minute,' I cried irritably. But I didn't really know or care what I said. I was thinking, thinking quick and hard. About Bowman? No. What difference did it make whether Bowman had queered me purposely or not? You can't think of two things at once when you're on the desk. All I wanted was the story. There'd be time enough to settle with Bowman afterward if, if... Forbes, I cried. In just ten minutes I'll be on the Chamber of Commerce corner. Meet me there. No, not a word. Good-bye. Fairboy looked up as I came flying out into the local room, my hat on and tearing into my jacket and gloves as I walked. Off so soon? he asked. Oh, it's four, he laughed. Going to give the ladies a chance? It was an old joke of Bowman's. I can see him now straighten himself pompously for his parade up and down Kearney Street at just this time in the afternoon, and declare half humorously, but wholly sincerely, his intention to bedazzle and delight the sex. I nodded. I had grown distrustful. If the whole local room, with the exception of a green reporter and a tipsy one, was leagued against Rhoda Massey, why, there was nothing to do but give the ladies a chance. One lady, anyway. A wretched, feverish little city editor lady, whom nobody else would give half a chance, but who couldn't live any more in inaction, who was deadly tired of issuing orders that didn't seem to stick, who was determined now to get out to the firing line and do some real fighting herself before she'd accept defeat. When Forbes heard my scheme, he declared I couldn't do it, but that didn't make any difference. We got into the old building the back way and then climbed through an open hall window upstairs. My, it was hot! concentrated, radiated, reflected stone heat sizzling out there upon the bridge. "'Now you go back,' I said, slipping off my jacket and hat and handing them to him. "'Hang around the entrance. Be there if I want you, and, say, Forbes, don't give it away, even to our own men. It isn't a very dignified detail for a city editor, but I'm littler than Enderby anyway, and so long.' I flew across the bridge and cautiously tried the window at the end. It was locked. I couldn't budge it. My heart was beating terrifyingly. I was so afraid of being caught. Stiff and straight I held myself, while I edged along the broad cornice, turned the corner, and got to the west side. All the windows in the court looked down on this side, but all of them, too, had shades pulled far down where the sun was blazing down upon the white stone walls of the new building, sending out a blinding, reflected light that protected me like a dazzling screen from other eyes. Dizzy? No, I wasn't dizzy. It isn't so very far up, but I was too busy thinking to be physically afraid. But the heat scorched through me. Contact with the stones burned my hands, and the sun blistered my cheeks and lips. But I forgot it all when I caught sight of the last window on the west. THE window, the grand jury's window, and open, at least halfway open. 
They'd had to shut all those that looked on the corridor because of the crowd of reporters hanging about, and they'd even remembered the one giving on to the bridge. But they'd have stifled without a single open window. And on the west side, on the west side, who in the world would guess that a light little body could slip along the cornice and find room below the ledge of that same open window? No one but Rhoda Massey, evidently, and she wasn't giving it away, I can tell you. With a sigh of perfect contempt, I let myself down softly, and on my knees now peered into the place. Oh, nuts! His back to me, so near I could have touched him with my finger, sat vain old Farwell, who never would use an ear trumpet, his hand curled about his ear, his suspicious eyes questioning everything, and with reason, for U.P. had its men there all right his dominating soul insisting upon a repetition of every phrase that escaped him. And me. Was it hot? I didn't know any more. The invariable afternoon wind, whose cessation had caused these three days of cruel and unusual heat, might have started up again, and I might have been drowned in fog or frozen stiff. I shouldn't have been conscious of it. I was simply in heaven. The heaven of the reporter where you see things from the inside. And it was the inside, surely. All that delicious sense I'd had of being behind the scenes during my newspaper life. All the tang of the seamy side that takes hold of you when once you get the chance to know men and things as they are. It was all nothing to this. To the turning inside out and upside down that the grand jury gives to secret things. And oh, I love a secret. There's only one thing more fascinating than to know what nobody else knows and that is to give it away in a glorious, self-conscious, jubilating scoop. Why, Newberry himself, Senator Newberry, was on the grill there, confronted with Supervisor Gregory, who had been bought by Boss Bassett, but who hadn't stayed bought and had confessed the fact. And now... Do you mean to say, Senator, Farwell was shouting, that Supervisor Gregory is lying? A man who'd accept a bribe would lie, said Newberry deliberately. But since he says he accepted a bribe, I don't doubt it. He's quite capable of it. Only I'm not sure neither Mr. Bassett nor myself would offer him one. He's not worth it. But suppose, snarled Farwell, leaning forward still farther to catch Newberry's words, suppose that another man... Quite another man, supposed to be absolutely loyal to United Power, had confessed also. Now look here, Farwell. Suddenly Newberry's voice grew indistinct. Things began to sound queerly far off. Surely Farwell couldn't hear if I couldn't. Quickly my eyes switched from the senator's handsome grim face to the foreman's and... And then I saw what was up, or rather down. Slowly, slowly, but relentlessly, the window was being closed. And there, facing me on the other side of the slowly descending window, his broad bulk almost obscuring the whole space, was one of the grand jury's policemen. There was a grin of enjoyment on his face as he looked at me. But his eyes, his eyes... In a second I knew it. His eyes were alert, eager, curious, greedy. Yes, greedy. The eyes of the grafter, the bribee, the silent seller. Instantly I put a finger to my lips. He grinned knowingly and winked. I pointed to the window questioningly and lifted one hand slowly as though raising a weight. The other I put in my pocket. He gave me a swift comprehending nod, turned his back upon me and slipped his hand open palm upward out through the crack that still remained between the window and the sill. Oh, that broad red palm, that coarse, thick-fingered, greedy hand. How I hated it. How I longed to beat it, to hurt it, to crush it for its cupidity, its baseness. But I didn't. I giggled instead. The situation was so funny. On one side of the window, the grand jury, in the very act of investigating the bribery of a public servant, while at the same moment on the other side, Rhoda Massey was feeling for her purse and, oh, pity, not finding it. The giggle died a swift, horrible death. I hadn't a nickel with me. My purse was in my jacket pocket, and Forbes had that, and the bribee's impatient hand. 
It twitched suddenly, angrily, and in a moment that cop's face, furious now, was turned upon me. A yellow journalist has got to be rather versatile, something of an actor indeed, and he gets the essence of acting, the strategical joy of it, the one thing that makes it worth while compelling belief in spite of, and not with the concurrence of his audience. Verily, if the great theatrical trinity could have seen the pantomime I went through just then, I'd have had an offer and a contract and right-of-way on the syndicate tracks straight into the big syndicate theaters. In dumb show I apologize for my temporary, oh, very temporary and accidental and amazing impecuniosity. Without a word I explained to him that the wealth of Tonopah was nothing to what the news stood ready to lay at his feet later, oh, the least bit of time later. I offered him a bit of paper, scribbled there in utmost haste, with the window sill for a desk and the gutter for a chair, a blank I.O.U., to be presented at the news business office, signed Rhoda Massey. With a melting eye, it's a wonder the whole of me wasn't melted, I tried to appeal to his great and noble heart, his pity for beauty and distress and all the rest of it, but squeak, squeak, squeak the remorseless window frame came down, and at the last I scooted away quick as I could, knowing that in his disappointment he'd call someone to the window to see what he'd withstood. I cakewalked back across the bridge and down and out the back way. It was a sorrowful cakewalk, done to an appropriate melody. If you ain't got no money. I always hated that song. They've actually adjourned to the old building, cried Forbes when I joined him. What happened? You did get something, didn't you? Something? You better believe I did. Just enough to make me thirst for more. Come, there's no use hanging round here. Lightning may not strike twice, but if it does, it'll be close to the spot where things are doing. We'll adjourn to the old building, too. We walked leisurely about to let them get settled, and then strolled around the corner to the entrance of the old building. A moss-backed relic of forty-nine, Dear to pioneers and professional reminiscencers is the old chamber of commerce. No wonder Farwell is fond of it. Here, before the town grew big, and younger, more pretentious fellows hustled him out of the way, was the scene of Farwell's departed civic glory. Here he was nominated for the mayoralty he was destined never to attain. Here he made his famous speech against the vigilantes, and when half the chamber rose and made for him, he escaped. He escaped through. Forbes, I breathed, clutching him by the arm. There's a chance. Oh, oh, be ready to take it. I'm going to try to get it for you. The doors, the old-fashioned swinging doors. Watch em, and me. But look at the man they've got on guard. It's hopeless, he remonstrated under his breath. Yet helping me all the time up the broad stairs, there isn't money enough in Offield's new bank to tempt Wilson. Wilson? I looked up at the officer on guard, a handsome white-bearded old fellow with the sergeant's stripes on his arm, stood, his back to those fascinatingly swinging doors, his alert, clear, honest eyes amusedly watching us as we approached. He looked like old Forty-Nine himself, yet hale and strong as the pioneer spirit, and as unflinching. He looked. Why, why, Forbes, I cried. It looks for all the world like Sheriff Wilson of Grafton. Not Sheriff Wilson of Grafton any more, Miss Massey, the officer cried as I put out my hand. But Sergeant Wilson of the Police Department of the City and County of San Francisco. It was my heart give out up there, he explained. And the doctor sent me down to sea level. "'Good for the doctors!' I exclaimed as we shook hands cordially. He beamed upon me. "'But tain't no use in this particular business so far as you're concerned, Miss Massey,' he added quickly. "'They's been three attempts today to get a leak on the jury room. That's why they got me out at last. And the ten minutes since the jury's been here, every reporter in town has taken a squint up here, seems to me. But they give it up when they see who was on deck.' Lord knows I wish you could get it, this or anything else you want. But not through me, little gal. Or if you could get it in spite of me, I'd be glad as yourself. Tain't my funeral. Only don't expect me not to do my duty, for you'll get left if you do. 
If ever anything else comes up that you want that I can give ye, and not disobey orders, why, it's yours. I never see a girl that's got your grit and the way you handled that dimling case just made me your friend for life. You bet I'd like awfully well to oblige you, Miss Massey, but... His big, sincere voice was full of appeal. Don't ask me like a good girl. Pon honor now, I might give in to you, but I'd blow my brains out afterward. By gum, I would. Wait, wait, I cried gaily. Don't blow them out till you have to, Sheriff Wilson. Nobody's asked you, sir, she said, to betray the lofty trust imposed in you and all the rest of it. I haven't the least intention of coaxing you, surely, Sheriff. He looked at me suspiciously, shrewdly, but he was convinced just the same. And so, so was poor Forbes. Oh, the black melancholy that settled upon him. And his face had been radiant since Wilson and I had so unexpectedly fraternized. Mr. Forbes and I, I went on with a quick reminding glance at him, are out reconnoitering. This is Grant Forbes, Sheriff, the sharpest green reporter in town. When he's been at it a bit longer, he'll rival Ted Thompson. If only he learns not to jump too quickly to conclusions. The two shook hands. Forbes shot a look at me that was worth the price of admission. It was so grateful, so apologetic, so promising. Of course, Sheriff, I went on, stepping a bit to the side where the upper porch threw a welcome spot of shade. I would get the thing if I could. It's as useless to deny that as to insist that the day's not sweltering hot. So, so hot that, if I were you, Mr. Forbes, I'd step farther in out of the sun. He did, bewildered a bit, but watchful, and stood his back to the door, facing me. "'We might as well wait here for the adjournment,' I gabbled on, trying to be oh so very natural and indifferent. "'Mr. Farwell may be a bit communicative just as he comes out. You don't mind, do you, Sheriff?' "'Mind?' His fine old blue eye beamed welcome at me. I've often promised myself that some day when I had time and you had to, we'd sit down and have a chin together over that old dimling case. What gets me is how you could make a cross-grained old maid like Ellen Eli leave her dinner, and without hat or coat or gloves, go off on the train with you when them fellows. But you can't stand there. Say, bub, he turned to Forbes, go over yonder, behind the first pillar and get a folding stool that's there. "'Yes, please do, Bub,' I said with a laugh. "'The sheriff and I are in for a good long confab, and all you can do is to bear it, and—' I stopped and looked squarely up at him. "'And listen.' Did he understand that? Not a bit of it. And yet his eyes were steady, unwinking question marks. But he did go over and get the stool and set it up awkwardly for me, his face a study of bewilderment and eagerness, while I objected fussily to this spot or that, complained of the sun, the reflected light from the building across the way, and finally, with an exclamation of impatience at his stupidity, seized the chair myself and set it down where I wanted it with a thump. "'Boys are such clumsy things,' I said to the sheriff, who had watched us with an enjoying eye. "'It's the hardest thing in the world to get them to understand what you want them to do.' And seating myself, I threw out my arms with an exaggerated gesture of irritability, and, with my elbow, knocked ajar the swinging door. Did Forbes get that? Well, I wonder. In that second, before the door swung gently back again, we both heard old Farwell's bellow. The boy's face went white. Perhaps mine did, too, for I thought, in his sudden enlightenment, he'd give the whole thing away and I tell you I talked fast for a minute. But I needn't have worried. The sheriff, his elbow against a pillar, was looking down at me, his shrewd, smiling face full of interest as I plunged into the tale of the gulling of Miss Eli, and from that went on and on as I do, you know, when I get to telling newspaper yarns. My back was turned to Forbes when I really got down to playing Scheherazade to the dear old sheriff's caliph. But in a second's glimpse I had caught the tense attitude of the boy behind me, his shoulder pressed slightly against that blessed swinging door, and holding it just a scant inch from its mate, his head inclined as though he were listening, 
with half-closed eyes to the tales I was spinning, and yet all he heard was, well, was in the news the next morning. And to this day nobody knows how it got there. End of Chapter 12 Chapter 13 A Boss, a Respected Proprietor, and a Whipping Boy How Miss Massey Linked the Three But Sensation? Whoop! Sensation's no name for it. Do you know what Rhoda Massey's exposure of United Powers Bribery and Corruption Fund did? It sobered McCabe. In a personal note to me, he congratulated me on being the best managing editor of the news, not the news' proprietor, had ever had, telling me I'd understand the distinction before long. He said he'd be back in a day or two and that in the meantime I should sit tight. I didn't know then on what. It brought our respected proprietor back to town in the morning, for the first time since I'd been on the news, with a copy of his own paper in his hand, and a face so scared that, really, I was sorry for him. It stirred the press to issuing an extra before noon, accusing Offield himself of having sold out to United Power, declaring that he had entered into a contract with Boss Bassett to abstain from roasting the company in the future, for the sum of $40,000 a year, to be paid in the guise of advertisement and special editions. It brought Bliss of the Evening Mail over to interview our poor respected proprietor, and Offield, wriggling in McCabe's big chair with self-consciousness and discomfort, was closeted with Bliss for half an hour, and then the newspaper man came out, red-faced and angry, leaving Offield white-faced and angry within. Why? That's what I asked myself when Bliss hurried off with a look at me that mystified me. What in the world could our R.P. have to say? I found out when the mail came out. There it was, spread on the first page. Offield puts blame on his news editor, Theodore Thompson. Oh, for all the typed bombshells, big and little, that I've let loose over unsuspecting heads in a long career black with printer's ink, I paid when I saw that lie in print. I knew then how it feels to be the woman who cares for the man in the case. And care, oh, I cared so much that I could have better borne the whole world's reviling me than that one miserable voice should doubt him. And here was the one thing that comforted me. There wasn't a man in the local room, and Ted had been brought in from a rival paper, remember, and put over every head there, that did believe it. Even Bowman threw down the mail with its double lead story and cried out, Oh, that's too thin. I gulped when I heard that and tore in two the discharge note I was writing him at that very moment, and instead I sent him off on the Quillinan story, the cream of the day's details. It was just then that Gibson, the business manager who had happened in, sang out, Well, it may seem thin to you fellows, and it's decent of you to stand up for your own order, but if you'll watch things from now on, you'll notice that Thompson's dead journalistically. There isn't a paper in the state that'll dare to hire him. Oh, yes, I know all about his cleverness, but he'll have the reputation now of being altogether too clever, and there isn't a newspaper proprietor in town who, if he gave Thompson a desk, wouldn't have an uneasy doubt that he was grafting instead of, "'Instead of leaving the grafting to the respected proprietor himself,' I burst out, charging into the hall after him. Gibson stared at me aghast, and his stare brought me back to my senses. "'After all,' I added, "'it's a proprietor's own paper to have and to sell out, to lie about and cheat and blackmail with, if he wants to be that kind of man and own that kind of paper. "'You're right, Mr. Gibson.' There's only one man on a paper who's got its columns for sale. The rest of us are only freelances, who uphold the particular journalistic banner under which we happen to have enlisted, stoutly ignoring the spots and blotches on it, and swearing stoutly that its black is white and its white is dazzling purity. But all the same, there's one thing neither Mr. Offield nor any other newspaper proprietor can do, and that is to use one of his men, and a man like Ted Thompson, as a whipping boy when his own sins are found out. Bravo, bravo! 
came in a shout from the boys in the local room, banging vigorously upon their desks. Speech! Rhoda Massey! Speech! Gibson looked calmly at me. Have you seen the contract signed with Thompson's name, Miss Massey? he asked. No, and I don't believe... Oh, yes, I have, he interrupted. I have seen it. Would you like to? No, no, I gasped when I had quieted something inside of me that seemed to be crying aloud. You see, Mr. Gibson, a contract Ted had signed wouldn't make the least bit of difference, for of course he signed for Mr. Offield with Offield's knowledge and under Offield's orders. Mr. Offield had given the whole management of the special edition into Thompson's hands, Gibson said quietly. There happened to be one man in the business office who was connected with the business end of the special edition. I discharged him this morning. Poor fellow! I exclaimed wrathfully. Our R.P.'s sin must be a mighty big one since it calls for two whipping boys to suffer for it instead of one. Only, only Ted Thompson won't take the whipping, Mr. Gibson. I'll bet you on that. And I turned and went back to my desk. Haughty? Not a bit of it. I was shivering in my boots. Ted's word against Offield's. That would be how it would stand. There wasn't a working newspaper man in town who'd have hesitated for a second which one to believe. But working newspaper men don't own newspapers. It's working millionaires who do that. And the public is what they work, and newspaper men are what they work with. And Ted Thompson has to have a newspaper. It's the tools of his trade. And how, how in the world was he going to get his name clean again? Savagely, I pulled out a sheet of paper from my desk with the news letterhead at the top. Mr. Charles Staniford Offield. Dear Sir, I wrote, and then Peter banged at my door and, throwing it unnecessarily wide open, laid two cards in front of me. Ben Bassett. The top one's announcement was like a challenge. It had a bulldog brevity and sternness for all the world like the face of Boss Bassett of United Power. Senator Archibald Leonard Newberry's card, which lay humbly beneath, hadn't half the imposing force of the top one, and yet since his election Newberry had been made president of U.P. I looked at those two cards. The men whose names they bore must know the truth of this business, the most serious thing in Ted's life, and mine. They don't want to see me, Peter, I said peevishly. Oh, yes, they do, he said. When they found Mr. Offield was out, they asked for the managing editor. I told him he was off, on a vacation. Then they asked for the fellow that comes next. I told him he was off on a vacation. See the difference, Miss Massey? So then I told him the city editor was holding the fort, and they said they must see him. All right, send them in, I said, and went on with my letter. Oh, I say. In the midst of all my misery, it was good to see the start those two men gave when they saw a woman city editor instead of a man. And because that start flattered me and insulted my sex, I looked up in a preoccupied way, told Peter to set chairs, and begged them to excuse me for a moment as I had to attend to a matter of the utmost importance. And it was important, mighty important to me. I was about to join the only club I ever belonged to the ex-city editor's club. The way you go about joining it is to write a thing like this. Mr. Charles Staniford Offield, Dear Sir, I herewith present my resignation as city editor of the news. Kindly relieve me at your earliest convenience. Rhoda Massey. I rang for Peter. Take this yourself, Peter. Don't trust it to anybody else, I said, sealing it in an envelope, and rush it. I want an answer as soon as you can possibly get back. Understand? He did, and was off. And he seemed, with that envelope, to take a part of me with him. But I hadn't time to think of that. I just grabbed the telegraph blank and scrawled. Ted Thompson, Fisherman's Point. Come back quickly, Teddy, and let's fight it out together. R. I rang for a messenger of the other company, so that my message shouldn't go through the hands of Graves, our telegraph editor, and then brushing back my hair, 
I turn to those two big fellows. And they are big fellows. They hold the town and the state in the hollow of their hands. They know all the secrets of politics, all the follies of the press, all the weakness of the public. And yet they might have it all, for all of me, if they'd give me one little hint that it'd clear Ted Thompson. "'My congratulations, Miss Massey,' Newberry began pleasantly. He'd been watching me with an odd mixture of amusement and respect. "'I didn't know the news had a lady city editor.' "'Thank you, Senator, but city editors don't last long on the news, you know.' I laughed and rattled on, telling him about the ex-city editor's club. I didn't tell him I'd just joined. "'Why not?' because any information relating to his own office must be in the hands of your R.P. himself before a white man has any right to speak of it, and because your boss is black is no reason for you to match him in color. That's why. But Newberry laughed with me, and even old Bassett grinned appreciatively as I ushered them into the next room, Offield's, where we could talk undisturbed. "'We have been looking for Mr. Offield, Miss Massey,' Bassett said at last speaking with his usual deliberation. The boss is a man of elegant leisure, if you believe the tone of his voice. It is rather essential that I should see him, but he's not down at Burlingham. He's not at the hotel, or says he is not. And though I have telephoned a dozen times, I can't seem to catch him here, nor at the club. Hmm, I remarked. That being the case, just why did you come to call, Mr. Bassett? The boss looked at me sharply. But Newberry interposed suavely. "'We thought, we hoped you might tell us where Mr. Offield is. It happens to be as important to him as to us that we should meet.' "'There are times, Senator,' I said with a smile, "'when no one on the paper knows where Mr. Offield is.' "'Yes, I know,' Newberry agreed with a knowing smile times of stress when Mr. Offield, like a certain great military commander, reposes full confidence in the officers he has left behind him. But past experience has taught us that there is always one person on the paper who knows Mr. Offield's whereabouts. Mr. McCabe knew. Mr. McCabe is... On a vacation, yes, I know that, and so is Mr. Thompson. But it is simply incredible that at a time like this... Mr. Offield should not be in touch with the office. It is almost certain that the next person in authority... He stopped suggestively. I sat there a moment, cogitating. A boy or two came in with proofs, a card, some telegrams from McCabe, which I tore open and sent orders to Fairboy about, and I had to answer the phone twice. But all the time I was thinking in the back of my head, and when I turned to him I was ready for him. I think, Senator, I said at last, you'll have to take me, part way at least, into your confidence. You don't know me very well, and... Oh, pardon me, he interrupted graciously, but I have a lively memory, Miss Massey, of certain obligations up at Sacramento during the last legislative session. But Mr. Bassett, I began with a smile, remembering the part the Bassett list had played in the story that landed the senatorship at Newberry's feet. "'My dear young lady,' the boss said softly, "'though I have always denied the existence of such a list as you published, and, as you know, the senatorial investigation resulted in a vote of confidence in the accused senators, still all this does not preclude my being capable of admiration for a good fight well fought.' I take off my hat, therefore, to Miss Massey, both as journalist and as pugilist. We all laughed at that. Coming from the boss, it was meant to be excruciatingly funny. Old Bassett was immensely pleased with it himself, and we had quite a little love feast there in Offield's private office. All right, then, I said finally, throwing out my hands. Now, hands on the table. I may know where Mr. Offield is, and I may not. In either case, he's my respected proprietor, and, as it's evident he doesn't want you to know, I wouldn't tell you if I could where he is. The only thing you can do is to trust me, as you would have to trust McCabe if he were here. Then I'll forward your terms to Mr. Offield, making sure, of course, there's no leak. And as for myself, no, you've got to take me or leave me. 
I'll give myself no letter of recommendation to you or anybody else. Now this is how we stand. Treat me as you would a man who's entitled to confidence by virtue of the position he holds, or, well, frankly, let me get out the paper. There's a lot to do. What a pity, what a pity you're not a man, Miss Massey, said Bassett, rubbing his chin reflectively. Not at all, Bassett interposed Newberry gallantly. What sort of a man is it that would wish such a girl as Miss Massey not to be a woman? It's awfully nice of you both, I said dryly, but just now I'm neither man nor woman. I'm just a temporary managing editor. What's your business with the paper, Mr. Bassett? That reached him, straight. Without another word of preliminary, old Bassett drew his chair up close to the desk, put his elbow on the corner of it, and giving his short, stiff hair an aggressive rub upward, he got down to business. I want from the news, Miss Massey, just what the senatorial investigation gave Allen, Kennify, and those fellows up at the legislature. I want a vote of confidence in united power. That's what I want, and I want it to be the leader on tomorrow morning's editorial page. Phew! I exclaimed thoughtfully, and sat there a second looking right at him. Of course, Mr. Bassett, I went on when I got my breath, there's this handicap for me in talking with you. I don't know just where U.P. and the news stand. I did know when I was up in Sacramento all right, and knew just how my story of the Bassett list would be received at that time, but that's some months ago. Still, I do know, it was common talk at Sacramento, you remember, how much that vote of confidence up there cost United Power. I do know that that amount won't buy the editorial columns of the news. His small, twinkling, cold eyes positively warmed to me. You're quite right, Miss Massey, he said gently. If you'll pardon me, I know that even better than you do. I laughed outright at that. It was such a facer. Oh, I said. I'm beyond my depth, eh? Well, as I understand it, you want me to tell Mr. Offield that an editorial... Not un-editorial, Miss Massey, the old fellow interrupted in a quick and positive voice. Not any editorial, but a strong, confident editorial, with a backbone and an unmistakable intention, not only to show belief in what it says, but to take sides. In short... I want a thing that, as you've said, can't be bought, and more that doesn't sound as if it had been bought. I stared at him, but admiringly. No wonder he's Boss Bassett, a man that's got the audacity to ask a thing like that. I'll tell Mr. Offield, I said. I'll tell him just what you say. Thank you. He got to his feet, and so did Newberry, and we stood there a minute while Fairboy came in to get me to OK the payroll. "'There's a quality in Mr. Offield, or a lack of it,' Newberry said slowly after Fairboy had gone, "'which makes him susceptible to the manner in which things are said to him, and, and which makes him most responsive to the last argument that reaches him. "'Eh, Miss Massey? One more confidence, if you please.' This isn't for publication, but you may have it to print first when the time comes. I am going to buy a newspaper here in town. I think I am going to buy the news. I need it, and... Why? I burst out. Offield will never part with it. It's his dearest vanity, next to his new bank. I know, he smiled, and yet I have hopes of persuading him. I looked at him blackmailing a blackmailer. That's what I wanted to say, but I didn't say it. The blackmailer happened to be my boss, till Peter should come back. He did come back just that minute, bringing me my unopened letter of resignation. Not in, he said with a significant look as he went out into the next room, McCabe's. Ooh, but the sight of that overdue letter made me cross. I had so counted on getting away. I stood there frowning till Newberry said softly, Well, Miss Massey? I looked up then. The trouble with me is that it's so hard for me to put my whole heart and soul into two different schemes at the same time. 
"'You've got a lot of things to attend to, haven't you?' he went on lightly. "'It's unconscionable of us to take up so much of your time. Three editors in one, aren't you, today? You must be a valuable newspaper man, Miss Massey. When I get the news, I hope I'll have the benefit of your services, too?' "'I got it, then. Oh, I got it all right, though I had been a bit slow. But you see, it was the first time.' You hear tales of the bribes offered to reporters, but I've always said that the newspaper man whose professional honor is so often in danger is of the same breed as the woman whose virtue is constantly threatened. In all the days and nights, too, that I've been running round the town hunting stories, the villain still pursued her has never bothered me. I was too busy, and he probably guessed as much. I am valuable, Senator, I said to him then. Not so much because I know the business from the ground up and serve my apprenticeship under a good master, if a hard one, that's Bowman. No, the journalistic woods are full of experts. It isn't that, but it's because I happen to be honest. I may serve a scrub, but so long as he's my employer, he gets the best service that's in me. I'll give Mr. Offield your message, but I'll tell him... And in the absence of my superiors, I'm the nearest thing to good newspaper judgment he has to rely on, and he knows it. I'll tell him that he'll ruin the paper if he does what you want. That it'll be a virtual confession of the truth of the press's story, of course. And that he might have saved himself that lie about Ted Thompson if he in... in ten... Newberry's start stopped me. Of course I had done it. It wasn't in me to say Ted's name and talk like a managing editor. I had to let my voice quiver like a goose, and the red come to my cheeks, and be filled with rage at the world while I spoke. "'Miss Massey,' Newberry said, and there was actually respect in his voice this time as well as eagerness. "'I really think we might do business together.' But I shook my head loftily and marched to the door to show them out. Afraid of his tempting me? Not I. If the mere thought of getting in with him and fighting for Ted from behind the fort of United Power didn't do it, what more could Newberry add? He went out, but Bassett stopped just a minute, and under his breath he said, You will say whatever you please to Offield on your own account, my dear young lady, of course. But that very clear conception of honor, which, permit me to say, I find most admirable in you, makes me confident that you will also deliver my message with this addition. United Power wants that editorial, but Mr. Offield would be more anxious even than ourselves for it if he knew what good ground we have for demanding it. Tell Offield just that. I stared at him. Jove, that was pretty straight. Is it a threat, Mr. Bassett? He hesitated a moment. "'You and I need not label it, need we, Miss Massey?' he asked finally, with the utmost good nature. "'What I beg of you to convey to Mr. Offield is that we hold a trump card which he had probably forgotten, or of whose existence he was unaware, when he gave that interview to the mail this morning. "'Good afternoon. Thank you. My apologies for detaining you.' I stood there petrified. The elevator went down, taking them with it, and still I stood there. I seemed caught, by the magic of a little thing called duty, in a net of inaction, chained to a bewitched spot, where there was nothing to do but to stand and look on while these men of power and wealth played at a game whose stakes were Ted's honor and, and my heart. I really suppose I might have been standing there yet in a daze of paralyzed emotion if I hadn't felt a light touch on my arm. Quickly I turned. Offield! Our R.P. it was, with a finger to his white lips, and a hand on the door, which he shut quickly behind me while his furtive eyes drew me inside. And yet, when he'd got me in, he didn't seem to know what to say, but threw himself into the chair at his desk and played with an envelope lying on the blotter before him. Just what does Bassett say? he asked at length. I began at the beginning. Yes, yes, I heard that, he interrupted in a matter-of-course way. You... In yonder, he nodded toward McCabe's room to the right. Oh, I exclaimed. 
Then you know the sort of editorial he wants? He nodded. Would you, he began, you wouldn't. I heard what you said about it. You were in earnest. You think... Think, I cried. And I waited right in, then and there. I sketched the kind of roast United Power ought to get, written in the style channel our editorial writer would put it. Oh, I haven't been reading those hummers of his all these years without learning something of his way of saying things, of roasting rogues and seeming to enjoy it. And I put the thing with all my soul. Something in me was crying out against myself all the time. But it only made me throw myself into the business all the harder, to drown its cries. To convince him, that was my duty. To make this uncertain-eyed, hesitating scoundrel see the thing that would pull his paper and himself out of a hole, that would speak louder to the town and the state than any other thing he might do or say or not say. And he really began to glow, himself, with enthusiasm as I spoke. I could see his back stiffen with every smashing thing I imagined Channel writing. "'And if you don't do it and do it this way,' I cried at the end, "'you might as well run what Bassett wants, the whole of it, and just as he wants it. It won't hurt the paper a particle more than keeping still about the matter, or running a water-on-both-shoulders editorial, and in the bargain you gain U.P.'s goodwill, if that's what you want.' I was hoarse now from talking and from temper. I wanted to cry, to sob aloud and tear things, and instead I had to stand there and talk sense and newspaper honor to a man that knew little of and cared less for either. But my last sentence caught him. Newberry had gauged him right. "'But what do I care for United Power's goodwill?' he asked defiantly. I looked at him. It was like him to bluff to the last, to lack the virtue of frankness to the end, and even with those he would finally be compelled to trust. "'Well, of course, you know better than I,' said I, with a shrug. "'Or perhaps Bassett knows.' And then I delivered the end of the old boss's message that he had whispered to me at the door. "'My! But it hit him straight between the eyes. He caved. He went to pieces. Falling back in his chair, he turned from white to red and back again. And then suddenly... All at once an idea seemed to strike him. Quickly he bent down and unlocked the lowest drawer of his desk. The drawer was full of traps, I could see that. Photographs, proofs, letters, all sorts of truck. He passed all these over with hasty, trembling hands, and from under the heap he drew a typewritten sheet of paper, marked and interlineated here and there with red ink. The sight of it seemed to comfort him inexpressibly. He read it over. He kept fondling it and then he looked over the top of it and saw me watching him curiously. "'Just have Channel in, Miss Massey,' he said with an embarrassed smile, "'and give him the points of that editorial just as you've given them to me.' And tearing the paper he held twice across, he threw it into the waste basket. Bewildered, I rang for Channel, or I suppose I must have, for he came in, his pencil behind his ear, his pipe in his smooth-shaven, big, humorous mouth. We talked the thing over, and Offield, quite restored, sat all the time at his desk, suggesting a more damaging punch or a heavier smash in the intervals of opening and reading his letters. But really I was hardly conscious of what I said. My mind had gone clue-hunting. What was the thing our R.P. dreaded? What was the thing that reassured him? And what good in God's world would it do to me to know the answer to either question? seeing that I couldn't make any more use of such knowledge than I had of Bassett's plain talk from the hills or Newberry's insinuations. It was Offield's voice that broke in upon us finally. "'You're sure that you've got it, Mr. Channel?' he asked. In his dealing with us, our R.P. always has the idea that people who write are deficient in good sense or lack some of the senses. We're hard of hearing, slow of understanding, at any rate, we're not acute in the way that businessmen are. Very well, then. Give it to them hot. The hotter shot you pour in on them, the better you'll please me. So Channel left and Offield turned to me. He must have spoken twice before I heard him. I was so busy thinking. 
but I did finally get the grieved surprise in his voice, and waked to find him standing before me, my own letter of resignation, open in his hand. "'Why, Miss Massey,' he began. I jumped to my feet. "'Oh, yes, yes,' I said. "'I'd forgotten for a second about that, but it goes. "'But surely—' "'But surely,' I smashed in. I was sore with suffering, but mighty glad at last to vent some of the hurt on someone, preferably, oh, most preferably, on our R.P. Surely I don't have to work for a blackguard if I don't want to. The letter in his hand rattled as he stood staring at me. It dropped to the floor after a minute, and he turned his back on me and walked over to the desk. "'You take advantage of your sex like other women,' he said, nervously busying himself with the things on his blotter. "'Just keep the desk till Bowman comes in, if you please. When he relieves you, you may consider your resignation accepted.' I nodded and hurried out of the room, but the door I opened clashed against the door of the telegraph room as Peter came in with a message for me, and as I turned to take it, I saw Offield go down on his irreproachable pearl-gray knees, fish about the waste-basket, gathered together those four pieces into which he had torn the typewritten sheet that roused my curiosity, and embarrassed now, for he caught my look of amazement and scorn at his actually thinking me capable of stealing his secret out of the wastebasket, crushed them back into the drawer he had originally taken the paper from, lock it quickly, and seizing his hat, make for the elevator. But really I was not so acutely conscious of what he did, and oh how little I cared, the telegram I was reading sang itself over and over in my ears, flowered before my eyes into the most delectable sight on earth, and filled the world, my world, with its perfume. Am coming, sweetheart, sweetheart. Do at 8.30, T.T. If I could, I'd have stood and dreamed over that all the hours it spread between him and me. But every scandal in town seemed to break loose just then. First there was the grand juries ignoring the charges against and exonerating United Power. Phew! How Bassett must have worked and paid for that. Then word came from the hall of the arrest of Eustace Man Lloyd for the unspeakable Drexler murder. And right on top of that came a wire from Bowman that Quillen and the stage robber had been surrounded by a posse, and a desperate fight was now going on. I stuffed that precious yellow message inside my waist and then the whole office rolled up its sleeves and sailed in. How we worked that night! I had my dinner sent in and nibbled bits of things as I danced from the local room to the telegraph room. Besides keeping half a dozen phones going and every man in the office pulling with a will. And we did pull together. I like to think that that last night I held the desk, we were good comrades, the boys and I, all trusty soldier sailors, manning the good ship the news, all fighting the same battle, all eager for but one thing, to win. The men had forgiven me for being a woman, my victory the day before had won me that, and I'd forgiven them for being so silly as to resent sex in a city editor. And perhaps you don't think I was jolly glad I hadn't discharged Bowman, when he phoned in a long-distance description of the fight and an interview with the dying bandit, which closed with a line like this. It's exclusive, you can bet on that, Miss Massey. I'll leave Cottrell here to stand guard over Quillen until he dies, with orders to shoot any reporter that catches up with us, and we'll swear that Quillen did it before he passed in his checks. It's lovely, Mr. Fairboy, just lovely. I sighed happily when there came a period of calm. My hair was tussled and my face was dirty and burning with excitement, but I was so content. It only lacks one thing. Oh, if one could only telegraph pictures. We might fake one and label it, from a description, Fairboy hazarded. But I wouldn't have it. It's a time's record trick, I said disdainfully. That reminds me, he said, of the only time the news ever did it. It was when you were up country, Miss Massey and the whole office was in despair because we couldn't get a picture of pretty little Dorothea Chipchase. So we faked a drawing of that scene of you with her, remember? And the next morning, when the agony was all over, 
we found that she'd sent her photo to Lowenthal when she wanted to go on the stage, and Brockington had shown it to Miss Massey. Yes, yes, what is it? To Offield, who actually had had it in his desk all the time we were scurrying round for it. You know that queer collection of his, of beautiful women's faces and ugly men's, and Quillen is such an ugly brute, possibly. Come on, I cried, we'll see. The only difficulty about being a woman managing editor, even for a night, is that you haven't strength enough to force locks. But Fairboy had, and the way he pried open one after the other of those drawers of the boss's desk would have joyed a burglar's heart. The place looked like a wreck when we got through, but do you think we cared? There in the bottom drawer was the picture we wanted. It was old and probably looked more like Offield himself by this time than like Quillinan, but it was a picture. I cleared away the torn pieces of paper that had covered it, gave the precious thing to Fairboy to take up to the art room, and on my knees before the desk began to put back into the drawers the things we'd tumbled out. Not that any newspaper proprietor in his senses would object to his desk being rifled for the good of the order, but that he mightn't be charmed with its being left all at sixes and sevens. My, what a lot of truck Offield had got together. Such odds and ends, such a queer collection of unnecessary trifles, such, such. Suddenly, as I was in the very act of replacing them mechanically, my eyes fell on the four pieces of torn paper Offield had thrust back into the drawer a couple of hours before. Oh, it was plain then, very plain, his perturbation, his reassurance, for in my lap, in four sections, indeed but otherwise intact, lay a typewritten copy of the contract between the news and United Power, annotated in red ink and in Offield's own handwriting. Yes, by our R.P. himself. Oh, you dear thing, I sobbed, laying my cheek upon it lovingly. You dear, honest, true thing. I sat there on the floor, comforted merely by the touch of it. Oh, just a big sheet of copy paper to back it. A pot of mucilage and five minutes' work, and then... Then the door opened behind me, and Offield came in. End of Chapter 13 Chapter 14 Some Japanese Prints which Miss Massey admired. I thought for a moment as he stood there looking down at me, his face livid with wrath, that he was actually about to trample on me. But even as I marveled at it, the fury in his face was gone, leaving it haggard, terrified, but cunning still, and cautiously alert. What, what have you there, Miss Massey? he asked trying to steady his voice to a matter-of-fact tone. I looked up at him. There's no grace in him, of course. He'd pretend still and lie, lie uselessly, even with the futility of lying obvious to everyone in the world but himself. It's just proof that I had the right name for you this afternoon, Mr. Offield, I said slowly. He jumped. "'And what name shall be applied to a criminal like you?' he shouted, "'taking advantage of a position of trust to break open your employer's desk.' "'Oh, oh!' I exclaimed. "'I felt stunned for a second, as though I'd been struck. "'That's what your face meant when you came in? "'But you're wrong. "'Fair boy helped me open the drawer. "'We wanted Quillinan's picture. "'And then, afterward... I found this. I spread my open hands over the torn papers in my lap. He stood a moment watching me. I fancy he must have believed me, but then I was so simply sure of speaking the truth, and so preoccupied thinking of what might have been and couldn't, just couldn't be, that it never occurred to me he might doubt. I, I beg your pardon, Miss Massey, he said with an effort. May I help you to rise? He reached out his hand, but I scrambled to my feet without touching it. Oh, it's a blackguard hand, that well-cared-for, white hand that was shaking so visibly now, he himself noticed it, and rammed it down into his pocket. Then he stood there, 
a gross little frightened figure, watching me while, with careful deliberation, I matched the torn pieces together on top of his desk and stood bending over them. No, no, it wasn't the constructive instinct that makes one put fragments together again. It was just that I was hungering for the sight of it all straightened out, with Offield's unmistakable M's and K's, with his initials adding emphasis to a question mark he'd placed in the margin, calling attention to an underscored word, just as he does in a proof, and at the bottom of the page written squarely out, Stand pat on the forty thousand. The risk we run, the hurt the ad itself, even in a special edition, may do us, is worth all of that to us, and more to Bassett. U.P. will pay up all right. C.S.O. There it was, just as Ted must have submitted it to Offield, and got it back with the notes to resubmit to Bassett, and finally to incorporate all our respected proprietors' objections into the finished contract, which Newberry had signed for United Power and Ted for the news. I looked up at last from the paper to Offield's face. It was gray. Sit down a minute, won't you? he stammered. I, I have something to say. I shook my head, but I stood there waiting with that thing, that awful expose spread out before us both. The appearance of it somehow seemed to paralyze me to put a stop to everything, to make it unnecessary for me to do anything more. It was this way, he went on. I, I really did forget about it. Oh, I assure you I did. And after I had given that interview to the mail, in which I expressed what was at the time genuine indignation at Mr. Thompson's conduct, having forgotten and really never having thoroughly understood the, I mean not having given proper attention to the matter, at any rate, I remembered, but of course it was too late. The mischief was done for Thompson. It's about him you care? I nodded. It didn't seem very sensible to listen to such stuff as that. But it came upon me suddenly then, the desperate need to range myself openly on Ted's side. Well, we can make that all right, he went on quickly. I, you can't expect me to go back on my tracks now. But after a bit things will quiet down, and he can come back to the office. I've got to discharge him, of course, for the form of the thing. But he will get his salary just the same, and he can drop down to the islands or over to Japan till— You fancy he'd work again for you? I gasped. He got red and fidgeted a moment. Then, making a sudden resolution, he said, See here now, Miss Massey. If you'll hand over that paper to me, I'll give you and Thompson a year's salary, transportation to Japan, and after the year is up, I'll hold your positions open for you. Now isn't that fair? Isn't it? He repeated as I didn't answer. But I couldn't speak, not just that moment, for something choking in my throat. I was bending lovingly over that paper, noting every tiny red ink mark, reading over every correction and amendment Offield had insisted upon. It seemed to me I must, must take it up and run away with it, but I didn't. I only crammed it into Offield's hands and ran desperately away without it. But, oh, Miss Massey, he called as I whirled out into the hall. I stopped a second and he came out after me. You're a sensible little thing after all he began, speaking in a confidential low voice. Suppose you just see Thompson when he gets in and put him wise. Tell him he'd better not come to the office. We can arrange. Oh, you blackguard! You unspeakable, cowardly blackguard! I sobbed, the tears running down my cheeks. He looked at me as though I'd gone mad, as though he had himself and longed to tear me to pieces, and then, bewildered, he looked from me to the paper he still held in his hand. Do, do you think that that makes any difference? I demanded, so furious that I couldn't control my voice. Oh, you mean that you can give the story away without having the actual copy, and with my offer to you and Thompson to boot, you intend you... But I wouldn't let him say the name, 
though the thought that he might down the hysterical sobs in my throat and gave me breath to speak at last. No, no, I said, gulping hard. I can't give the story away, Mr. Offield, with or without that paper, or, or any other way. And do you know why? For a reason that not another man on the paper beside yourself would need to be told. It's because we're bigger, better men than you, Ted and I. It's because this is an office story that I got hold of by being in the office. And if I gave it away, if I were blackguard enough to match you, Ted Thompson wouldn't accept rehabilitation at such hands as mine. It's because... But you couldn't understand it if I'd explained to you by the hour. Only, you're safe till Ted Thompson comes back to break every bone in your despicable body. And I stormed down the steps. I couldn't wait for the elevator. But the night air and the fog cooled me, and the sight of Bowman crossing over to take up the city desk again, and the crowd coming up Market Street, and a swift hallo behind me, I knew the voice. It was Frank McGowan's. He dropped off a cable car and joined me. "'Guess where I've been, Rhoda?' he cried. I shook my head. "'Out to see Judge Frisby, police court. Don't you know Frisby?' Well, I shashayed out to the hall the first minute I could get after reading that noble interview with your generous and disinterested proprietor. Miss Massey. Not mine any more, I interrupted, pointing to Bowman, who across the street from us was just entering the news building. Shake. Frank put out his hand. I dropped mine into it, and he gave it a brotherly squeeze. You're a man, Rhoda, and white. He gurgled, satisfied. So am I. Listen. How much does it cost, Judge? I whispered to Frisbee in a lull in court, pretending to be consulting him about one of Brockington's bulky briefs, but really showing him that dirty wipe at Ted in the mail. How much to lick Offield? Twenty dollars, says Frisbee, frowning judicially and diving down into his pockets. Twenty dollars and I'll lend you the money. Ain't he a corker? I nodded delightedly. But you're not. On my way down to Lick Offield? That's just what I am, Miss Massey. A bit late, but here's the judge's twenty to pay the fine I'll have to put up for it. Cheap at double the price, ain't it? And if you want to see the prettiest and speediest little scrap... I shook my head. I've had enough of the news, I said. I wouldn't go back there for the pleasure of seeing its R.P. licked, Frankie. I don't want even to see the paper tomorrow morning. Why? What's the paper going to say about U.P.? Oh, just roast the life out of Bassett editorially and... What? You didn't think, I cried with a last flicker of leftover pride in the poor old paper, that the news was going to lie down under all these charges. I've just bet a week's salary, week after next, that it would do just that same. Up at the press club, the odds are five to three that Offield won't dare pipe a note in self-defense. Because? I challenged. He looked at me queerly. Just where are you at, Rhoda? He demanded facetiously. I laughed. It's a little hard to remember, Frank. The change has been so sudden. But do tell me like a nice child. Well, nobody seems to know where it came from. Perhaps it was a hint of Newberry's, but everybody appears to have an idea that U.P.'s got some esoteric sort of cinch on Offield. A duplicate, I think it is, that he signed and for... Frankie! I squealed, stopping short in the street. Oh, Frankie, say it over again. I didn't give U.P. the stranglehold, Rhoda, he reminded me. I'm only glad they've got it, if they have. But you don't mean to tell me you were city editor and news editor and managing editor a whole day and never got an inkling that your boss was in deeper water than he'll admit? Where are your wits, Rhoda Massey? Oh, they're all right, I chanted in gleeful football fashion. I was so happy plain talking didn't seem adequate. But know it. Of course I know some few things, but only officially. Officially you understand, Mr. McGowan. But now I do really know what you've told me, and, Frankie, I could hug you. I don't believe it. 
he said with challenging cynicism. Well, I won't try to convince you just this minute, I laughed happily. Because, well, because there's Senator Newberry crossing the street and he might... I stopped for a minute as Newberry raised his hat, passed us, hesitated, and then as Frankie called out to him, Say, Senator, guess what Rhoda Massey just said? He turned and came back to where we were. He laughed when Frankie shamelessly repeated what I had said and looked inquiringly at me. Oh, yes, I answered gaily. I did say it, but Frankie's got the pet press failing. He's given to misleading half-quotation. I did say I could hug him, if he wasn't such a cheeky little beggar, I was going to add. But he's altogether too impudent to be huggable, isn't he? Newberry looked sharply down at me. Once before this afternoon he had looked at me like that. Your mood is very gay, Miss Massey, he said slowly. You seem much happier than you were a few hours ago. Naturally, I laughed. I've lost me job. Newberry stared. I've joined that club, the ex-city editors I was telling you about at the office, I added. I see, Miss Massey, Newberry said. He'd been doing some quick thinking, and so had I. At the risk of becoming monotonous, I really think we could do business together if... I'm sure of it, I interrupted. Wait a minute. And hauling McGowan off to one side, I whispered, Look here, Frankie. There's something you've got to do for Ted Thompson that may cost more than twenty dollars but it will be worth infinitely more than what you were thinking of, for he couldn't do it himself, and I couldn't do it for him, and so... But you shall have the story if there is one, and... What's up? What's up, Rhoda? The boy cried eagerly, looking inquisitively toward Newberry, who had walked slowly to the corner. I can't tell you, and you've got to trust me, Frank, and help me. I want a proof out of the news composing room of the editorial about United Power that's to be run tomorrow morning. You've got to beg it or buy it or... Oh, I don't care how you get it, and I wouldn't tell you how to go about it even if I had time to think out how. I can't help you to get in and loot the pantry where I've been acting as butler, but... But, Frankie, you're the dearest little expert burglar in the profession, and if you bring me that proof soon, right away, if you do... If I do, I bet the judge is twenty I do, Rhoda Massey, he said, strutting a bit. Then afterward, can I lick off field? There mightn't be time, I stammered, for by that time, Ted. Will be home himself? Hooray! Then I'll go mitt and watch him do the beggar up. No, you won't. You'll get this thing for me and bring it to the hotel where I'll be waiting and, oh, please, Frankie. What's the matter with tomorrow? Not much, only... Oh, you know very well, Frank McGowan, that the discreetest man in the world is more likely to talk today than tomorrow. Please, now. And miss a scrap and such a scrap as that. What do you take me for? I looked at him a minute. For best man at... The wedding, Frank, I murmured. Really? Whoop! He danced a little breakdown there in the street, then seized my hands a moment in an awful grip and whirled away. Senator, I said to Newberry when in his rounds he came back to me, I'm very anxious to have an interview with Mr. Bassett. I think I'll have something to show him that will interest him, but if I don't, can you arrange it for me? You wouldn't want to interview him about any story recently published concerning United Power, Miss Massey. He asked doubtfully. Of course, you know Bassett's objection to being quoted in print. Yes, of course. And yet, Miss Massey, Newberry went on, carefully feeling his way, I'd like you to see Ben Bassett in some other light than that the papers picture him. He's many-sided, is Bassett, and it wounds him to think that the public knows him only as, as... Why, Mary... He broke off suddenly as the taller of two girls in an automobile that stopped at the curb bowed to him. What lucky chance brings you to town today? She was a very queen of a girl, but she blushed a bit at his tone. 
Still, only in that condescending, gracious way such fine creatures have, betraying, not confusion, but interest, animation, and something subtler and sweeter that matched the light in Newberry's eyes. "'I'm down with Dorothea, Senator,' she said, putting out a hand to meet his. "'She has had her final interview with Mr. Lowenthal. Mother and I opposed it, but it's decided now, and—' "'What is it, Dorothea?' she added as her sister burst into exclamation. "'It's Miss Massey. I'm Dorothea Chipchase, Miss Massey, don't you remember?' the girl cried, seizing my hand. Mr. Lowenthal wrote to me again after you had spoken of me to him, and, and I'm going on the stage. It's settled. Isn't that fine? Oh, I'm so much obliged to you. I squealed back at her. It was delightful to see the animation in that girl's face and contrast it with the expression I had seen upon it last. But the change in her was nothing compared to that in Mary Chipchase. No wonder Newberry could forget Bassett, the news, Rhoda Massey, and everything else while he looked at her. But his eyes did meet mine presently, and he was about to speak when Dorothea burst forth again in staccato exclamation. "'Oh, and I want to tell you,' she cried, "'about Sister Euphrosine. Yes, yes, she's making the frocks for my stage debut, and oh, Miss Massey, we got to talking about you the day your big grand jury article came out. Do you know she takes the news and is exquisitely, delightfully ashamed of it and, and just as proud of you? How in the world did you contrive to make friends with a, a Jesuit? By, by being something of a Jesuit myself, I murmured shamefaced. She, she was interested in the Lowenthal case and I sent her the paper that told about the turning up at the last moment of the letter that— That cleared young Lothal, Newberry broke in. He had been talking eagerly to Mary Chipchase. I remember all about it. But listen, Dorothea, you and Mary are going to dine with me. Won't you come too, Miss Massey? I saw real appeal in his eyes. Rhoda Massey Gooseberry was what was written therein and positively I'd have enjoyed playing the part and being monopolized by Dorothea in order to give Newberry his opportunity if it hadn't been for something far, far more important. No, no thank you, Senator, I said slowly. I can't. I have an appointment with Mr. Bassett, didn't I mention it? At his office, at half-past seven? His eyes met mine agreeingly. Yes, I believe, come to think of it, you did he said. I'll call him up and remind him of it. And then he added as he stepped into the car, Bassett's a peculiar fellow, Miss Massey. It doesn't do to expect things too confidently from him. He's old caution itself, you know, and no one can tell when he'll cool. So the safe way is to heap on more fuel, I interrupted quickly as I nodded goodbye to them all. Have you got it? Newberry's eyes demanded. The chauffeur had swung around, but Newberry's curiosity swung him with it. I wavered a second. Then I caught sight of Frank McGowan coming down street on a run, a galley proof fluttering triumphantly from his uplifted hand. I nodded then to Newberry, and he lifted his hat and smiled back an unmistakable congratulation. You bet I had it. Good for you, Frankie. Now listen, I began the moment I had hold of him. "'Who's the pretty girl?' he demanded, looking eagerly after the automobile. "'She's nameless and homeless, and you'll never see her again if you don't do what I want, Frank.' "'Well, didn't I get your old proof for you?' he cried resentfully. "'And isn't Blake in the composing room already half?' "'Blake? Was it? The wretch! Never mind that. It's your own old proof, Frankie, and you're to high with it to the gray building where Boss Bassett—' Not on your... Where Boss Bassett spins spider webs for United Power, I went on quickly. You shows him the dreadful thing the news is going to say about him tomorrow morning, calling particular attention to certain expressions likely to draw blood. Now, Mr. Bassett, you says, striking manfully when the iron is hot, Mr. Bassett, be you a-going to stand for such goings-on and never once get back at him? And then... 
Then he'll rub his hand over that smug chin of his and say softly, I take a great personal interest in your career, Mr. McGowan. I have watched your work and predict fine things for you in the future. It is a weakness of mine to love to pose as the patron of youth and talent. That is why it is peculiarly painful for me to refuse you this small favor. But I really cannot, in justice to the great corporation I represent, be interviewed on this subject nor any other. You know my invariable rule. Bravo, bravo. I applauded the really excellent imitation of the old boss's best manner. Here, take the proof, Frankie, and try it on him. I won't. What's the use of tackling Bassett? He's been overrun with reporters today, and not a fellow's got a word out of him. Don't I know? Who ever got a word out of Bassett? Just go like a nice lad to please me and, and Frankie. Well, he asked sulkily, and just forget to bring the proof with you when you come away so he'll have it after you're gone to re- He wheeled about. What are you up to, Rhoda Massey? he demanded. Oh, something, something, Frankie. No, no, I won't tell you. But if it turns out as, as I think it will, why, I haven't got any paper and you and the press shall have for your very own a scoop that'll shake the town. And, and I'll throw in an introduction to Dorothea Chipchase to boot. I ended with a trembling laugh. He was off with that, though he did assume the melodramatic air of a hero bound for martyrdom. But he came running back. Say, Rhoda, Offield heard of my asking Judge Frisby how much fine I'd have to pay for licking him. It's frightened him off the earth. They say up at the news office that he's to sail tomorrow morning for Japan. So when poor Ted gets there, the cupboard'll be bare, and... And Mr. Charles Staniford Offield's career as a newspaper proprietor will be over, and he'll never dare come back here if this thing we're working on goes right. No, no, don't ask me, I cried hurriedly. See, it's seven o'clock. Hurry over to Bassett. He won't be there long. I stood and watched him till he crossed over and went into the big gray skyscraper that U.P. has built on Market Street. The fog had lifted and the night was clear and balmy. Busy people don't often get a chance to feel the softness of a summer evening like that. But when the fog of your own preoccupation lifts for a moment and you see the world and love it, it is with a love that's all the greater for the many beautiful hours you've had to do without. And, oh, I loved it as I stood there, the twilight of the town life, between the worry of day and the hurry of night, when all the shoppers are gone home, and even those shrill human sparrows, the newsboys, are still, and the half-empty cars go jangling idly up and down, and the flower vendors on the corner are packing up their pretty burdens, carefully, as though they were fragile flower babies that might die for lack of air and gentle handling. Funny to have nothing to do. I looked up at the big clock. A full half hour yet. Slowly and dreamily, it seemed so odd to be idle, I walked down toward the ferry. Up this way, along this same street, a man would ride in about an hour. A real man. A newspaper man. Ah, me! There's this about a newspaper man. He doesn't go round on stilts, and he isn't sure he's better, which often means cleverer in covering up his sins, than other men. He will come off his perch, and he won't talk gruff, and women have to listen to so much of that sort of thing from men. And he'll meet you on any ground but a pretentious one. There's nothing of the ostrich about him. He knows when it's time to lay down his cards and you don't find yourself talking against a baffling wall, a wall of pretense. You're not compelled to meet his make-believe with make-believe and give utterance to an editorial policy at war with your news pages. You can't bluff him by fine writing. He's on intimate terms with the truth. He knows the inside, and he won't take the trouble to be insincere. And the beauty of his frankness is that it punctures shams that run up against it. The greatest hypocrite in the world never got any real comfort in posing before Ted Thompson. He couldn't look into that shrewd, good-humored eye of Ted's without seeing himself caricatured there. No, you can be blessedly yourself with a newspaper man, and he'll be the same. It isn't always the nicest sort of self? Perhaps not, but it spoils you for most other kinds. It's, 
It's so human, so straight from the shoulder, so, so my kind, mine and Ted's, God love him, and... And just here I caught sight of the big clock above the ferry, and in a jiffy I was aboard a car bound uptown again, and in five minutes I was climbing U.P. stairs. It brought me back to my senses, the sight of that close, secretive place. Everything in it, though locked and barred and put aside for the day, a tribute to the real power of united power, its power over the town and the state. As I came at last into the boss's room, all those bolted desks and safes behind me seemed bursting with the secrets they held, the secrets of U.P.'s mastery, and of the men that sold that mastery and themselves to it. "'You will pardon my keeping you waiting, Miss Massey,' said the boss, placing a chair for me. I have been pestered with newspaper reporters even as late as this. I sometimes marvel, he went on blandly, turning his sharp, sly old face full upon me. What sort of consciences these people must have who trade in the betrayal of confidence and calmly invite one to pour his woes into the ear of the press? A receiver like my telephone, with a hundred thousand tongues instead of one discreet central, I speak frankly because I understand from Senator Newberry, he added genially, that you yourself have left the arena of noisy, sensational journalism, and have determined to take your place, he believes, in the rather more quiet and genteel field of the newspaper magazine. Senator Newberry is, is quite right, I gasped. He must be, I thought to myself even if he had inhumanly relegated a live journalist to the Sunday Supplementary Cemetery. "'I congratulate you upon the change, Miss Massey,' the boss went on, dovetailing his fingers and preaching gravely at me over them. "'Only this afternoon, as I was leaving the news building—' Quickly I sat up and began to take notice. "'I remarked to Newberry,' he went on calmly, how much it was to be regretted that a young woman of your principles and nice ethical discernment should have these virtues blunted by contact with the dishonorable necessities of her profession. Dumbly I agreed with him, but shades of U.P., a sermon on the higher life from Boss Bassett. So, the voice of the boss boomed amiably on, when Newberry telephoned me that you wished to make your first article a descriptive and instructive essay on rare Japanese prints, I departed from my invariable rule, Miss Massey, and agreed to receive you here, to show you my modest little collection, at least two people that I know have better ones, the Mikado and Li Wang Chung, and give you such information as is in my power. Won't you take this seat? I did. I sank back into the chair he rolled closer to the desk. I didn't know whether to laugh or to cry. A descriptive and instructive essay by Rhoda Massey. Oh, bury me deep in a yellow journalist's grave. It, it is very good of you, I gasped. Not at all, not at all. I am only too happy to speak to an appreciative listener of this pet fad of mine. A man... He spread his hands largely. Of the world, forced to use the world and force it to be of use, for its own good, of course, to great corporate interests which he serves, is apt to become associated in people's minds with all that is materialistic. He is judged by his sterner qualities, which very likely are but a small and even acquired part of his real nature. It is to get relief from this oppressive image of one's self as well as from the harassing preoccupation of one's profession, that such men take refuge in things of purely abstract beauty, my particular pleasure being, as you know, in that exquisite land of the ideal which the old Japanese masters have so beautifully preserved for us. Ah! From a pile of prints before him he lifted the first. I said, ah, too, though all I saw was a flat, simpering Jap lady, backed by a soft little mountain cone and a lake of blue mud. Hiroshige's wave, exclaimed the boss. I knew that would touch you, that wonderful tone of blue. Is it not exquisite? And the draperies, masterly, are they not? Look at Fuji, Fujiyama, of course. Such color harmonies, 
such a peculiarly quiet and refined scale of color. Miss Massey, I told you that the Mikado has a better collection. But I must ask pardon of this glorious Katsu Kaba, or perhaps Yasai, that delicious colorist. There is nothing finer in the world than those old kakamono. You agree with me? I, I was dazed. I would have agreed with anybody about anything. Is it possible, I said to myself as I sat there listening to him expatiate upon his yellow-red series and his quintet in gray-brown tones of Hakusai and Kosakanakoa and the delectable lot of them, is it possible, Rhoda Massey, that fate would play you so grotesque a joke as to keep you here listening to such stuff, and on this evening of all evenings when the one man in the world is about to swing on an uptown car and... But I couldn't. I couldn't think of Ted. Quickly I turned back to the pile of prints with the crepe paintings interspersed. It was getting smaller, fortunately. But still the boss's voice droned enthusiastically on. Yes, it was genuine enthusiasm. He meant what he was saying. Whatever else it was, it was fun to him. But to me and to Ted. A rap at the door came to deliver me, and Bassett left me to look over his precious prints while he stepped into the next room. I looked over them. Oh, yes. I lifted one flimsy sheet after the other, and all the time, for I determined I would wait no longer, I was framing the question I meant to put to him when he should come back. But I didn't put that question. I didn't. For you see, as I lifted the last little banner of crepe framed in bands of silver and golden network, with ornaments of ivory depending from its silken fringe, I found Channel's editorial in proof on UP, and beneath it was the most exquisite color harmony in the world, to me. Only this one wasn't Japanese. It was good straight-out American. It was typewritten, and the revisions and corrections in the margin were in red ink. A duplicate, an almost exact duplicate, but for a change here and there of that same betraying document, edited by Offield's own hand, that I had had in my possession that very afternoon. Ah, oh, tut-tut, what a blunder! I heard the boss's voice from a long way off. The sight of that precious paper again had made me weak, almost faint with the sense of achievement. A blunder, though? And was I the blunderer? Did he intend? How unfortunate, Bassett went on, lifting the papers from before me, that this long-lost document should turn up just now and here. I had no idea this thing was with the prince. But now I suppose I must take you into my confidence, Miss Massey. A young man from one of the newspapers brought me a stolen copy of this editorial, hoping, I suppose, to profit by some unwary expression of my natural indignation against its author. Of course, I promptly refused to treat with him. Of course, I murmured, to fill in the pause. Naturally. But after he left, my mind began to hark back over our dealings with the news, and I recalled then that two rough drafts, somewhat dissimilar, were sent us for our acceptance, both revised by Mr. Offield, the understanding being, of course, that both were to be returned to him when negotiations were concluded and the final contract drawn up. I thought both had been returned, but in some unaccountable way this one must have been mislaid among my prints. It is most unfortunate. I deeply regret it. But since you have seen it, it would be useless to deny it and I know I can rely upon your discretion. Still, my dear young lady, I regret the circumstance for its effect upon a youthful mind like yours. It is not good to deal with depravity, to be aware of it. Ye shall not touch pitch. In the interest, as I have told you, of this great corporation, I am in daily contact, in hourly danger of blackmail. Miss Massey, Suddenly the veil dropped, and his cold eyes fairly blazed with fury. I swear to you my wrist is tired signing checks for Offield and his like. Look, here is a demand from a southern paper. It needs new presses. And here is a northern one that wants a linotype machine. And here in the city is one that must have a color press. And here is another that begs. Begs what? Why, ammunition. 
thinly disguised to be used upon ourselves as soon as united power comes under fire. A graceless herd of traitors they are, these newspaper proprietors who shamelessly put themselves up for sale, who pull at your coat and smirkingly try to catch your eye and force their venality upon your attention, yet who will not stay bought, these new inky horse leeches sons with their eternal. He stopped suddenly. My heart seemed to stop beating, too. Could he, could he retract after a thing like that? Eh, my dear young lady, he said softly, lifting the bundle and preparing carefully to put away his treasures. I throw myself upon your mercy. All that has passed between us, all that I have said, is confidential, is it not? Thank you. I had been thinking of it all just before you came, and for distraction I turned to the prince. I would advise you to do likewise. Cultivate some pure, unworldly interest that shall solace. I didn't hear the rest. How could I? As he lifted the package of prints and turned to place them in a cabinet in the wall, a sheet of paper fluttered down on the table before me. The last sheet of the pile it was, THE sheet, the only one that could have any value for me, the paper that should rehabilitate Ted Thompson and— and that made Rhoda Massey blush for her stupidity, and wonder whether Bassett didn't think her reputed cleverness overrated, so unpardonably slow and dull she had been that he had had to perform twice the miracle of accident, and twice affect absent-mindedness before she understood. Rhoda, Ted whispered, drawing my hand inside his arm and holding it there as we walked up street together. Brockington and Lowenthal came down on the same train that I did. They talked all the way of... You'd no business, Ted Thompson, I interrupted, trembling. You'd no business judging me by a harder standard than you'd have for any man reporter. Oh, yes, I had, sweetheart. You yourself have proved that I had, he said softly. And I had, because you know, you never were a reporter to me, Rhoda. At least it's so long ago that I can't remember when I didn't think of your living up to a standard as high, as high as the unworthy heart of man can create for the woman he loves. Loves, Rhoda. Loves, loves, loves. He had said it under his breath, but the whole town seemed to be ringing with it. Teddy, I sobbed, keep it, that standard in your heart till, till I grow up to it. And then, beloved? he murmured, his smiling tenderness hushing me as though I were a child. Will you reach down and help me up? Wives do, you know. We didn't speak for a time after that, but as we walked home under the stars, Ted listened to me and my story in that way that's his own, so full of sympathy, so acutely interpretive and understanding, you hardly realize that only one of you is doing the talking. It seemed so like a quiet but complete collaboration. And there was a mist in his eyes and a note in his dear voice, when he spoke at last, that set the whole world a-singing. To me it seemed as though living had been a dumb poem that found its voice in the music of loving. End of chapter 14 End of a Yellow Journalist by Miriam Michelson Recording by Leanne Howlett.